Welcome to F5 Performance Management. In this section, I will go over management reports. What are management reports? They are internally produced reports detailing important company information, such as the profit and loss, or the costs, etc. They can cover any period of time, but are usually over one or a four month period, depending on the company. These reports are used for internal decision making. Management reports should be communicated through the appropriate channels. So, for example, don't make a report out of what can be sent quickly and effectively in an email. Management reports also contain good quality information. These reports must be easy to use. If it's not easy to use, management may not bother looking at it. The report must be understood and be relevant to its users. The report must be complete. A half-finished report is not much use. The value of the information in the report must be more than the cost it took to produce. Be this the time cost or the resources invested in it. The report must be given in adequate time to enable decision makers time to review the report and to make their decision. There must be controls over the production of management reports. If not time and money could be wasted and sensitive information could be leaked. Before a report is done, a cost-benefit analysis should be done. Do the benefits of having this information outweigh the costs of putting this report together? The formatting of all the organization's reports should be standardized and be consistent. This saves time you could have spent deciding on fonts and whatnot. It also ensures consistency so that the report is less likely to be misinterpreted. The user's requirements must be clear and understood. If they are not, the report writing team must verify them before the report is started. When the report is finished, they should be checked again against the report. The report should clearly outline its recommendations and actions that need to be taken by management. A report full of information is all well and good, but not much use if it doesn't give me a few indications of what I should do based upon its findings. The writers should be clearly identified. Transparency and accountability will result in more accurate information. If a company writes a report, this means it's using its valuable resources, its staff time, to do that instead of something else that could be bringing in company revenue. Therefore, reports should only be written if they are going to give new information. Sensitive information. The information contained in managers' reports is often confidential to both users external and internal to the organization. For example, management would not want reports detailing new product designs being accessed by competitors so they could be copied. Similarly, management may not want staff to know of staffing issues or restructuring plans so as not to cause panic. What controls can be put in place for sensitive information and to protect it? Information should only be given to the relevant parties and nobody else. Employees should sign confidentiality agreements, preventing them from sharing sensitive information with third parties. Secure all computer files with a secret password, not one that everybody knows, and that password should be kept securely and not in a post-it on your desk. Hold all sensitive reports in a safe place that can be locked, like a small room. The company's information systems should be protected with firewalls from people getting in from the outside. 
As well as firewalls, encryption should be used to code files so they cannot be read by hackers. Antivirus and anti-spyware software should be installed to protect the company and its information. Under Personal Data Protection Acts, companies must protect personal data and not give it to third parties. Therefore, personal data must be kept confidential. Welcome to F5 Performance Management. In this section, I will go over sources of management information. Companies need good quality information to make decisions. Management accounting information is for internal use, for managers and other decision makers to make decisions with. Management accounting gives much more up-to-date information than the annual financial accounts, which are prepared once a year. That is why it is so important to decision making that it, the information is time sensitive. The internal sources of this information are the company's accounting records, so the books of prime entry such as the sales day book, purchases day book and cash book. Management can find financial information such as the amount of cash versus credit sales during say the last month or week or the profit earned on certain products. Payroll records, so the wages costs and the quantity of people and time required to do a task or make a product. Departmental records of incidents, say accidents. Information received from customers, so for example customer comment cards or complaints. But these records give management more than financial information. They give non-financial information too, like quantities sold and their combinations. Did you hear about the supermarket that from looking at its customer spending patterns that a popular combination sold was baby's diapers and beer together? They learnt this by looking over the sales registers, the books of prime entry. What do they do with this information? The supermarket then located the baby's diapers close to the beer aisle, resulting in much more sales of both products. If you came in to the supermarket looking for beer, seeing the diapers you may decide to buy some just in case your baby runs out. So the power of the management information. The company does not operate in a vacuum and the management must look at information outside the organization for decision making too. Sources of external information are the government. They provide publications on new legislation, taxation policies, etc. The media. The media gives information about changes in the organization's industry or technological changes, etc. Financial institutions, giving information on, say, potential customers and foreign currencies. Competitors' financial statements, the internet, and public databases. Keeping on top of new information from these sources will help the company make better decisions. Management information, as well as being important for decision making, is a powerful control tool. Both internal and external sources are used. This information is compared to either the budgeted or forecasted results to find the variance and the reasons for the variance. Internal information such as cost reports can be monitored to measure the variances from the budgeted or forecasted results. External information is used to benchmark the company against their competitors. The control process using internal and external information is as follows. Management review the previous month's sales volumes. This is internal information. And they decided to gain 3% more of the market share. Market share information was gotten from external sources. 
the management now decide how this goal is to be achieved. The next month's sales figures are examined to see if the target has been achieved. This is called feedback. This is internal information. The feedback demonstrates if the company is on target for achieving its goals. Depending on the results management will go back and amend their original controls to improve on results. This is sometimes called the feedback loop. Management information is a powerful tool and good decision making will result in more profits for the company. But management information does not come free. The main costs associated with it are direct data capture costs, processing costs, indirect costs. Direct data capture is a data input where there is no data entry. What does this mean? Data from nothing? Not exactly. You are probably very familiar with buying goods in a shop. Here, you go to the cashier with your goods, which are then scanned. The barcodes tell the shop's information systems what you have bought, calculating your bill. The data is inputted into the computer through the barcode reader. It has replaced the cashier typing in everything you have bought. So, direct data capture is great. It saves time. You don't need to worry about spending half an hour at the till while the cashier writes out and totals your bill. But there are costs associated with it. Obviously, there is the initial setup costs and then the linking costs. But being able to read the product codes and total a bill is awesome. But what if it could also be used to update inventory levels, etc. So link this information throughout the company. This linking cost will also be a cost. The main cost here is the setup of the systems and their maintenance and updating them to keep them up to date with current technology. The data that they collect must also be saved or stored somewhere. So there are storage costs. Processing costs come from processing and analysing the information. This is mainly staff hours. So back to our cashier. The information entered into the till is valuable. But it is only valuable when it is analysed. So someone is employed, like an accountant, like yourself, to analyse and spot trends in the data. The supermarket always had the data that it was selling beer and diapers together. But the information had to be analysed to find this trend. This is very time consuming, but it is very important for the company's long term growth. And finally, we have the indirect costs of producing information. Information overload creates a lot of indirect costs by either staff getting so lost in the detail and spending too much time on analysing information, wasting time. Poor decisions which cost the company can be made from overload of information. Some famous political leaders insisted that information briefs were no longer than one page giving them the essential information and not overloading them so they could think clearly about the issue. Past data is always being analysed. It is possible that the company becomes so focused on the past that it fails to look to the future, for example, technology and legal changes. These days, external information is obtained through the internet. The internal costs of enabling staff access to the internet is time wasted on non-business activities, security risks from outside the companies through malware that is either accidentally or purposely downloaded by staff. 
The limitations of using externally generated information. Quality. Information produced externally may not be accurate or reliable. Steps can be taken to reduce this risk. For example, only using reputable sources. But these may be out of date, affecting the accuracy of the information. Information needs of the organization may not be met because this external information was not created for this company's purpose. Difficulties in sourcing. It may be very difficult in sourcing the external information. For example, detailed breakdowns of competitors' sales will be very difficult to get because companies tend to keep this information confidential. External information is very important for decision making, but its limitations must be remembered to minimise them. This session will cover management information systems and reports. Management accounting and information systems are an integral part in producing the information that managers use for performance measurement and performance management. Performance management information systems will provide the information which enables performance measurement to take place. The type of management information system needed will depend on the level of data needed to support the company's decisions to be made. Planning, control and decision making can be classified into a three-tier hierarchy known as strategic, tactical and operational. So let's look at each in turn. Firstly, strategic. Strategic planning is the process of deciding on the longer term objectives of the business and the high level policies surrounding them. For example, new ventures, new products, potential future growth, or maybe capacity expansion plans. Management accounting information needed to support those strategic plans will be forward looking, usually for several years, and will have an external orientation. It could also be vague, including estimates, or there could be elements of incomplete data. Examples would be product profitability, financial effects of competitor responses, or maybe the effects of acquisitions and mergers. Secondly, tactical. Tactical planning is the level below strategic planning and focuses on the most efficient and effective use of resource to support and achieve the long-term strategic plans. For example, this could include decisions around the level of resource required, money, manpower or materials, etc. It will also include decisions around the processes needed to achieve the maximum output from the level of resource used. Management accounting information needed to support tactical planning decisions will have a much shorter time horizon in comparison to strategic planning data. There will also be much more precision with a much narrower focus on information. Most of the information will be generated from within the organisation. Examples would include annual budgets for sales and production, the levels of inventory to be held, or maybe marketing and advertising campaigns. Lastly, operational. Operational decisions are the lowest tier in the hierarchy and focus on the day-to-day -day specific tasks, ensuring there is maximum efficiency and effectiveness. And just as tactical planning decisions are made to support strategic planning decisions, Operational decisions will be set within the guidelines of tactical decisions and control. Management accounting information here will be very detailed, have a very narrow focus and a very short time frame. Examples would include day-to-day -day transaction data, current inventory levels or scheduling unexpected or ad hoc work. Operational data is more often expressed in number of units, hours or maybe material quantities as opposed to monetary terms. Finally, it is important to recognise the link between the tiers on the hierarchy. 
For example, the board of directors of a company may decide to launch a new market with the aim of, say, taking 5% of the total market within three years. This would be a strategic decision. Senior management would then be required to plan the necessary resource to support this, e.g. man hours, equipment, advertising, sales promotion, etc. These would be tactical decisions. And then finally, lower management may set weekly targets for production and sales staff, ensuring quality of product and timely delivery to customers. In terms of the types of management information systems, there are several types that can provide data to an organisation. The first one to look at is called a transaction processing system, or abbreviated to TPS. A TPS system has the ability to collect, store and modify and retrieve large volumes of data of an organisation. And the key characteristics of a TPS system are as follows. Basically, rapid response. If fast performance is vital to a business, the input needs to become the output in a matter of seconds. Reliability. Some organisations rely heavily on a TPS system. If potential failure could stop business, then a backup and recovery process must be in place. Inflexibility. A TPS system will follow a standard process route. It is not able to adapt or have any flexible response to any input it will receive. And finally, processing. A TPS can process data in batches or in real time. With batch processing, data is collected throughout a designated time period and processed at a later point in time, giving a time delay. However, real-time processing is the immediate processing of data. This would be vital for organisations that deal with things such as flight, train or hotel bookings, which need an immediate response. The next system is just known as the Management Information System, abbreviated to MIS. A Management Information System has the ability to take data from the TPS system and convert it into summary or exception reports for decision making. For example, some Management Information Systems allow users to generate customised reports for example, this may break down sales into product type, region, salesperson, etc. And most have different display choices, e.g. graphical or tabular. It is important to note that a management information system generally doesn't have any analytical capability. The next system worthy of note is called an executive information system, or abbreviated to an EIS. This system will typically draw critical strategic information data from an internal management information system and then will also allow communication with external sources of information. For example, data from competitors, maybe legislation, market research and maybe databases such as Reuters. An executive information system will typically involve data analysis and modelling tools and it is capable of performing what-if analysis to aid strategic decision making. The last system is an enterprise resource planning system or abbreviated to ERP, an ERP. An ERP system is designed in a modular way and will allow integration between the key processes of an organisation. It has the capability of serving the data needs of all the different functional departments. Typically, an ERP system will support sales and order processing, probably procurement, production, distribution, customer service, human resource and finance activities. The principal benefit of an ERP system is that it shares the same data between different departments. For example, if a customer order is entered into the system, it will check current inventory levels and prompt purchases if necessary. It will update the manufacturing schedule and deploy adequate resource at the time of manufacture. The system will update any shipping or distribution schedules and will trigger an invoice to the customer at the appropriate time.
There are many benefits to be realised from a fully integrated ERP system, including the removal of inefficiencies and duplicated data with significant savings on time and effort. In addition, many ERP systems will have electronic data interchange facilities with major suppliers and customers for the automated transmission of documents such as purchase orders and invoices. A system, i.e. something that connects things up, can be either open or closed. A closed system is isolated from the external environment and data will not be provided to or received from the environment. Closed systems are very rarely found in naturally occurring situations and certainly within a business environment there is a real need to communicate and react to the external environment just in order to survive. As such, business organisations are open systems. The decisions they make will be influenced by suppliers, customers, maybe government or financial institutions. By having an open system, a business can focus on the external factors that are critical to the success of the organisation and adapt to the changing environment as necessary. Next we will consider the sources of management accounting information and these sources can be both internal and external. Starting with internal source, this will include data captured within the financial accounting records such as data from the sales and purchase ledgers or maybe payroll data. It is important to understand that not all data will be monetary. Production data may include machine capacities, movement in inventory levels, maybe maintenance requirements or sales data. It may include the number of returns or product warranty issues. A significant amount of this data will be extracted from the company systems, but there could also be informal communications between management and staff, interviews or maybe documented meetings. External information generally tends to be more relevant to strategic and tactical decision making as opposed to operational decision making. There are many external sources. For example, a company may employ a legal expert or tax specialist who will collect information regarding their specific area and understand how this will affect the organisation and pass the information on to those who are affected. A marketing manager may commission some market research on a potential new product and organisations will hold data from their own customers and suppliers due to the interaction they have with them. Data can be obtained through internet or trade journals. External data can be either primary or secondary. Primary data is tailored to a company's exact needs. Market research commissioned by a company would be a good example of this. The advantage of primary data is it will be meaningful and 100% relevant to the company. However, the biggest disadvantage is that generally it will be more expensive than secondary data to obtain. Secondary data is not collected by the organisation itself. Examples will be government statistics, internet or public databases, or maybe data from trade journals or consumer panels. Secondary data can be very valuable to a business, and both time and money will be saved in comparison to primary data. However, the disadvantage is that the data may not be totally relevant to the organisation. In addition, the data may be biased, dependent on who originally carried it out or for what purpose. Organisations using secondary data should ensure that they only use meaningful data. The costs of obtaining and using information, both internal and external, can be significant. With regard to internal data, the costs of collection, processing and the production of data can be divided into three categories, these being data capture costs, process costs and other indirect costs of producing the information in the required format. Examples of these could potentially include the cost of barcoding and scanning equipment, time for personnel to input data into a system, or maybe time spent analysing the data and producing it in a usable format. 
Companies should be mindful of the cost of inefficient use of information, for example collecting data that is not needed or not used or possibly the duplication of information. With regard to external data costs, these could include the direct costs of a market research survey, maybe subscriptions to journals or magazines, and maybe the cost of internet downloads. These types of costs are easily identifiable and can be considerable. There will, however, also be indirect costs associated with external data, such as wasted time for excessive searching, processing and general information overload, the costs for which are much more difficult to identify and quantify. Once the relevant data has been collated and processed, it is important to consider the necessary controls over such information. For example, internal data may well include sensitive and confidential data, for example personnel or payroll records, which should only be made available to certain individuals within an organisation. Typically, organisations may well have a procedures manual which sets out the controls for distributing internal data. This could include the format of the report, the frequency of them, who should be included on the distribution list, it will make clear as to what information is regarded as confidential and whether any paper documents could be binned or require shredding. In addition, it would be normal for employees to be contractually required not to divulge any confidential information that they are privy to. Much data now is distributed throughout an organisation via emails and it is important that organisations adequately consider computer security. With regard to internal security, management can regulate which members of staff have access to different types of data. For example, access to human resource records will be restricted to human resource personnel. Passwords can limit access to certain areas within a system and will also provide an audit trail to establish any unauthorised attempt at access. Information transmitted from one part of an organisation to another could be vulnerable to interception, so it is important for companies to establish a policy for encrypting confidential data. Encryption is a method of scrambling data, so it becomes unintelligible to any unauthorised party who attempts to intercept it. The growth of the internet has led to a much greater increased exposure to security risks. An organisation can protect its data from external unauthorised access by using a firewall. A firewall will selectively allow or block inbound traffic to an organisation's computer system by blocking any messages that do not conform to a specified set of criteria. They prevent unauthorised internet users from accessing private networks. In addition, computer viruses may arrive by email, which can be triggered when the user opens the email. Computer viruses can infiltrate and damage computer systems, while other spyware viruses watch activity on a computer system and then send the data over the internet to a third party. Antivirus software will scan files looking for known viruses and identify suspicious behaviour from a computer program that could indicate infection. Physical controls to data within a business could include door or cupboard locks or safes to prevent access to hardware or paper documentation. Hello, in this video we will be considering big data, what it is, and the opportunities and threats the organisation faces due to big data. As a related topic, we'll also consider data analytics, processing data to gain insight that help inform and implement organisational strategy. Let's start off by defining big data. In the modern age, we are drowning in data. It is all over the place in a variety of different sources. Consider, for a moment, your digital footprint. You may post what you're up to today on Facebook, or a photo on Instagram, saying where you are, what you're doing, who you're with, to close your wearing. You may also have searched online for something to buy, or downloaded a book. You may have listened to some music on Spotify. 
You may even have spoken to appliances in your home to turn the heating on. This is in addition to all the loyalty cards you use telling vendors what your big shopping habits are. All of these things leave a trail. Big data is information such as this, scattered around the internet. What use could this be to an organization? Before looking into potential use of big data, let's review what are its main sources. In theory, they can be grouped under the headings of social, human, machine, sensor, and transactional. Social or human is a source that's becoming more and more relevant to organizations. This source includes all social media posts, video posts, postings, etc. Machine or sensor data comes from what can be measured by the equipment used. And transactional comes from the transactions which are undertaken by the organization. This is perhaps the most traditional of the sources. A core area of theory about big data is Laney's five V's. The five V's help us to understand simultaneously both the advantages and the disadvantages of big data to a business. Let's work with an example as we go through the list. Imagine a business is attempting to build an accurate profile of its customers to help it plan its product range into the future. The first of the five V's is volume. There is an awful lot of this data out there. This is an opportunity because there is plenty to find out. A detailed picture could be built up of our customers to help us plan successfully for our new product range. However, there is also an issue. With so much data and information out there, it's difficult to cope with it all. We need to process all that data, and that takes time and money. We need to be smart in the way we approach this. The second of our five V's is velocity. It changes constantly. You may have posted somewhere in the last hour where you are or what you are doing. This is a great opportunity to build a remarkably current picture of you. Regular updating means we can understand what you are like now, as well as what you were like. Trends can be mapped as a result. We might see, for example, you are planning to go on a walking holiday this year, and that, through analysing Facebook trends, lots of your demographic are taking this up as a new hobby. This could help inform our choices for our project product range. However, the fact that it keeps changing so quickly is also a challenge for us. Keeping pace is difficult, and the pictures we pull together of you will be very quickly out of date. Our ability to utilise current information quickly is important. The third of the five V's is variety. The information is an awful lot of different sources and in different formats. Photographs, social media postings, website cookies, GPS tracker information, emails, instant messages, and so on and so on. This is good in the sense that information is a rich palette. We can build up a complex, multi-dimensional hologram of you to help us plan more accurately. However, practically, it's also a problem. Trying to name and access the sources and summarize the data meaningfully is a huge challenge. Because not all of the data is readily usable in analytics, it is important to differentiate between the three types of data. Structured data is the easiest to work with. It is highly organized with dimensions defined by set parameters. Think spreadsheets. Every piece of information is grouped into rows and columns. Specific elements defined by certain variables are easily discoverable. It's all your quantitative data. For example, age, billing, expenses, credit card numbers, etc. Structured data follows schemas essentially roadmaps to specific data points. These schemas outline where each datum is and what it means. It is the easiest type of data to analyse because it requires little to no preparation before processing. A user might need to cleanse data and pare it down to only the relevant points, but it won't need to be interpreted or converted too deeply before a true inquiry can be performed. Unstructured data is all our unorganised data. You might be able to figure out why it constitutes so much of the modern data library. Almost everything you do with your computer generates unstructured data. No one is transcribing their phone calls or assigning semantic tags to every tweet they send. While structured data saves time in an analytical process, taking the time and effort to give unstructured data some level of readability is cumbersome. The hardest part of analysing unstructured data is teaching an application to understand the information it's, it's extracting. 
More often than not, this means translating it into some form of structured data. Almost universally, it involves a complex algorithm blending the processes of scanning, interpreting, and contextualizing functions. Semi-structured data toes the line between structured and unstructured. Most of the time, this translates to unstructured data with metadata attached to it. Let's say you take a picture of your cat from your phone. It automatically logs the time the picture was taken, the GPS data at the time of the capture, and your device ID. If you're using any kind of web service for storage, like iCloud, your account info becomes attached to the file. Semi-structured data has no set schema. This can be both a benefit and a challenge. It can be more difficult to work with because effort must be put in to tell the application what each data point means. The second classification of data is based on its measurement levels. In this respect, there is a difference between categorical and numerical data. Categorical data describes the categories or groups. One example is car brands like Mercedes, BMW and Audi. They show different categories. Numerical data, on the other hand, as its name suggests, represents numbers. It is further divided into two subsets, discrete and continuous. Discrete data can usually be counted in a finite matter. A good example would be the number of children that you want to have. Continuous data is infinite and impossible to count. For instance, your weight can take on every value in some range. The fourth of the five V's is veracity. It means accuracy and truthfulness and relates to the quality of the data. If we want any analysis to provide useful findings for decision making, the data collected must be true. But how is this done in practice? To assess how true the data collected is, companies must consider not only how accurate or reliable a data set might be, but also how trusted is the source of the data. They must be able to trust the source of the data being collected and be confident that the data is reliable and accurate if they are to base important and often costly decisions on the findings of its analysis. The difficulty that companies face here is that by its very nature, the data collected comes from many different sources. Take, for example, data from social media. They can be easily manipulated, particularly given the recent increase in so-called fake news and growing reports of deliberately manipulated customer reviews on retail sites. The final of the five V's is value. There is little point in going to the effort and expense of gathering and analyzing the data if it does not ultimately result in adding value to the company. This is why it is important for companies to consider the potential of big data analytics and the value it could create if gathered, analyzed, and used wisely. In fact, each of the five V's is a huge challenge. However, the prizes are potentially huge. It can be a source of competitive advantage. If we can understand our customers better than others, we stand a good chance of making better decisions as a business. The challenges can seem overwhelming, but remember this, no one said this needs to be mastered perfectly, as indeed it cannot be mastered perfectly. You just need to do a better job at it than your competitors. Another concept related to this topic is the Big Data, or DIKW, pyramid. It is also known as the Knowledge Pyramid and explains the relationship between data, information, knowledge and wisdom. A range of raw data could be collected from various sources. For example, a company collects a range of data from previous purchases, customer questionnaires or social media posts. The raw data can be analysed to look for trends or patterns. For example, it may appear there is a link between the purchase of a particular product and a particular group of customers. This is information. In the next step, the company analyses information further to establish how the identified links are connected. Knowing the details of exactly what types of customers buy a particular product or favour particular products, features, is knowledge. Finally, the knowledge gathered can be used to make informed business decisions, and this is wisdom. For example, a company could adapt the packaging of its products to the tastes of different customer groups. Big data raises difficult ethical questions. Some people have a Big Brother style concern about businesses building detailed profiles of us. 
as well as potentially about legal concerns relating to data protection. Both of these risks carry associated reputation risks if our use of big data becomes public knowledge and it isn't received well. Also, increasing linkages with external data sources increases the risk of viruses infecting our systems. So big data is not without its risks and problems, but it has a huge upside potential. Data analytics is concerned with processing data to gain new insights that hopefully can be used to inform decisions in the organization. It may inform decisions to what we make, how we sell it, and who we sell it to, for example. This is not a new idea. Even before the days of big data, organizations were exploiting their internal data resources by consolidating them into one place, known as a data warehouse, and analyzing it to their advantage. One such example of an analytical procedure is data mining. A data mine is a piece of software that burrows into a set of data and notes apparent relationships between data items and tells you what it's found. A finding may or may not be useful. For example, it may say when sales increase, costs tend to increase, or when sales increase, profits tend to increase. Well, you may well have known this anyway. However, on occasion, it may just tell you something you didn't know and that you can exploit to your advantage. Another thing to mention is predictive analysis. This is a type of data mining which aims to predict future events. For example, the chance of someone being persuaded to upgrade the flight. When analyzing data, it is possible to use both descriptive and inferential statistics in our analysis. Descriptive statistics is the term given to the analysis of data that helps describe, show, or summarize data in a meaningful way, such that, for example, patterns might emerge from the data. It does not, however, allow us to make conclusions beyond the data we have analyzed or reach conclusions regarding any hypothesis we might have made. They are simply a way to describe our data. For example, if we had the results of 100 pieces of students' coursework, we may be interested in the overall performance of those students. We would also be interested in the distribution or spread of the marks. Descriptive statistics allow us to do this by using a combination of tabulated description, such as tables, graphical description, such as graphs and charts, and statistical commentary, such as a discussion of the results. Inferential statistics are techniques that allow us to use these samples to make generalizations about the populations from which the samples were drawn. It is therefore important that the sample accurately represents the population. The process of achieving this is called sampling inferential statistics and arises out of the fact that sampling naturally incurs sampling error and thus the sample is not expected to be perfectly representative of the population. In conclusion, as we've discussed, Businesses create an advantage through exploiting core competencies and unique resources. Big data and how it is an analysed can help improve the quality of decisions made in the organisation, enhancing the value added by the business. The organisational processes related to big data, therefore, in themselves become a dimension of competition. If we can deal with it better than our competitors, we will gain an advantage over them as a result. Thanks for listening. This presentation covers the management accounting technique of activity-based costing. Traditionally, manufacturing was labour-intensive. It made sense, therefore, to trace overheads to products, or to absorb, based on the number of labour hours worked, or the number of units produced. Absorption costing was used for this. Activity-based costing is an alternative to absorption costing. It recognises that today, Manufacturing is no longer labour intensive and looks for new ways to trace overheads to products. Before delving into activity based costing in more detail, it is important to put this treatment of overheads into some context in terms of how they were traditionally treated under absorption costing. Company A manufactures two products, product P and product Q. Company A is trying to calculate the cost per unit of production of product P using an absorption costing system. Material and labour are direct costs. 
we can link these costs to each individual unit of production. So the material cost is 50 per unit and the labour cost is 40 per unit for product P. Indirect costs are also known as overheads. These costs cannot be linked directly to each unit of production, so we must find a suitable method of allocating the overhead amongst the units. Traditionally, under absorption costing, the overhead per unit is calculated based on the overhead absorption rate. The overhead absorption rate uses one basis of absorption. In other words, one way to divide the overhead amongst the units. So, total overhead is divided by the total number of labour hours, or maybe the total number of units produced. Say, for example, total company overhead equaled 3,000, and it was decided to absorb overhead based on the number of units produced. Let's say 70 units of product P, as well as 30 units of product Q, were produced. In other words, 100 units in total. Then the overhead absorption rate per unit of each product would be $30, being 3,000 of overhead divided by 100 units. Total cost per unit of P now equals $120. Company A may have decided to absorb its overhead based on the number of labour hours worked. So if, for example, 250 labour hours had been worked in the period, then the overhead would be absorbed at the rate of $12 per labour hour. If we assume that each unit of product P required two labour hours, then the overhead absorbed by each unit would be $24, being two hours multiplied by $12 per hour. Total cost of units of product P now equals $114. Under absorption costing, company A could also have absorbed its overhead using other bases of absorption, such as number of machine hours worked or using the prime cost of each unit as a basis of absorption. In the modern environment, activity-based costing recognises that overheads are no longer driven by manufacturing activities only, or the number of units produced. Overheads are incurred as a result of product research and development, design, technology, after-sales service for example, all of which focus on improving the quality of the product. Different products consume these company resources in different ways, thus incurring overheads at a different rate. So, bearing this in mind, activity-based costing looks for a new way to trace overheads to products. In other words, a new way to absorb. Material and labour are direct costs in our example. We can link these costs to each individual unit of production. There is no difference in how we treat direct costs under absorption costing and activity-based costing. So, the material cost of $50 per unit and the labour cost of $40 per unit for product P are the same under activity-based costing as they are under absorption costing. However, under activity-based costing, the overhead cost per unit and so the total cost per unit will differ to the $30 and $24 we have calculated using absorption costing. This is the focus of this presentation. Activity-based costing will perform an alternative calculation to derive the overhead cost per unit, resulting in a more accurate reflection of the overhead attributable to each product and thus a more accurate product cost. There are four main steps involved in calculating the overhead cost per unit under activity-based costing. Step 1. Separate the overheads into cost pools. Step 2. Identify the cost driver for each cost pool. Step 3. Calculate the overhead absorption rate for each cost driver. And Step 4. Use the overhead absorption rate to absorb costs from each cost pool into the units of production. This calculates the overhead cost per unit. Let's apply these steps to a new comprehensive example. Costing company produces two products, product A and product B. The budgeted cost information for each product is as follows. The direct material costs are given as 35 for product A and 45 for product B. 
Similarly, the direct labour costs are given as 25 for product A and 20 for product B. The production overheads are broken into different types or cost pools. The cost pools are machine costs, setup costs and quality inspection costs. The total overhead for each cost pool is 300,000, 700,000 and 250,000 respectively. Total production overhead amounts to 1.25 million. For each of product A and product B we are also told the number of production units, the number of production runs, the number of inspections and the machine hours spent producing these units. There are two requirements. Number one, calculate the cost of each unit of product A and product B under absorption costing using the number of units as a basis of absorption. And secondly, calculate the cost of each unit of product A and product B using an activity-based costing system. Let's calculate the cost per unit under absorption costing. The material and labour costs for both product A, 35 and 25, and product B, 45 and 20, have been given to us in the question. These are the direct costs. The overhead totals 1.25 million. Using absorption costing, the total overhead will be absorbed on the basis of the total number of units produced by the company. Product A has 25,000 units of production and Product B has 50,000 units of production, meaning a total number of units equaling 75,000. So, the overhead absorption rate is $16.67 per unit of production. Being the overhead of 1.25 million divided by 75,000 units. If we add the overhead cost per unit to the material and labour cost, the total cost per unit of product A and B amounts to $76.67 and $81.67 respectively. We know that this is the cost per unit under absorption costing, or the traditional cost per unit in which overheads are absorbed based on production volume, in this case the number of production units. Let's calculate the cost per unit using activity-based costing. As outlined above, a four-step approach will be used to calculate the overhead cost per unit. Step 1 is to separate overheads into cost pools. This has been done for us in the question, in that the total company overhead of 1.25 million has been separated into three overhead types or cost pools. The cost pools are machine cost of 300,000, setup cost of 700,000 and quality inspection cost of 250,000. Step 2 is to identify the cost driver for each cost pool. Here we need to determine what is driving each of the three overhead types. The cost drivers are typically given in any activity-based costing scenario and it is the job of the student to link the cost driver to the cost pool. So the first cost pool, machine costs, is driven by machine time or the number of machine hours. Setup costs are determined by the number of production runs while quality inspection costs are driven by the number of inspections carried out. Step 3 requires us to calculate the overhead absorption rate for each cost driver. Now that we have linked the cost drivers to the cost pools, we can calculate the cost driver rate or overhead absorption rate. This is calculated as the overhead per cost pool divided by the cost driver incidence. So the machine overheads are 300,000. The number of machine hours or cost driver incidents is 100,000, being 50,000 hours for each of product A and product B. This produces a cost driver rate of $3 per machine hour, being the overhead of 300,000 divided by 100,000 hours. Thus, each machine hour used in the production of A or B will incur an overhead charge of $3. Similarly, setup cost totals 700,000. The total number of production runs is 280, being 200 for product A 
and 80 for product B. Hence the cost driver rate, or overhead absorption rate, is 2500 per production run. The final cost pool is quality inspection costs, which total 250,000. The cost driver here is the number of inspections, which total 750, being 250 for product A and 500 for product B, resulting in a cost driver rate of $333.33 for every inspection. In step 4 we use the overhead absorption rate, as calculated above, to absorb costs from each cost pool into the units of production. This will calculate the overhead costs per unit. So, for product A, machine costs of 150,000 are absorbed, being 50,000 hours at $3 per hour. Setup costs of 500,000 are absorbed, being 200 production runs at 2,500 for each production run, and quality inspection overhead of 83,000, 333 is absorbed, being 250 inspections at an overhead absorption rate of $333.33. Total overhead absorbed by product A equals 733,333. Similarly for product B, machine costs of 150,000 are absorbed, 50,000 hours at $3 per hour. Setup costs of 200,000 are incurred, being 80 production runs at 2,500 per production run and quality inspection overhead of 166,667 is absorbed, being 500 inspections at an overhead absorption rate of $333.33 per inspection. Total overhead absorbed by product B equals 516,667. Having calculated the total overhead attributable to product A, and B, we can now generate the overhead for each unit of production. 25,000 units of product A have been produced, meaning an overhead per unit of $29.33. This is made up of the total overhead of 733,333 divided by the total A units of 25,000. Similarly, 50,000 units of product B have been produced meaning an overhead per unit of $10.33. Finally, now that the overhead cost per unit has been calculated, we can add this to the direct material and labour costs to derive the cost per unit of production. This all means the total cost per unit of product A is $89.33, while the total cost per unit of product B is $75.33. Let's focus on the allocation of the overhead between the two products and understand how activity-based costing has split each overhead type between product A and product B. As discussed above, on a total basis, A has incurred more overhead than B. Both A and B have used the same number of machine hours, 50,000, meaning the same machine overhead is absorbed by each product, 150,000. Even though B has used twice the number of inspections than A, 500 compared to 250, thus incurring twice the amount of inspection overhead, product A has used 200 production runs compared to B's 80 production runs. Given the significant overhead absorption rate of $2,500 per production run, product A absorbs 500,000 of setup costs, compared to 200,000 for product B. So. Activity-based costing considers the activities that drive costs and traces overhead to products based on this. Essentially, the more activities, or the more use of company resources, then the greater the overhead absorbed. Overall, there's a different cost per unit for each product when comparing absorption costing and activity-based costing. Under activity-based costing, product A cost per unit has increased from $76.67 to $89.33, while product B has seen a decrease in the cost per unit from $81.67 to $75.33.
Given the more precise allocation of overhead under activity based costing, each unit has a more accurate cost. The cost per unit has knock on implications for product pricing decisions and product viability. Ultimately, there are longer term implications for the company's decision making and planning. In the modern environment, overheads relate to product design and research, customer service, and other such product sustaining activities. Absorbing overheads based on production volume is no longer as relevant as it once was in the past. This supports the use of activity based costing in the modern environment, resulting in a more accurate reflection of the overhead attributable to each product and thus a more accurate product cost. Despite its perceived superiority, problems can arise when implementing an activity based costing system. Activity based costing is a more complex costing system. It may not be fully understood by many managers and therefore not fully accepted as a means of cost control. Staff within an organization may be resistant to such change. At a minimum, activity based costing training would be required, which would represent a cost to the company. Difficulty can arise in identifying appropriate cost drivers. It is not always easy to identify a single cost driver that is specific to a particular overhead. Indeed, this can be an arbitrary process. Activity based costing relies upon detailed accounting records in which cost pools and cost drivers are identifiable. Compiling such records can be a time consuming and costly exercise. Target costing is a market driven approach to pricing that looks to calculate an acceptable level of costs based on a selling price that has been researched in the external market. Let's consider the steps involved for a typical manufacturing company in the target costing process. In a manufacturing company, target costing applies to a particular product. So we begin in step 1 by specifying a product that the company wishes to sell. This will involve an analysis of the market and a determination of what product features are of interest to customers. In step 2, the price at which the product will be sold is considered. This will be a market driven price based on what a customer is willing to pay for the product or the perceived value of that product. This is referred to as the target price. The company then calculates the profit that is required from the sale of this product. This profit is usually determined by what the company investors may deem to be an acceptable return on their investment. This can be referred to as the required profit or the target profit. In step 4 we determine the target cost. This is calculated by subtracting the required profit, as we've discussed in step 3, from the product selling price, as we saw in step 2. The target cost represents the highest acceptable cost of the product. If the estimated costs of that same product are greater than the target cost, then a cost gap exists. This cost gap needs to be closed, meaning a review of the costs incurred during the product's design and production stages. It is important, however, that the quality of the product is not impaired as a result of any cost reductions. Finally, in step 6, if a cost gap still exists, the company could consider negotiating with customers in order to determine whether the manufacturer of the product proceeds. Let's see the target costing process in action by way of an example. Company A has calculated a selling price for a new product, product P, of $100. A profit margin of 30% is required to satisfy the company investors. The question is, calculate the target cost. We now know that the sales price, minus the profit or the required profit, is equal to the cost or the target cost. Company A has established a selling price of $100. We can assume that significant market research has been undertaken to ensure that this product P is of interest to customers. Also we can assume the price of $100 is competitive and has been set based on what a customer may be willing to pay for this product, as well as the desired share of the market sought by company A. In other words, we can say that the $100 sales price 
is a target price. A profit margin is calculated based on what it is an acceptable return to company A's investors. A 30% required profit margin equates to a $30 profit based on product P's sales price of $100. Based on these numbers, we can derive the target cost of the new product. This is calculated by subtracting the required profit of $30 from the product selling price of $100. The target cost of $70 represents the highest acceptable cost to company A of making product P. Now let's continue with the same scenario involving company A. Company A calculates that material labour and overhead costs associated with producing product P are $40, $25 and $13 respectively. Calculate any cost gap that may exist regarding product P. The total estimated cost of making product P amounts to 78, being the sum of 40, 25 and 13. This estimated cost of 78 exceeds the maximum allowable cost or target cost of $70 by $8. This $8 is referred to as a cost gap or a target gap. Company A must focus on reducing or eliminating the cost gap. In other words, the anticipated material, labour and overhead costs incurred during the design and production of product P must be revisited to see if any cost reductions can be made. It's important that in its effort to reduce costs, Company A does not sacrifice the quality of the product. Any impairment of quality could have a knock-on impact on customer demand and ultimately company profit. Value engineering is a term often associated with target costing at this stage of the process. Value engineering helps businesses achieve cost efficiencies and meet their cost and profitability targets. Attention therefore should be focused more on reducing the cost of product features perceived by the customer as non-value adding. To eliminate the cost gap, a company could consider alternative product designs. It can often be easier to reduce costs at the design stage of a product than during its production stage. If a company is looking for possible areas of cost reduction during the manufacturing or production stage, then the following may be considered. Can any of the materials be eliminated? Perhaps, for example, the product packaging could be reduced. Can an alternative, cheaper material be substituted into production? Care must be taken here that a cheaper material does not impact the quality of the product. Can the cost of labour be reduced? Maybe it is possible to use lower skill labour, thus paying a reduced amount. Again, quality should not be compromised here. Staff morale could be improved, which might have positive implications for productivity. Automation. It may be possible to replace repetitive labour tasks with machinery. Over time, this could result in cost savings. Or perhaps the incidence of cost drivers could be reduced thus reducing any overheads incurred during production. These are just some possible actions a manufacturing company could consider when looking to eliminate a cost gap. Note that it is not possible to close the cost gap by increasing the selling price or reducing the profit of the product. The sales price and the required profit have already been determined by reference to factors external to the company. Target costing is just as relevant to the service sector as it is to the manufacturing sector. However, problems can arise when trying to apply target costing in service industries. Unlike manufacturing, service industries have the following characteristics which can make target costing more difficult to implement. Spontaneity. Unlike manufactured goods, a service is consumed at the exact same time that it is produced or made available. Or in other words, the service does not exist until the point where it is experienced by the customer. Perishability. Because the service is consumed immediately, then it is perishable. Hence, unlike a manufactured good, a service cannot be stored or placed in inventory. Intangible. 
A service cannot be seen or touched, hence it is intangible. This obviously differs to a manufactured product, which has physical substance and can be seen and touched. Unique. As a service involves people and typically human interaction, then no two services can ever be seen to be homogenous. While standardization of a service may be expected by the customer, this is often very difficult to provide. And finally, no transfer of ownership. Unlike manufactured goods, services do not result in the transfer of property. The purchase of a service only grants the customer access to, or the right to use, a facility. Traditional costing systems focus on costs incurred in the production stage only – material, labour, production overhead. Also, traditionally, costs are assessed on a periodic or financial year basis. In contrast, life cycle costing considers all costs that will be incurred by a product from the design stage right through to its retirement. In other words, life cycle costing focuses on pre-production production and post-production costs. So, by considering all of these costs, life cycle costing captures a true picture of product cost and can be seen as a cost tracking system over the life of that product, with the aim of minimizing the cost and thus maximizing the return. The life cost of a product can be linked to the various stages of that product's life cycle. Generally, there are five main stages of a product's life cycle. Research and development. The costs incurred at this stage include market research, product design, product testing and training of staff. Introduction. As the product is then introduced to the market, significant advertising costs might be incurred in addition to the production and distribution costs of that product. Growth. As the popularity of the product grows, production and warehousing costs also grow, and customer support costs increase. However, product unit costs may begin to fall as economies of scale are achieved. Maturity. Product sales are maximised at this point. Unit costs should now be low. Additional promotional costs may be necessary to maintain customer awareness of the product or brand. Customer service costs will most likely be significant at the maturity stage. Decline. In the decline stage, companies may incur promotional costs to prolong product sales. Decommissioning and product retirement costs will be maximised at this stage. Remember to assess the profitability of the product over its entire life, as opposed to over a particular year, the above costs associated with the life cycle of the product need to be understood. Let's see how the life cycle cost can be derived for a particular product. Company A will shortly launch a new product onto the market, product T. Market research costs of 800,000 and product design costs of 2.3 million will be incurred in year one. These are pre-production costs. Budgeted units of production are 12,000 in year two, 20,000 in year three and 7,000 in year four. Advertising costs are budgeted to be 1.5 million in year 2, 2.1 million in year 3 and 400,000 in year 4. The manufacturing cost of each unit of production is 110, 95 and 115 in years 2, 3 and 4 respectively. Disposal costs of 300,000 are incurred in year 5. These are post-production costs. The requirement is to calculate the life cycle cost per unit of product T. The life cycle cost per unit is calculated by considering all costs incurred over the product's five year life cycle. Hence, we divide the total product costs by the total number of units in order to derive a unit cost. So, we add year one pre-production costs of market research and product design to the advertising and manufacturing costs incurred in years 2, 3 and 4. Note that the annual manufacturing costs need to be calculated. In year 2, for example, 
manufacturing costs total 1.32 million, being 12,000 units of production multiplied by a unit cost of $110. Similarly, manufacturing costs total 1.9 million in year 3 and 805,000 in year 4. Of course, as we are considering all life cycle costs, we also add the post-production disposal costs incurred in year 5. Life cycle costs of product T amount to $11.425 million. Budgeted units of production in years 2, 3 and 4 total 39,000 units. Hence, the life cycle cost per unit calculated as total costs divided by total units or 11.425 million divided by 39,000 units is $292.95. There are obvious benefits available to a company engaging in life cycle costing. Given that life cycle costing captures all costs associated with a particular product, it generates a complete and more accurate product cost and a true picture of product profitability. A more accurate profit has, in turn, knock-on implications when considering the viability of the product, what price should be set, or how many units need to be sold in order to achieve break-even status. Ultimately, there are longer-term positive implications for the company's decision-making and planning. In this session we are going to cover the topic of throughput accounting. We are going to discuss and apply the theory of constraints, calculate and interpret the throughput accounting ratio and suggest how this ratio could be improved, and we will also apply throughput accounting to a multi-product decision-making problem. Throughput accounting assumes that the only totally variable cost is materials and that there is some element of fixed costs within labour and overheads and as such only material costs are considered within the throughput calculation. The throughput figure is therefore simply sales revenue minus material costs. So clearly in order to maximise throughput and therefore profit we want to maximise revenues and minimise conversion and material costs. Let's start by looking at the theory of constraints. This theory was formulated by Goldratt and Cox in 1986. The principle is that a business wants to turn materials into sales as soon as possible, to maximise the cash generated from those sales, and as a result an even production flow is required to achieve this. Clearly, if we want to maximise profitability, we want to ensure that we maximise our output of all profitable products, but sometimes this is not possible, as there is a scarce resource or other factor that limits our output levels. We call this the constraint or bottleneck. The sorts of issues that might cause a bottleneck would be availability of material, unreliable suppliers, labour or machines, or a poor salesperson resulting in sales volumes being limited. If there is a bottleneck reducing output within the production process, we want to make sure that we don't produce higher output levels before the bottleneck than the bottleneck can cope with as this will cause the levels of work in progress before the bottleneck to continually increase, hence the need for an even production flow. There are five main steps in the theory of constraints process. Step 1 is to identify the bottleneck or constraint. Step 2 is to decide the best means of exploiting the bottleneck. In other words, make sure that output is maximised at the bottleneck. Step 3 is to ensure that production up to the bottleneck is at the same rate as after the bottleneck, so that work in progress does not build up. Step 4 is to work out ways to elevate the bottleneck. This means working out ways of increasing the output at the bottleneck point, so that total output can increase. And step 5 is to return to step 1. Eventually, by removing one bottleneck, another is likely to appear. So at this stage we would need to go back to step 1 and repeat these 5 steps. Once we know what the constraint or bottleneck is, we can use limiting factor analysis to determine which product or products should be produced to maximise throughput. The calculations are performed in much the same way as for regular limiting factor analysis, 
but rather than ranking the products based on contribution per limiting factor, we will now rank them based on throughput per bottleneck resource. The product with the highest throughput per bottleneck resource should be produced first, followed by the product with the next best throughput per bottleneck resource, and so on until the bottleneck has been utilised in full. For more information on limiting factor analysis, please see the video covering this topic. As the throughput calculations are almost identical to regular limiting factor analysis, I will not be covering a numerical example on this video. The video on limiting factor analysis should provide enough detail, but there are also some numerical examples within an article on throughput accounting on the ACCA website that help support this video. The throughput accounting ratio can help us to determine whether a particular product covers operating costs and therefore makes a profit, or if it does not cover the operating costs and therefore makes a loss. We can then use this information to determine which product or products should be made given the bottleneck. There are two other ratios that need to be calculated before we can calculate the throughput accounting ratio, or TPAR. The first is the one we would use to rank products using a limiting factor analysis approach, and that is to take throughput per unit and divide through by the time taken in the bottleneck resource. This gives us the return per factory hour for a given product. The second ratio is based on the entire factory and is used to find the cost per factory hour. This is calculated as the total factory cost divided by the total time available on the bottleneck resource. The throughput accounting ratio is then calculated as return per factory hour divided by cost per factory hour. If the throughput accounting ratio is greater than 1, then throughput is greater than operating costs and a profit will be made. If the throughput accounting ratio is less than 1, then operating costs are higher than throughput and a loss is made. Clearly, where a loss is made, we would not want to make this product. Where more than one product has a throughput accounting ratio of greater than 1, then products would be ranked from the highest ratio to the lowest and the production plan would be based on this ranking. Let's run through a quick example to demonstrate the throughput accounting ratio calculation. A business makes and sells a product that has a selling price of $8 per unit. The material cost per unit is $2.50. Monthly operating costs are $32,000. And there is a bottleneck in relation to machine hours. There are only 8,000 hours available each month. And it takes one hour to make each unit. Based on this data, we can calculate the throughput per unit to be $8 minus $2.50, giving us $5.50. The return per factory hour is therefore $5.50 divided by one hour, so $5.50 per hour. The cost per factory hour will be the monthly operating costs of $32,000 divided through by the total time available each month of 8,000 machine hours. So this will be a cost of $4 per hour. The throughput accounting ratio is therefore $5.50 divided by $4, giving us 1.375. As this is greater than 1, we will make a profit if we make this product. We could see this by simply looking at the respective return and cost per hour figures. The revenue is higher than the cost, so we must make a profit on this product. The ratio is important for ranking products in multi-product decision-making processes. Once we know the throughput accounting ratio for a product, we might want to think about how we can increase or improve the ratio for that product. We could do this by either increasing selling prices or reducing material costs to increase the throughput itself. This may of course result in a reduction in demand or using a lower quality material which would then result in higher levels of wastage and a lower output. We could also look to improve productivity and thereby reduce the time spent making each unit, and as a result we could make more units in the time available. To finish off, please be aware that there are a number of criticisms of the throughput accounting ratio. It only considers the short term when operating expenses are mainly fixed. It concentrates too much on materials, excluding other costs that might impact on the profitability of the products being produced based on the ranking approach discussed. 
and it is more difficult to apply in the longer term when labour costs are classed as a variable cost. In recent years there has been increased emphasis on the need for businesses to consider the environmental impact of decisions that they make. Organisations are beginning to recognise that awareness of the environment is not optional, but instead is important for long-term survival and growth. Indeed, environmental management accounting has become increasingly topical. There are increased legal and regulatory requirements relating to environmental management. Financial penalties exist for non-compliance. Ethically, companies should be seen to be aware and care about how their activities, such as manufacturing for example, impact the environment. There is increased need to manage the risk and potential impact of environmental disasters. In order to maintain a positive public image and a strong brand, companies need to demonstrate effective environmental management. Environmental costs are becoming increasingly significant, thus impacting a company's financial performance. Hence. For all of these reasons, organisations are becoming more cognisant of the environment and how it can impact on the success of their business. Environmental costs can generally be split into two categories. Internal costs. This refers to costs that directly impact on the profit or loss account of the company. Examples include water disposal and waste disposal costs. Financial penalties or increased taxes paid due to poor environmental management record. Costs incurred in upgrading production processes to ensure compliance with regulations. Costs of securing a license or permit which allows the company to give off a certain level of carbon emissions. Also external costs. These costs are not borne by the company which is responsible for their origin but instead the costs are imposed on society. Examples of such external costs can include carbon emissions, increased healthcare costs, possibly as a result of such carbon emissions, energy and water usage, deterioration of other natural resources such as wildlife or forests for example, social welfare costs, in recent times, governments have been trying to transfer such costs to the companies responsible for generating them. In other words, trying to convert external costs to internal costs. This is usually achieved by way of imposing financial penalties or increasing taxes. Increased carbon emissions from a company's manufacturing plant, for example, may result in a corresponding increase in tax payable by that company. Also. Given the need for a company to be aware of the environmental impact of its activities and the related broader implications for that company, as we have been discussing above, some organisations are voluntarily converting external costs to internal costs. Organisations are frequently unaware of the extent or types of environmental costs within their business. As a result, they struggle to properly account for environmental costs and to implement effective cost-saving programs. Some appropriate management accounting techniques have been put forward to identify, measure and reduce environmental costs. Remember to do so provides mutual benefit to both the company and the environment. Let's examine some of these techniques. Input-output analysis. The logic here is that all inputs to a process must be traced to outputs. This approach forces an organisation to consider all outputs from a process regardless of whether they result in a finished unit of production, scrap item that can be disposed of, wastage or other. Thus any waste or pollution can be tracked on both a physical and a cost basis. For example, say 100 kilograms of materials have been purchased and input into the production process. At the end of the production process there are 90 kilograms of output or production. Hence the 10 kilograms lost during production must be accounted for in some way. Perhaps 4 kilograms of this has been sold as scrap. 
6 kilograms is classified as waste. By assessing the outputs in terms of both physical quantities and related monetary terms, the company is forced to focus on the environmental cost. Flow cost accounting. Flow cost accounting monitors the flow of material through a business in three categories of its organizational structure. The purchase of material, the production system and delivery to the customer, and disposal of waste. Flow cost accounting highlights material flows by examining the physical quantities involved, their costs and their value at each stage of the organization. Flow cost accounting aims to reduce the quantity of material at each stage. Not only should this reduce the company's carbon footprint, which will have a positive effect on the environment, but it should also reduce the company's costs over the long term. Activity-based costing. By identifying cost drivers, activity-based costing helps us to understand how costs arise, and so the company can focus on reducing these costs. Thus, activity-based costing principles can be used to identify drivers for environmental costs. This would involve a detailed analysis of the business processes. If, for example, it could be ascertained that the number of production runs was the dominant cost driver of a company's electrical costs, then the company could focus on reducing that number of production runs, thus reducing the electrical or environmental cost. Life cycle costing. Life cycle costing considers all costs over the life of a product. Pre-production, production, post-production. Post Hence, by using life cycle costing, a cost incurred by the company can be more easily identified. Once identified, management can then focus on reducing such costs. Environmental costs can be identified and measured at each stage of the product's life cycle, from the design stage right through to its obsolescence. Key features of a company's environmental management accounting system might include some of the following. Ensure regulatory compliance. This might include monitoring waste levels to ensure they are not exceeded or ensuring staff receive a standard level of training. A company may carry out internal audits to ensure it is compliant. The company should have an online environmental policy statement. The company's public relations department might have a defined set of environmental procedures. Realistic targets should be set to reduce carbon emissions and related environmental costs. Such targets should be part of a larger performance appraisal process. Budgeted environmental cost reduction targets should be compared to actual results. If targets are not met, then corrective action should be considered. When making decisions, it is sometimes important to consider the relevant financial information. In other words, we must consider the relevant costs and the relevant revenues. In this presentation, we are going to focus on the relevant costs associated with decision-making. A relevant cost can be defined as a future incremental cash flow. These terms are important and form the basis to understanding much of relevant costing. So let's take a look at each in turn. Future. We are interested only in future costs. Any costs that have been incurred in the past are ignored. These past costs are referred to as sunk costs. Incremental. Only costs that arise as a direct result of the decision are relevant. So, costs which are non-specific or fixed would be ignored. Cash flow. Relevant costing is only concerned with cash flows. Non-cash flow items, such as depreciation for example, are not relevant as there is no cash flow linked to depreciation. Let's apply the concept of relevant costing to typical cost items we see arising. Let's firstly consider material cost. When trying to assess the relevant cost of material, we need to consider firstly whether the material required is in stock. If it is not in stock, 
that the material must be purchased, meaning the relevant cost, or future incremental cash flow, is the current purchase price. If the material is in stock, then we need to consider if it is currently used elsewhere in the business. If it has no other use in the business, then the relevant cost of taking and using this material is the resale proceeds lost, or scrap value lost, from not selling or disposing of the material. If the material is used elsewhere in the business, then we must assess whether this material can be replaced. If it can be replaced, then the relevant cost is the current purchase price paid to replace what we have taken. If it cannot be replaced, however, it is considered to be scarce, and to calculate the relevant cost, we must consider the contribution that has been lost as a result of not using the material elsewhere in the business. Let's consider three scenarios where we put these principles of relevant costing of material into practice. Scenario 1. A Limited is considering a project which requires 100 kilograms of material. The material is in regular use within the business. There are 400 kilograms of material in stock which were purchased for $1.40 per kilogram. The current purchase price is $2 per kilogram. What is the relevant cost of material to A Limited? As the material is in regular use, whatever is taken from stock will ultimately need to be replaced. 100 kilograms of material is needed, all of which is currently available in inventory. So these 100 kilograms would need to be replaced at $2 per kilogram meaning a total material cost of $200. This represents the future cash outflow in respect of material as a result of the decision of A Limited to undertake the project. In other words, the $200 is the relevant cost of material. The $1.40 is a sunk cost and is not relevant to the decision. Let's take a look at another example of relevant costing regarding materials. Scenario 2. B Limited is considering a project that requires 100 kilograms of material. The company has 500 kilograms in inventory, which were purchased some years ago for $1.50 per kilogram. However, this material is no longer in use within the business. The current purchase price is $2 per kilogram of material. B Limited could sell each kilogram for 90 cents. What is the relevant cost of the material to be limited? As the material is no longer in use within the business, any stock taken will not need to be replaced. However, taking 100 kilograms of infantry from the warehouse means that B Limited will not receive the resale value or scrap value of 90 cents for each kilogram. Thus, the cash flow impact of using 100 kilograms of material is $90 being 100 kilograms multiplied by 90 cent each. This represents the relevant cost of the material to be limited. Note that the $1.50 is a pass cost or sunk cost and is excluded from our analysis. Also, the current purchase price of $2 is not considered here. Scenario 3. C Limited is considering a job that requires 100 kilograms of material. 350 kilograms of material are in inventory. Material is no longer available to purchase and if it is not used by C Limited on this proposed job it would be used in the manufacture of product K. Each unit of product K uses 4 kilograms of material and generates a contribution of $10 per unit. What is the relevant cost of the material to C Limited? The material is in inventory, but is no longer available to purchase. This means that the 100 kilograms required could not be replaced. However, if taken, then 25 units of product K, being 100 kilograms divided by 4 kilograms per unit, would not be produced or sold. This would result in loss contribution of $250 to C Limited. The $250 being made up of 
25 units of product K multiplied by $10 per unit. Thus, the future incremental cash flow impact of using 100 kilograms of material for this job is $250. Relevant costing principles can also be applied to the use of labour by a business to undertake a particular job or project. If there is spare labour capacity or idle staff within the business, then the relevant cost is zero, since putting this labour to work on the project does not represent an additional cost to the business. However, if there is no spare capacity, then perhaps the company could hire more labour or work overtime. If so, then the relevant cost is the cost of hiring that additional labour or working that overtime. If hiring additional labour or working overtime is not possible, then labour is deemed to be scarce. Thus, to undertake the proposed job, labour would need to be reallocated from elsewhere in the business. This means the relevant cost is the opportunity cost of moving the labour, being the lost sales proceeds less any savings in material costs. Let's put these principles into practice and consider three scenarios regarding the relevant cost of labour. Scenario 1. Delimited is considering a project which requires 100 hours of labour. Currently, there are 180 hours of spare labour capacity. Workers are paid $5 per hour. An agreement stipulates the staff cannot be laid off. And the question is, what is the relevant cost of labour? If Delimited decided to go ahead with the project, the relevant cost of labour will be nil. As spare labour capacity exists and labour is already paid, there is no future cash flow associated with putting that labour to work. Scenario 2. E-Limited is considering a job which requires 50 hours of labour. There is no spare labour capacity. However, additional staff could be hired at a rate of $6 per hour for this project. What is the relevant cost of labour for this job? The future cash outflow associated with the job is $300, being the 50 hours of required labour multiplied by the rate of pay of $6 per hour. Hence the relevant cost of labour for this job is $300. Scenario 3. F Limited is considering a project which requires 100 hours of labour. There is no spare labour capacity and it is not possible to hire additional staff. Labour would have to be removed from the production of Product T in order to undertake this project. Currently, Product T is sold for $50, incurs direct material cost of $10 and requires one hour of direct labour at a cost of $8. And the question is, what is the relevant cost of labour for this project? In this case, the relevant cost, being the future cash flow impact as a result of undertaking the project, would be the opportunity cost of not producing product T. Staff would have to be diverted from producing product T in order to work on F Limited's other project. As 100 hours are required for the project and product T needs one labour hour for each unit, then 100 units of product T would not be completed. So. The cash flow impact of diverting the staff from product T would be the lost sales proceeds of $50 per unit less the material cost of $10 per unit that would be saved. The opportunity cost of not producing one unit of T is $40, meaning a total opportunity cost or relevant cost of $4,000 being $40 per unit multiplied by 100 units, given that 100 units of T would now not be produced. Let's consider relevant costing in relation to overheads. An overhead is a relevant cost if it is specific to or attributable to the decision being considered by the company. So a variable overhead or a fixed overhead which are incurred as a direct result of the company's decision to undertake a particular job are considered to be relevant costs. However, Non-specific or general fixed costs are not incremental and are not relevant. 
Also, if a fixed cost is said to be absorbed or allocated, then this is usually indicative of that fixed cost being general, not specific. Let's take a look at an example regarding the relevant costs of overheads. G Limited is considering whether to add an extension to its building. If added, variable overheads of $10 per hour would be incurred. The extension would also absorb building fixed overhead charges at an absorption rate of $8 per direct labour hour. And the question is, what are the relevant overhead costs per month if 9,000 labour hours are worked in each month? The relevant cost of the variable overhead is 90,000, being 9,000 hours multiplied by the variable overhead of $10 per hour. The relevant cost of the fixed overhead is nil, as no additional fixed cost is incurred, in other words the cost is not incremental or specific to the building extension. So overall the total relevant cost in relation to overhead is 90,000. Relevant costing can also be considered in relation to non-current assets. The relevant cost of a non-current asset can be referred to as the deprival value. In other words, if the company were deprived of a non-current asset, what's the least amount the company would have to receive to be no worse off than it is now? There's a formula we can follow which will determine a non-current asset's deprival value. This is calculated as the lower of the asset's replacement cost and its recoverable amount. The recoverable amount is the higher of the asset's net realizable value, being the fair value less cost to sell, and its value in use, being the present value of its future cash flows. Let's take a look at an example. H Limited purchased a machine some years ago for 23,000. The machine could be sold today for 13,000. If it is kept within H Limited's business, it will generate 18,000. An identical machine could be purchased today for 15,000. The question is, what is the relevant cost of using the machine on another job? The relevant cost of a non-current asset is the lower of its replacement cost and its recoverable amount. The machine's replacement cost is 15,000. The recoverable amount is the higher of the net realizable value of the machine, 13,000, and its value in use, 18,000. So 18,000, being the higher amount, represents the most that H Limited could expect to recover from this asset. In other words, 18,000 is the recoverable amount. The relevant cost is the lower of the replacement cost of 15,000 and the recoverable amount of 18,000, meaning the relevant cost of the machine is 15,000. In other words, if H Limited were deprived of this machine today, then the least amount of cash it would need to receive in order to be no worse off than it currently is, is 15,000. In summary then, a relevant cost is the future cash flow impact of a company undertaking a particular course of action, usually making a decision, undertaking a job, or considering a project. Relevant costing principles can be applied to material, labour, overheads and non-current assets. Typically each of these items is considered separately. In this session we are going to look at how costs, revenues and profits interrelate with each other. We will explain the nature of cost volume profit or CVP analysis, learn how to calculate the break-even point and the margin of safety, Calculate the contribution to sales ratio and what this means. Calculate target profits and revenues. Produce break-even charts and profit volume charts to help us to interpret cost and revenue data. And we will also look at the limitations of CVP analysis for planning and decision making. Cost volume profit analysis is used to determine how changes in costs and volume affect a company's operating income and net income. There are a number of techniques that can be used to help us understand how changes in cost and volume impact on profits. The first thing that we are going to look at is the break-even point. As the name suggests, this tells us the volume of sales at which we make a zero profit. In other words, we break even. 
So to make a zero profit, we just need to ensure that our fixed costs are covered by the contribution that we make selling our product or products. Remember that contribution is calculated as sales revenue minus variable costs. So if we know the contribution we can make for each unit we sell, the selling price per unit minus the variable costs per unit, we can work out how many units we need to sell to cover the fixed costs. The break-even formula therefore can be defined as fixed costs divided by contribution per unit. This will tell us the volume of units we need to sell in order to break even. If there are multiple products within the business, we need to use a weighted average contribution per unit on the bottom of the formula, and this can be calculated by taking the total contribution and dividing through by the total volume sold to generate that contribution. We can then multiply the break-even volume by our selling price per unit to find the break-even revenue. We can also calculate the break-even sales revenue using the contribution to sales ratio, as we will see later in this video. We can extend the break-even formula further to find the margin of safety. This is the difference between our budgeted sales volume and the break-even sales volume, and this will therefore tell us how far our sales volume can fall before we start making a loss. We can calculate the margin of safety as an absolute figure or as a percentage. The absolute figure is as mentioned a moment ago, budgeted sales minus the break-even sales volume. To find the margin of safety percentage, we would take this absolute figure and divide it through by the budgeted sales volume and then multiply up by 100%. The larger the margin of safety relative to the budgeted figures, the better, as this means that sales would have to drop some way before we start making a loss. Given that we have just mentioned the contribution to sales ratio, let's look at this next. The name of the ratio tells us how to calculate it. We take the contribution per unit and divide through by the selling price per unit. If there is more than one product in the mix, we cannot use this formula as the contribution and selling price per unit is likely to be different on a product by product basis. Instead, we need to use total contribution divided by total revenue, and this will generate a weighted average CS ratio covering all products. The CS ratio tells us how much of our revenue is converted to contribution to cover our fixed costs. The higher the CS ratio, the better as this means that we are generating a higher contribution per dollar of revenue. So if a product sells for $2 and has a CS ratio of 50%, this means that we have generated $1 of contribution per $2 of revenue, or 50 cents of contribution per dollar of revenue. Whereas if the CS ratio were 20%, we are only generating 40 cents of contribution per $2 of revenue, and therefore we need to sell more units to generate the same overall total contribution to cover the fixed costs. I mentioned earlier that we can calculate the break-even revenue using the CS ratio. We do this by taking the fixed costs and instead of dividing through by contribution per unit, we now divide through by the CS ratio. Clearly, where there are multiple products in the mix, the CS ratio used needs to be the weighted average CS ratio as covered above. We can also extend the break-even calculations to find a target profit or target revenue. Let's look at target profit first. The formula will now become total fixed costs plus target profit divided by contribution per unit. This means that the contribution generated not only covers the fixed costs, but also the profit we are hoping to generate. The target revenue can be calculated as the target profit multiplied by the selling price per unit, or fixed costs plus target profit divided through by the CS ratio, in much the same way as we did for the break-even revenue. If there are a number of products to consider, we need to remember to use the weighted average CS ratio on the bottom of the formula. We are now going to move on and look at the break-even and profit volume charts that can be produced and how they help us to interpret the relationship between costs, revenues and profits. Let's first look at the break-even chart. The axes for this graph are monetary amounts on the y-axis and units sold on the x-axis. We are going to plot a line on this graph for total revenue at different sales volumes and a line on the graph for total costs at different sales volumes. 
the revenue line is fairly straightforward. We assume that the unit price does not change at different sales volumes and therefore the revenue line can be plotted by calculating the revenue at two different sales volumes using this fixed selling price per unit. So if we said the selling price was $10 per unit, this would give us revenue of $20,000 if we sell 2,000 units and $30,000 if we sell 3,000 units. The line will also cross through the origin of course. No sales equals no revenue. With these figures we can plot the line on the graph. We now need to plot the total cost line. This will incorporate fixed and variable costs. Again, we assume that the variable cost per unit does not change despite changing output levels. We also assume that fixed costs remain the same at all output levels. The first thing we need to do is mark the fixed cost on the graph. Even when we make no sales, we will still incur these fixed costs. So when the sales volume is zero, we can mark a point on the y-axis for these fixed costs. Let's say the fixed costs are $5,000. If the variable cost per unit is $4, then we can add on a further $8,000 at a sales volume of 2,000 units, and a further $12,000 at a sales volume of 3,000 units. This gives a total cost of $13,000 at 2,000 units, and $17,000 at 3,000 units. These points can be plotted on the graph to create the total cost line. Notice that the total cost line does not start at zero, but at the fixed cost of $5,000. Now that we have the total revenue and total cost lines both plotted on the graph, we can find the break-even point to be the volume at which the lines cross, and therefore total revenue equals total cost, and neither a profit nor a loss is made. If we track this point back to the x-axis, we can see that the break-even point is at approximately 850 units. Using the formulaic approach already detailed, we can work out the break-even point to be $5,000 divided by $6. That's the selling price of $10 minus the $4 variable costs, which gives us 834 units. We always round up so as to make sure a small profit rather than a small loss. Another point to note with regards to the graph is that at sales volumes to the left of the break-even point a loss would be made, as total costs are higher than total revenue, and sales volumes to the right of the break-even point would generate a profit, as the total revenue is higher than total costs. The cost volume profit chart, or profit volume chart, plots exactly what it says, profits made at different sales volumes. So using the same data that we used for the break-even chart a moment ago, we can produce a profit volume chart. We know at our break-even point of 834 units we make neither a profit nor a loss. And we know that when we sell no units at all, we still incur $5,000 of fixed costs and will therefore make a loss of $5,000. So using just these two pieces of data we can plot the profit volume line as seen on the graph. We can see from the graph that at sales volumes lower than 834 units we would make a loss and at volumes above 834 units we would make a profit. If we have a budgeted sales volume we can also see the margin of safety on the graph. So if our budgeted sales are 2000 units the margin of safety falls between 834 units and 2000 units so it is 1166 units. The chart we have just plotted is only relevant in single product scenarios so we now need to look at the situation with regards to multiple products. The first thing we need to do is rank the products based on their CS ratio, and then much like we do in limiting factor analysis, we decide which product to make first, which to make second, and so on. We then calculate the total profit made at each output level, and chart this on the graph to find the break-even point. The easiest way to demonstrate this is with some numbers. A company makes and sells three products, Alpha, Beta and Gamma. We know that the revenue generated by Alphas is $12,000 and the variable costs of making them is $5,000. This gives a contribution of $7,000 and a CS ratio of 58.3%. If we perform the same calculations for Beta and Gamma, we can see that their CS ratios are 36% 
and 33.3% respectively. So we would rank alphas in first place, followed by betas, and then gammas. In order to plot the graph, we also need to know the fixed costs for the business. So let's assume that they are $9,500. This means that with a sales volume of zero units, we will make a loss of $9,500, and this gives us the starting point for our graph. We then need to know the cumulative profit we will make if we make the products in the order in which they have been ranked. So selling alphas generates $7,000 of contribution, giving us a net loss of $2,500. If we then sell betas, we generate a further $9,000 of contribution, and therefore we make an overall profit of $6,500. Making gammas generates another $7,000 of contribution, and now the profit becomes $13,500. We also need to know the cumulative revenue generated with each product. So selling alphas generates $12,000 of revenue. Adding on the revenue from betas gives us $37,000 in total. And adding on gammas gives us $58,000 in total. Plotting these points on the graph gives us a line that looks like the one shown here. Notice that the x-axis is now sales revenue rather than sales volumes. From the graph, we can determine the break-even revenue to be around $16,000. If we had calculated the break-even revenue using the weighted average contribution as covered earlier in the video, this would have been the fixed costs of $9,500 divided through by the weighted average CS ratio. The total contribution generated by all three products is $7,000 plus $9,000 plus $7,000 giving us $23,000, and therefore the weighted average CS ratio is $23,000 divided by the total revenue of $58,000. The break-even revenue under this method is therefore... This is different to the $16,000 calculated by the graphical approach, as this calculation ignores the ranking process and gives all products the same priority. The graphical approach is much more accurate and tells us that we can break even at a lower sales revenue if we prioritise production, as we will ensure that we maximise the contribution being made and therefore we cover the fixed costs more quickly. The final area that we need to cover on this video is the limitations of these various techniques, some of which I have already touched on throughout the video. All of the methods assume that fixed costs are constant at all output volumes and that there are no stepped fixed costs. The methods also assume that variable costs and selling prices do not change as output and sales volumes change. This implicitly means that we are assuming the efficiency and productivity are also constant at all output levels, and that there is no learning curve effect or price-demand relationships. We are also assuming that whatever we produce we sell so that there are no changes in our inventory levels. And finally, there is an assumption that fixed and variable costs can be split, and that there are no semi-variable costs within the business. In this session, we are going to think about what happens when a business is short of a particular resource, and how we can ensure that that resource is used most effectively to produce the highest profits for the business. We call this topic limiting factor analysis, and this is a crucial topic area for short-term decision-making within any manufacturing business. You should note that some businesses may have other objectives rather than profit maximisation, but for the purposes of this video and this topic area, we are going to assume that profit is the main objective for any business. The main types of resources that could be scarce or limited are labour hours, machine hours or materials. It is possible that more than one of these is in short supply, but this cannot be dealt with using limiting factor analysis. Instead, you would need to use linear programming, which is covered on another video. This video will therefore focus on what happens when just one resource is scarce, either labour hours, machine hours, or a single material used within the production process. The first thing we need to do when considering a problem of this nature is determine which resource is scarce. It is possible that there are details provided to you that suggest more than one resource is limited, so you need to determine which resource is the one that is actually limited. The way that we do this is by looking at total demand for each product we make, 
and how much of each resource is needed to meet that maximum demand. This will identify which resource, if any, does not allow us to fulfil the demand, and it is this resource that is classed as the limiting factor. Let's consider this scenario. Percussion Limited has demand for 2,000 units of product Zing. Each unit of Zing takes 3 hours of machine time, 2 kilograms of material pop, and 8 hours of labour. Percussion has the following resources available. 8,000 machine hours, 4,500 kilograms of pop, and 15,000 hours of labour. To make the 2,000 units, Percussion will need to utilise 6,000 machine hours, that is 2,000 units multiplied by 3 hours per unit, 4,000 kilograms of pop, 2,000 units multiplied by 2 kilograms per unit, and 16,000 hours of labour, 2,000 units multiplied by 8 hours per unit. As Percussion Limited only has 15,000 labour hours available, this is our scarce resource and the factor that will limit our production. Given that there are only 15,000 labour hours available, this means that Percussion can only make 1,875 units, calculated as 15,000 hours divided by 8 hours per unit, rather than the full demand of 2,000 units. Once we know what the scarce resource is, we then need to plan our production volumes to ensure we optimise the use of the resource and thereby maximise profits. Remember, we are always going to assume that profit maximisation is the main objective of the business. The easiest way to cover this is to go through an example. Here we have Good Job Limited. They make three products, the good, the better and the best. Demand for each product is 2,500 units, 1,500 units and 1,000 units respectively. A single unit of good takes two labour hours, four machine hours and one kilogram of material X. A single unit of better takes three labour hours, three machine hours and one and a half kilograms of X and each best takes four labour hours, two and a half machine hours and 1.75 kilograms of X. Good Job Limited has the following resources available. 14,000 labour hours, 16,000 machine hours and 7,000 kilograms of X. So, as before, the first thing we need to do is calculate the scarce resource. Let's consider labour hours first of all. To make the 2,500 units of good, we will need 5,000 hours. To make 1,500 betters, we need 4,500 hours. And to make 1,000 bests, we need 4,000 hours. This totals 13,500 hours, so is within our capacity of 14,000 labour hours. With regards to machine hours, we will need 10,000 hours to make 2,500 units of good, 4,500 hours to make 1,500 units of better, and 2,500 hours to make 1,000 units of best. This totals 17,000 hours, which is more than the 16,000 hours available, and is therefore a limiting factor or scarce resource. For completeness, we should also look at material X to ensure that this isn't also a scarce resource. We will need 2,500 kilograms of X to make 2,500 goods, 2,250 kilograms to make 1,500 betters, and 1,750 kilograms to make 1,000 bests. So in total we need 6,500 kilograms, which can be covered by the 7,000 kilograms we have available. We now know that the only scarce resource is machine hours, so we now need to plan our production based on this restriction. In order to determine how many of each product we should make, we need to know how much money we can make from each product. Our focus is to ensure that we look at how much money we can make per machine hour, as this is the resource we are trying to make the best use of. The way we find this is to calculate the contribution per unit of scarce resource machine hours in this case. But before we can do that we need to know the contribution per unit. To find this we need to know the selling price per unit and the variable costs per unit. In the case of Good Job Limited's product range the following data applies. The selling price for a unit of good is $27 and the variable costs are $5 for materials, $16 for labour 
and $4 for variable overheads. This gives a contribution of $2 per unit. A better sells for $41 and variable costs total $37.50, giving a contribution of $3.50 per unit. And a best sells for $51.50 with variable costs of $48.25, giving a contribution of $3.25 per unit. At first glance you might conclude that the best product to make is the better as it generates the highest contribution per unit but we need to bear in mind how many machine hours it takes to make each unit so that we maximize the total contribution we can generate from all of the products we can make with the limited 16,000 machine hours. Now that we know the contribution per unit we need to take this one step further and calculate the contribution per machine hour so we need to remind ourselves of how many machine hours each product takes. A good takes four machine hours to make so the contribution per hour is 50 cents. A better takes three machine hours giving a contribution per hour of $1.17 and a best takes two and a half machine hours giving a contribution per hour of $1.30. Based on these figures we can now see that the product that makes the best use of the available machine hours is the best so we will want to make as many of these as we can before moving on to making betters which generate the next best contribution per machine hour and then finally we can use up any remaining hours making goods which generate the lowest contribution per machine hour. Having worked out which order we should make our products we now need to calculate how many of each we can make with the available machine hours. Starting with bests, we should make the full demand for these if we are able to with the available machine hours. If each best takes two and a half machine hours to make and total demand is for 1,000 units, this means we would utilize two and a half thousand hours to make the 1,000 units, leaving 13 and a half thousand hours available to make betters and goods. The total demand for betters is 1,500 units and they each take three machine hours so a further 4,500 hours will be utilised to make these, leaving 9,000 hours that can be used to make goods. As each good takes 4 hours to make, we can make 2,250 units with this remaining 9,000 hours. The demand for goods was 2,500 units, so we can see that we cannot make 250 units given the restricted machine hours. The final step we can take is to work out the total contribution we will generate by following this production plan. We can use the contribution per unit that we have already calculated and multiply this by the number of units from our production plan. Each best generates a contribution of $3.25 per unit and we plan to make 1,000 units. Betters generate $3.50 contribution per unit and we plan to make 1500 units, so the total contribution for betters will be $5,250. And goods generate $2 contribution per unit, and we plan to make 2,250 units. The total contribution for all three products being made is therefore $30,000. In this session we will look at what happens when there is more than one limiting factor and how we can make the best use of the limited resources that we have to ensure we continue to maximize profits. The process we are going to use to do this is called linear programming. As with limiting factor analysis we are always going to assume that the main objective of any business is to maximize profit for the purposes of our calculations. For more information on limiting factor analysis please see the separate video covering this area. There are a number of steps we need to go through to calculate the maximum profit or contribution that can be generated when there is more than one limiting factor. The first step is to define the variables. We then need to understand our constraints and turn this information into formulae. We will also turn our objective of maximizing contribution into a formula. Once we have our various formulae we can then produce a graph and from this identify a feasible region which is the area of the graph within which we meet all of the various constraints. Within this feasible region will be the optimal production plan, which is what we are aiming for. Once we know our optimal production plan, we can then calculate the maximum contribution we can generate 
in much the same way as we do when performing limiting factor analysis. We will use the remainder of this video to demonstrate this process with an example. Alphabet Limited makes two products, the franc and the greta. Each franc generates contribution of $5 and takes 10 labour hours to make and 4 kilograms of material L. Each greta generates $7 of contribution, uses 5 labour hours and 6 kilograms of material L. Alphabet wants to maximise contribution, but there is a limited number of labour hours and also a limited amount of material L available, so they cannot meet maximum demand for both franc and greta. They have 1,000 labour hours per week and 800 kilograms of material L available. Alphabet Limited wants to be able to make more greeters than francs, as the demand for greeters is usually higher. So step one is to define our variables. Let us say that F is the number of units of product franc, and G is the number of units of product greeter. We will also use C to represent total contribution. Based on this data we can start to put together some formulae to stipulate the various constraints. So with regards to labour hours, we know that each franc takes 10 hours and each greeter takes 5 hours, and that we have a maximum of 1,000 hours available. This generates the formula 10F plus 5G needs to be less than or equal to 1,000 hours. Moving on to material L. A franc uses 4 kilograms of material L, and a greeter uses 6 kilograms of L and we have 8 kilograms of this material available for use. The formula to describe this is therefore 4F plus 6G needs to be less than or equal to 800 kilograms. We also need to ensure that we make at least one franc and one greeter as the company wants to make some of each. The formula that covers this is F comma G needs to be at least zero. With regards to demand, Alphabet want to make more greeters than francs, so we can define this formula as G being greater than F. And finally, we can state the objective function, which is to maximise contribution. This formula is based on the contribution that each unit of franc and greeter can generate, and therefore it becomes C equals 5F plus 7G. Now we need to draw a graph with number of units of franc and greeter on the two axes of the graph. To plot the graph we need to perform some workings using the formulae that we have just put together. Let's look at the formula for labour. This is 10F plus 5G is equal to or less than 1000 hours. We hope to use the full 1000 hours so we can turn this formula into 10F plus 5G equals 1000 hours. For the purposes of plotting the line on the graph, we are firstly going to assume that we make no francs, so this means that the formula becomes 5G equals 1000, and therefore G is 200 units. We can follow the same principle by assuming that we will not make any greeters. This time the formula becomes 10F equals 1000 hours, and therefore if we don't make any greeters, we can make 100 francs. We also follow the same idea with regards to material L. The formula that we produced was to state that 4F plus 6G needs to be less than or equal to 800 kilograms. Again, we are going to assume that we use the full 800 kilograms and turn the formula into 4F plus 6G equals 800 kilograms. If we assume we don't make any francs, the formula becomes 6G equals 800 kilograms and therefore G is 133 units of product greeter. Assuming we don't make any greeters, the formula becomes 4F equals 800 kilograms, and we would therefore make 200 units of franc. So now we have some parameters to put on the graph. We need to plot these points on the graph. For labour, we can mark a point on the G-axis at 200 units, and a point on the f-axis at 100 units, and then join the dots together to give the labour constraint line. We can do the same with material L, and mark a point on the g-axis at 133 units, and on the f-axis at 200 units, 
and join these together. This is the constraint line for material L. We can also plot the demand line on here as F equals G. We need to ensure that we make more greeters than francs, so anything below this line is within this constraint. Now that we have the constraint lines on the graph, we can determine the feasible region. As already mentioned, we need to be to the right of the demand line as we need to make more greeters than francs. We also need to be below the constraint lines for material L and for labour, as we cannot use more of the resource than we have. This gives us the feasible region, as highlighted in bold, of 0, A, B and D. Given the constraints we have, we can make any combination of volumes of francs and greeters within this region, but we want to maximise contribution, so we now need to add a further line to this graph, the contribution line. We need to work out the angle of this contribution line, and the easiest way to do this is to follow a similar process to the labour and material constraint lines. But this time we don't have a contribution figure, so the first thing we need to do is work one out. We are going to use the contribution formula of C equals 5F plus 7G, together with information gained from our graph. If we look at point D of the feasible region, F is 0, and G is 133. Using these unit volumes in the contribution formula gives us C equals $5 multiplied by 0 francs plus $7 multiplied by 133 greeters, totaling $931 of contribution. We can then use the contribution formula, this time assuming that G is 0, to find how many francs would also generate $931 of contribution. So $931 equals 5F plus 7G, but as G is 0, this becomes $931 equals 5F, and therefore F must be 186 units. We can now plot a line on the graph where the point on the F axis is 186 units, and the point on the g-axis is 133 units. This is the contribution line. Once we have plotted this line, we need to effectively slide the line up across the graph until we reach the furthest point within the feasible region. By moving the line up and to the right, we will ensure that we maximise the contribution generated, as we are making the maximum number of products. In this case, the last point we hit within the feasible region is product B, so generating the quantities at this point will maximise contribution. We call this the optimum point of production. We now need to look at point B and determine how many units of franc and greta are recorded at this point. By tracking back to the F and G axes, we can see that this leads to an optimal production plan of 50 francs and 90 greters. Now that we know the optimal production quantities, we can work out the maximum contribution that can be generated using the contribution formula. The maximum contribution that can be generated given the constraints within the scenario is $880, calculated as $5 multiplied by 50 units of franc and $7 multiplied by 90 units of greta. In this session, we are going to think about how much extra a company would be willing to pay for for one additional unit of scarce resources. The topic that we'll be covering in this video is all about shadow prices. This is an extension of limiting factor analysis as discussed in the previous two videos. A shadow price is the additional contribution generated from one additional unit of limiting factor. Or, in other words, we can say that it is the opportunity cost of not having the use of one extra unit. A shadow price is the maximum extra amount that a company would be willing to pay for one additional unit of scarce resource. A shadow price is not the maximum price which should be paid, but rather it is the maximum extra that a company would be willing to pay over and above the current purchase price for a limited resource. Let's say, for example, that a company has reached its maximum capacity for its permanent labour force. 
they may consider hiring in temporary workers or paying the current workforce over time. Management will want to know what the maximum amount that they should be paying for the temporary staff should be or the amount of overtime they can actually afford to pay. If a company is not utilizing the maximum availability of one of their resources, we call this slack. This may occur when we have a limited amount of material and an overcapacity of labor hours, or vice versa. The workers will run out of material to work with eventually and will sit idle until additional material is purchased. Or on the other side, we'll have material that will be stockpiled as we do not have enough labor in order to convert this material into product. If the entire resource available is required for the optimal solution, then the company will be willing to pay a premium, a shadow price, to obtain the additional resource. If the company does not require all the available resources for the optimal solution, then they will not be willing to pay a premium and there would be no shadow price. This is when slack occurs. Let's consider the following scenario. A company makes two products, X and Y. Sales demand of X is 10,000 units and sales demand of Y is 12,000 units. Direct labor and production are restricted to 60,000 direct labor hours and direct labor is paid at $10 per hour. It takes five hours to produce one unit of X and it takes four hours to produce one unit of Y. The contribution per unit of X is $8 and the contribution per unit of Y is $6. Based on the above information, the optimal production plan has been calculated to be 10,000 units of X and 2,500 units of Y. What is the shadow price per direct labor hour and for how many additional hours of labor does this apply? Usually, in this type of question, we would be required to calculate the optimal production plan. But in the scenario above, this information has already been given to us. Make sure that you are able to calculate this opt optimal production plan yourself. If you have trouble with this, please go back and relook at the video on limiting factors. Let's now consider what would happen if one additional labor hour was available to purchase. In other words, what would we pay as an overtime rate? Because we have met the demand of X in the optimal production plan, the company would use any additional labor hours to manufacture product Y. There is no need to produce any additional product X. The contribution that would be earned per additional unit of product Y is $6. Therefore, the additional contribution per direct labor hour would be $6 divided by 4 hours, which would equal $1.50. This is the shadow price, the maximum extra that the company would be prepared to pay for an additional hour of labor. Therefore, the maximum price the company would be willing to pay for each additional hour would therefore be $10, which is what they pay for a normal direct labor hour, plus the shadow price of $1.50, which equals $11.50. Once the company has met the demand of Y, the labor would no longer be a limiting factor. Therefore, once they have made an additional 9,500 units of Y, the shadow price will no longer be applicable. Therefore, the shadow price would be applicable for the next 38,000 hours. 9,000 units of Y multiplied by 4 hours. Now that we have looked at calculating the shadow price for a single limiting factor, what happens when we have multiple limiting factors? Let's consider the following scenario. In a linear programming problem, to determine the contribution maximizing production and sales volume for two products, X and Y, the following information is available. It takes two direct labor hours to make product X and four hours to make product Y there are a total of 10,000 direct labor hours available. Product X uses 4 kilograms of material and Product Y uses 2 kilograms of material. There's a total of 14,000 kilograms available. The contribution per unit 
is $12 and $18 for product X and product Y respectively. The total contribution at this optimal production plan is $54,000. The optimal production of X and Y has been calculated as 3,000 units of X and 1,000 units of Y. This would be calculated using linear programming since there are two limited resources, labor and material. It's important that you are able to calculate this um, optimal level of production. If you're struggling with it, please do look back at the video on linear programming. Using this information, we need to calculate the shadow price of one additional hour, i.e. what is the contribution that the company will make if they receive one additional unit of labor. Therefore, we need to calculate the contribution using simultaneous equations as if one extra additional labor hour were available as follows. Equation 1 for labor hours would be 2x plus 4y equal to 10,001, 10,000 plus the additional hour. Equation 2 for materials would be 4x plus 2y equal to 14,000. Please note that we are only changing one limit of factoring a factor at a time. In this case, we're calculating the cost of an additional hour of labor rather than material. In order to solve this simultaneous equation, multiply equation 1 by 2. Create a third equation, 4x multiplied by 8y equal to 20,002. Subtract equation 2 from equation 3 to get 6y equal to 6,002. And therefore, you'll get y equal to 1,000.33. Substitute this into either equation 1 or 2 to get x equal to 2,999 spot 33. You can now calculate the total contribution of this production mix. 2,999 spot 83 units of x at a contribution per unit of $12 plus 1,033 units of x of y at a contribution of 18 per unit gives us a total of $54,004. Compare this to the original contribution of $54,000. The additional contribution and therefore shadow price is therefore $4. This is the extra amount that the company will be willing to pay for one additional hour of labor. In this session, we are going to consider the different ways in which a business can price its products or services. There are three main approaches to pricing. Demand-based pricing, cost-based pricing and market-based pricing. And we will deal with each in turn throughout this video. We will also consider other influences and factors that need to be considered when making pricing decisions. Before we look at the different methods of determining a price for a product or service, let us think about why it is important to get the price right. In order for any business to make a profit, it needs to sell its products or services for more than it costs to make them. So you might say, well why not just set the price really high and then you can be sure that you have covered all of your costs. The problem with that, of course, is that customers may not want to pay the high price you are charging, and therefore the number of products you sell will be low, and your fixed costs may not be covered. So there is a balance to be had between the selling price and the volume sold, and therefore the subsequent profit being made. And as already touched on, there are a number of factors at play here that need to be considered when setting a suitable price for a given product or service. In order to be able to think about the best price for a product, we also need to think about what might influence the price, and there are a number of factors that need to be considered. Price sensitivity. Some products are more price sensitive than others, and some customers will be more price sensitive too. If a product is price sensitive, it means that the volume of products sold will vary dramatically as the price increases or decreases. Price perception. This refers to the way in which customers react to price changes. For example, some people perceive that a high price means that they are buying something a bit more exclusive or luxurious, than a lower priced similar item, 
and they are therefore prepared to pay the higher price for the kudos associated with the product. Quality. This is linked with price perception. Some customers equate higher prices with better quality and again will be prepared to pay a higher price in order to buy what they consider to be a higher quality product. Competitors. Clearly any business needs to consider what their competitors are charging and decide whether they want to compete on price or compete based on other factors such as brand loyalty, quality and so on. In some industries like the petrol industry you can see that prices change almost en masse. As one company changes price, they all follow suit. Inflation. This will have an impact on the costs we are incurring and therefore a business will need to decide if they want to pass the increased costs on to the customer by inflating their selling prices, or whether they would prefer to keep prices as they stand and take a hit to their profit. Newness. New products, particularly in the technical sector, can often command a higher price as customers are generally happy to pay a premium for being one of the first to adopt the new product. Incomes. Here we are talking about the income of the customer. In the case of the general public, as disposable income increases, people are happy to pay more for goods and services. We therefore often see prices rising when an economy is strong and falling when an economy is weak. Product range. If a product sells interrelated products, they will need to think about the pricing strategy across the range of products rather than item by item. Ethics. A business needs to think about whether they wish to take advantage of shortages in a product or service and increase their price given that demand will be high. This might of course have a negative impact on their reputation so they need to weigh up the pros and cons of such a move before initiating any price change. Now that we have considered the various factors that might influence our pricing strategies, let's look at the different approaches we can take to pricing. The first approach we are going to consider is demand-braced pricing. As the name suggests, the prices we set under this approach are based on the demand we expect, or have historically seen, for the product or service in question. It is assumed that there is a linear relationship between price and volume. As prices rise, sales volumes drop, and as prices drop, sales volumes rise. How the volume is affected depends on the price elasticity of the product or service. A product that is more price elastic will show a big change in sales volumes as prices change. Think of luxury holidays and designer clothes whereas a product that is price inelastic will show a small change in sales volumes as prices change. These are usually basic or necessary products and services like milk, bread and petrol. We can calculate the price elasticity of a product or services using the formula PED, which stands for price elasticity of demand, equals the percentage change in demand divided by the percentage change in selling price. A PED of greater than 1 means that a product is price elastic and a PED of less than 1 means the product is price inelastic. If the PED is exactly 1, this means that the change in demand is equal and opposite to the change in selling price and the overall revenue generated through sales is the same. We can look at a quick example to demonstrate this calculation. The price of a loaf of bread increases from $1 to $1.20 and the supermarket goes from selling 1,000 loaves per day to 900 loaves per day. We want to know what the price elasticity of demand is for the loaf. To calculate the price elasticity we first of all need to calculate the two components within the calculation. So the percentage change in demand can be calculated as 100 loaves divided by 1,000 loaves the 100 loaves being the drop in sales from 1,000 loaves to 900. This gives us a 10% change in demand. And the percentage change in selling price is calculated as 20 cents, that is $1.20 minus $1, divided by the original price of $1, giving us 20%. The PED is therefore 10% divided by 20%, so 0.5. 
This is less than 1, showing that the price is inelastic, as would be expected for a basic item like a loaf of bread. The price elasticity of a particular product may well change over time as demand for the product changes and there are a number of factors that could affect the demand and therefore the price elasticity. The price of other products that could be used as substitutes for the product in question. If substitute prices are lower than the price of the product we are trying to sell, then in all likelihood demand for our product will drop. As already discussed, customer income will have a direct impact on the demand for certain product types. Tastes and fashions change and therefore demand for products will also change as fashions move on. As technological changes are seen, some products will become obsolete and as a result there will be a drop in demand for an item that may have seen steady demand in the past. In order to estimate demand for a product, we can use another formula called the demand equation which states that P equals A minus B multiplied by Q, where P is the price of a product, A is the price where demand is zero, B is the demand line calculated as change in price divided by change in quantity, and Q is the quantity sold. BQ will always be deducted from A because the idea is that the quantity sold will increase as prices drop and vice versa. If we look at this in graphical form, we can see the demand line showing an increase in quantity sold as the price drops. Using the demand line formula together with some more information, we can take this one step further to find the optimal price for a product. The first thing we need to do is calculate the demand line as seen on the previous slide. We then need to find the number of units we need to sell to maximise profit, and this is the point at which the marginal revenue that is the extra revenue generated by selling one extra unit, equals the marginal cost, the extra cost incurred in making one more unit. We can find the marginal revenue, MR, by adapting the demand equation. It now becomes MR equals A minus 2BQ. Once we know what MR is, we will also know what marginal cost is, or MC, as they equal each other at the optimum point. As we already know A and B from the demand line calculation, and we now know what MR is, we can then find the quantity to sell at the optimum point, and then substitute this back into the demand equation to find P, the optimum price. Let's put some numbers to this to make it a bit clearer. A company charges $12 for a product, and they sell 16,000 units at this price. If they change the price by $1 per unit, the sales volume changes by 2,500 units. The product has a variable cost of $5 per unit. From this information, we want to calculate the optimum selling price for the product. So step one is to use the demand equation to find any figures we don't yet have. To find B, we take the change in price and divide it by the change in quantity. So this is $1 divided by 2,500 units in this case, giving us 0.0004. We also need to find A, and we can do this by inserting all the known figures into the demand equation and then finding A as the missing figure. We know that when P is $12, Q is 16,000 units, and we have also calculated B to be 0.0004. So rearranging the formula, we can find A to be $18.40. The next step is to make MR equal MC. The marginal cost of making one extra unit will just be the variable cost of making that unit. And we know from the data that this is $5. So if the marginal cost is $5, the marginal revenue will also be $5 at the optimum point. Knowing that MR is $5, we can now use the A and B figures previously calculated to find a figure for Q at the optimal point. Here we now use the formula MR equals A minus 2BQ. Therefore, $5 equals $18.40 minus 2 times 0 0.0004 times Q. Rearranging the formula takes us to 0.0008 times Q equals $13.40, and therefore Q equals 16,750 units at the optimum point. 
The final step is to put this quantity back into the demand equation to find P. So this time P equals $18.40 minus 0 0.0004 multiplied by 16,750 units. And therefore P, the optimal selling price, is $11.70. We can also find the optimal price using a tabular method. Again, the objective is to find the output level and selling price that maximise profit. The easiest way to understand the tabular approach is to demonstrate it with an example. In the left-hand column of the table, we are going to show different output levels. In this case, 10, 20, 30, 40 and 50 units of output. We are then going to record the total cost of making that number of units. So in this case it costs $10 to make 10 units, $25 to make 20 units, $45 to make 30 units, $70 to make 40 units and $100 to make 50 units. We can then work out the marginal or extra cost of making 10 more units at each output level. So to make 10 units from 0 units costs an extra $10. It costs an extra $15 to go from making 10 units to 20 units, an extra $20 to go from making 20 units to 30 units, an extra $25 to go from making 30 units to 40 units, and an extra $30 to go from making 40 units to 50. If we then look at the selling price at each output level, we can work out the total revenue we can generate at these output levels. $50 if we sell 10 units, $90 if we sell 20 units, $120 if we sell 30 units, $140 if we sell 40 units, and $150 if we sell 50 units. In the same way that we calculated the marginal cost, we can then calculate the marginal revenue at each output level. This will be an extra $50 when we sell 10 units an extra $40 if we then sell 20 units, an extra $30 if we sell 30 units, an extra $20 if we sell 40 units, and an extra $10 if we sell 50 units. We can also find the profit we can generate at each output level by deducting the total cost from column 2 from the total revenue in column 5. At the output level of 10 units we generate $40 of profit at 20 units $65, at 30 units $75, at 40 units $70 and at 50 units $50. So we can immediately see that the optimum output level is 30 units as this generates the maximum profit. You will also notice that up to 30 units the marginal cost is lower than the marginal revenue, hence the rising profits whereas after 30 units the marginal cost is higher than the marginal revenue and therefore the profits start to decline. There is of course one major flaw with this approach and that is that we can only work with discrete amounts and cannot find a precise output volume to maximise profits. Now that we have looked at demand based pricing we are going to move on and consider cost based pricing. Basing our selling prices only on our costs means that all external factors that we have covered for demand-based pricing are completely ignored, and the price is purely set by taking the cost of making the product and adding on a markup or margin to arrive at a selling price. There are three cost bases we can use to calculate a selling price. The total or full cost, that is all fixed and variable costs, production and non-production costs. The total production cost. This time this will be direct labour, direct materials and production overheads, both fixed and variable. Or the variable cost, being direct materials, direct labour and variable overheads. In order to ensure that we are still making a profit we then add on an extra sum of money to cover fixed costs. If we are using the variable cost basis. To cover non-production costs, if we are using the production cost basis, and in all cases to generate a profit. We call this cost plus pricing, the plus being the element that we are adding on. Like with demand-based pricing, we can model costs and revenues using equations. By knowing how costs and revenues relate to each other, we can then determine an optimal output 
and an optimal selling price, just as we did with demand-based pricing. The equation we are going to use this time is y equals a plus b times x, where y is the total cost of making x units, a is the fixed cost, b is the variable cost per unit, and x is the number of units being made. This equation does assume that fixed costs won't change as output levels increase, and that the variable cost per unit is the same regardless of changes in production volumes. In reality, the learning curve effect might result in the variable cost per unit reducing as output volumes increase, and at given output levels the fixed costs might step up to a higher figure, but this equation ignores these factors. For more information on the learning curve effect, please see the video covering this topic area. The variable cost per unit may also decrease if bulk buy discounts or volume discounts are being offered by suppliers. If this is the case, then the total cost, y, will need to be calculated at different volume levels to ensure that selling prices cover the appropriate costs. Once we have established the cost basis we are going to use, we then need to calculate the selling price by adding on a markup or margin percentage. Remember that markup is a gross profit percentage based on cost, whereas margin is a gross profit percentage based on selling price. There are many advantages to cost plus pricing. It is easy to calculate and understand. It ensures that all costs are covered and a profit is made. Junior management can make pricing decisions based on figures and percentages provided to them. On the other hand, there are disadvantages, the main one being that there is no consideration of all of the external factors that we discussed for demand-based pricing. Other disadvantages are in order to find the full cost we need to absorb the fixed overheads into the cost per unit and therefore a basis for absorbing those costs needs to be established. Budgeted output volumes will also need to be established to perform the task of overhead absorption. And the pricing strategy doesn't guarantee a profit. If sales are lower than forecast, fixed costs may not be covered. We are now going to move on and consider different marketing-based pricing strategies. The first of these is market skimming pricing. This basically means that when a new product or service is launched, higher prices are charged to maximise profits in the short term. In later stages of the product's life cycle, the price will drop as more companies start selling the same or similar products and as customer demand starts to drop. The overall aim is therefore to generate as much profit as possible in the early stages of the product's life cycle to compensate for the lower profits that will be generated later in the cycle. This type of pricing is particularly suited to high-tech products like mobile phones and computers. The new technology encourages customers to purchase when the product is launched and therefore a higher price can be charged while still maintaining a strong level of demand. Given the short life cycle of these types of products, it is also good to get as much cash as possible back into the business up front to cover the costs incurred in developing and launching the product. It is also a good strategy to follow if demand for a product is unknown. Prices can always be reduced if demand isn't as strong as was hoped, but it is much harder to increase prices if demand is very high at low prices. In order to keep prices high, there needs to be some barriers to entry for competitors, such as a patent on the product preventing anyone from copying the design, high levels of upfront investment, or unusually strong brand loyalty, as is currently seen with Apple. Rather than skimming the market with the pricing strategy just covered, we can also aim to penetrate the market by setting prices low to encourage high sales volumes. This is called penetration pricing. Typically, prices are set so that products are sold at a loss or minimal profit to encourage consumers to buy the product in large volumes. The idea being that customers have become accustomed to buying that product and will then continue to buy the product even when the price is increased to a more profitable level. You can often see this in action in the supermarket when new foods are offered at knockdown prices on the ends of aisles to tempt us to try the new product. We also need to consider other products or services that complement the one that we are establishing a selling price for, to ensure that the price of all complementary products work together. We call this complementary product pricing. 
So, for example, you might want to set the selling price for a particular printer fairly low, but the selling price for the cartridges that go with that printer fairly high. Once the customer has bought the printer, they will need to continue to replenish the cartridges for the printer and therefore will be committed to buying the higher priced cartridges. A product line pricing strategy is needed where there are a number of similar products in the same range and therefore prices need to be similar, if not the same, across the product range. The means by which the price is set could be demand-based or cost-based with the same issues and factors needing assessment as covered earlier in the video. The prices that competitors charge may also be an influencing factor here. As already discussed from a purchasing perspective, volume discounts can be offered for bulk buying, whereby products are bought at a lower price when bought in higher volumes. The selling company need to think about how they would like their discounts to operate, or indeed if they are even going to offer them. Clearly, the main benefit of offering lower prices for higher purchase volumes is that the sales revenue will increase and cash flow should improve. New customers may well be keen to take up the offer too, so not only will you potentially generate higher sales volumes through your existing customer base, but you may also attract new customers that may continue to buy from you going forward. Volume discounts are also good if you are trying to sell off large volumes of surplus stock or if a product line is coming to an end. The downside though is that profits will decrease as each unit is being sold at a lower price with the same costs still being incurred in making or buying the stock for sale. It could be argued though that the reduced processing costs of processing fewer larger orders compensate for this loss in revenue and profit. A price discrimination strategy occurs when different prices are charged for the same product to different groups of buyers. This can only really happen if customers are split into different market segments and customers can't buy at the low price and then sell on at a high price in a different market. A good example of this is train travel, where the same basic product, a journey from A to B, can be charged at varying prices, such as first class, peak and off peak, for example. Finally, selling prices can be based on relevant costs, so we call this relevant cost pricing. This is often used when pricing up a one-off contract and when there is spare capacity within the business. The spare capacity indicates that fixed costs have already been covered by other products or contracts, and therefore only the incremental costs of this contract need to be considered when pricing it for the customer. The relevant cost of the contract is determined and then a selling price is calculated based on this. The minimum price that should be charged is the total of the relevant costs, but more often than not a markup is added on to ensure some profit is generated by the contract. For more information on relevant costing, please see the video covering this topic. In this session we are going to explain the issues surrounding make versus buy and outsourcing decisions, as well as calculating the costs associated with each option to enable us to decide on the best option from a financial perspective. We are also going to apply relevant costing principles in situations involving shutdowns, one-off contracts and the further processing of joint products. I am going to assume that you have a sound understanding of relevant costing on which we are going to build these topic areas. So if you need to brush up on this area, please watch the video on relevant costing before going any further with this video. Before we have a look at any techniques for dealing with these sorts of decisions, let's first of all consider the issues surrounding short-term decision making. The first thing we need to consider is the resources available to us and whether there is any restriction on any of those resources. Where there are restrictions, we can of course use limiting factor analysis or linear programming to help us ensure that we make the best use of our scarce resources, to maximise contribution and therefore profit. Further information on these two techniques can be found on the videos covering these topic areas. These techniques would be used when considering which products to make in-house and in what priority order. We also need to think about whether there are other options available to us when resources are scarce. Should we make the products in-house or should we pay to have them made? Within this decision, we not only need to consider the cost of buying the product in, but we also need to think about the quality of the product being made for us. If the product 
product quality isn't as good as the item being made in-house? Should the decision be made to outsource and risk a loss in reputation? Or should production be kept in-house to maintain reputation? Or is quality not a major factor for our customers? We should also think about continuity of supply and lead times if we are considering outsourcing production, as we need to ensure that we can meet customer demand. If we cannot meet demand, there is a risk that our customers will go elsewhere and we will not only lose that sale, but we may lose all future sales to that customer. It is also wise to consider whether you will be tied to a supplier for a fixed period of time. What is the minimum contract term or minimum purchase quantity? Does this affect our future plans? If the resource that is scarce now becomes available in the future, we may want to stop buying the product in and start making it in-house again, given that it is likely to cost more to buy than to make. And it is also good to check whether the supplier has the appropriate skill set to replicate the product that we are currently making in-house. Or indeed, does the supplier have specialist skills that we don't currently have in-house or don't wish to focus our time on? Maybe we want to outsource our HR function so that we can focus on increasing our sales volumes and sales revenue. We could hire a specialist HR company to provide that service for us, thereby giving us time to focus on increasing those sales. There may be other factors specific to the company in question that also need to be considered, such as confidentiality, ethical considerations or union involvement if work is outsourced. This list of factors is not exhaustive but gives you an idea of the sorts of considerations that need to be taken into account, as well as the cost and financial implications, when considering whether to outsource a part of our business. The rest of this video focuses purely on the financial impact of our decisions, but these other factors should be borne in mind before a final decision is made. Before we move on, we need to remember a few key features of relevant costing. So as a reminder, fixed costs are ignored unless they change as a result of the decision. We only consider future cash flows. And we only consider changes in those cash flows as a result of the decision we are making. So we are only interested in future incremental cash flows. Where there is spare capacity, it will usually make financial sense to make products in-house as the variable cost of making will usually be lower than the cost of buying in a ready-made product. If, however, the cost of buying in does happen to be lower than the variable costs of manufacture, we would of course opt to buy in as this will increase our contribution per unit and therefore our overall profit. Where there is no spare capacity and we are not meeting demand, we then need to consider which products we should make in-house and which we should buy in. To cover the technique we need to use, we are going to run through a numerical example. Funky Shirts Limited make four products, the retro, the vintage, the modern and the futuristic shirt. The material cost per unit is $5 for a retro, $6 for a vintage, $7 for a modern and $8 for a futuristic. Labour costs are $2, $4, $3 and $1 respectively, and variable overheads are $1, $2, $2 and $1. We can calculate the total variable costs to be $8 for a retro, $12 for a vintage, $12 for a modern and $10 for a futuristic. We also have the option to buy in each of these products at a cost of $9 for a retro, $11 for a vintage, $14 for a modern and $12 for a futuristic. We can immediately see that it is cheaper to buy in the vintage shirts than to make them in-house. So clearly it would make sense from a financial perspective to buy vintage shirts in rather than making them in-house. We also need to look at the fixed costs we might save by buying in products rather than making them. So if we assume that we would save $1500 of fixed costs by buying in retro shirts, we would save $1000 by buying in vintage shirts, we would save $2,000 by buying in modern shirts and we would save $500 by buying in futuristic shirts. We can now work out the total saving or extra cost of buying in rather than making. We can now see that not only is it wise to buy in vintage shirts but we should also consider buying in retro shirts 
as we can make a saving of $500 based on a demand of 1,000 units. On the other hand, it costs an extra $4,000 to buy in modern shirts compared to making them and an extra $1,500 in the case of futuristic shirts. As already mentioned, this decision is purely based on cost savings and does not take into consideration the other important factors already discussed. It should also be borne in mind that by buying in the retro and vintage shirts, this may result in there being idle labour or machine hours, which will still need to be paid for, and that this may not have been taken into account in the cost calculations we have just performed. An idle workforce can also result in an unmotivated workforce, and therefore efficiency might be affected and the labour cost per unit could start to rise for those products that are being made in-house. The next area we are going to look at is the decision regarding shutting down part of a business's operations. We are going to use relevant costing again here to determine whether the closure of a loss-making part of our business has a positive financial impact on the business as a whole, or if it makes more sense from the perspective of the whole business to keep the product line or department running. What this means is that we need to look at the cost savings associated with the closure, but we also need to look at the lost revenue resulting from that closure. The basic principle, therefore, is that we need to calculate the lost contribution, remember that is sales minus variable costs, resulting from the closure, and compare this to the fixed costs we would save through the closure. If the contribution lost is higher than the fixed costs saved, then it makes more financial sense to keep the operation running. Whereas if the fixed cost saving is higher than the lost contribution, it makes more financial sense to close the operation. Within the costing analysis, we should also ensure we cover any costs of redundancies, any potential legal action resulting from the closure, any retraining of existing employees, and compensation to customers awaiting products that they will now not receive. Again, this only takes into account the financial implications of a closure and not any other issues such as staff morale, customer and competitor reactions, the company's reputation or the impact on our supply chain, and so on. Relevant costing principles can also be used for pricing up one-off contracts. The incremental future cash flows associated with the contract such as increased labour costs, increased fixed costs, increased overheads and so on need to be combined to find the total relevant cost of the contract. The minimum price will then be the total of these future incremental cash flows. If the contract price is lower than the relevant costs, then the contract should be declined from a financial perspective. There may, however, be other factors that mean a company would take on the contract despite the potential loss. This might be the case where a long-standing customer needs a one-off contract fulfilling, Whilst the revenue from this contract might not cover the associated costs, it is highly likely that there will be more contracts coming our way in the future from this customer, so you would be more than happy to take the hit now to ensure these future profitable contracts. The final area we are going to cover on this video is the decision about whether to take a joint product or products and process them further rather than selling them at the split-off point. A joint product happens when two or more products are made from the same processing operation and they are roughly equal in terms of selling price. A typical example would be processing milk to make yoghurt and cream. For comparison purposes, a by-product occurs when turning milk into cheese. The main product is the curd for the cheese and the by-product is the whey. We are only considering joint products here and we are only considering those that could go through a further production process or processes to give rise to another product. As we are using relevant costing here, we are not interested in the cost of the joint product at the time of split-off, as these costs are effectively sunk costs. We want to decide whether to take the joint product and do more with it. At the split-off point, the joint product already exists and therefore the costs in making it have already been incurred and are therefore sunk. We need to compare the extra costs of processing with the increase in the selling price as a result of the further processing to determine if we are going to make more contribution by continuing with processing or by selling the product at the split-off point. So we need to find the incremental revenue that would be generated by the higher selling price of the product going through more production processes. 
and compare this to the incremental costs of those production processes. Where the incremental revenue is higher, we should go ahead with the further processing. But if the incremental costs are higher than the incremental revenue, then we should sell the products off at the split-off point without further processing. Do remember that we are only considering cash flows here, so any incremental costs, savings or revenues that are not cash flows should be ignored. We are now moving on to the next phase in the management accounting syllabus, dealing with risk and uncertainty. We tend to use the terms risk and uncertainty interchangeably. In fact, they aren't quite the same thing. Risk is calculable. It deals with known possible outcomes and known or estimated probabilities. For example, there is a risk associated with tossing a coin. We don't know whether we're going to get a heads or a tails, but we know from experience it's going to be one of those two with a 0.5 or 50% probability of each. We can therefore build this risk into decision making. However, with uncertainty, we may not know the probabilities of the possible outcomes. We may not have the experience with which to estimate them. We may not even know all the possible outcomes themselves. It is this element of certain aspects being unknown that distinguishes risk from uncertainty. Often, one person's uncertainty is another person's risk, depending on the level of experience they each have of the situation. Let's consider Jack, the owner of a sandwich shop. He's owned and run his sandwich shop for many years, so he has experience as to what demand may be for his sandwiches from his off-the-street customers. Per day, demand could be 100 sandwiches with a probability of 0.2, 200 sandwiches with a probability of 0.5, or 300 sandwiches with a probability of 0.3. This is the risky variable Jack has to build into his plans. Jack sells sandwiches for $5 each, and they have a variable cost of $2 associated with them. The owner of a local conference centre calls in to see Jack and offers him a contract to supply sandwiches every day. Jack is interested as he thinks that he has a total capacity to make up to 350 sandwiches a day in his shop and would welcome the chance to use up any spare capacity with a regular contract. To help the conference centre plan, Jack must sign a contract for the definite supply of a certain number of sandwiches for delivery each day. The options presented to him by the conference centre manager are to agree to a definite supply of 100, 150 or 200 sandwiches each day. The conference centre is only willing, however, to pay $3 a sandwich in view of their definite custom. Jack now faces a dilemma. His off-the-street customers earn him more profit. So if he agrees to supply, say, 200 sandwiches to the conference centre, he could easily be forced to turn more profitable business away. However, if he's only agreed to supply 100 sandwiches, and demand from off-the-street customers is low, he might waste some of his capacity. Jack is trying to make a decision, how many sandwiches to supply to the conference centre, in the face of a risky variable, being demand for sandwiches from off-the-street customers. Jack can build a payoff table to help him with this. It has the decision variable across the top, he has control over this, and the risky variable down the side. He doesn't have control over this. We then fill in the table. For example, if we're in this box, then John has agreed to sell 100 sandwiches to the conference centre and have 100 sales to off-the-street customers. A conference centre sandwich earns $3 less $2 is $1 per sandwich, whereas a sale to an off-the-street customer earns $5 less $2 is $3 per sandwich. This generates a contribution of 100 times $1 plus 100 times $3 is $400. Moving down to the next row, here we've agreed to sell 100 sandwiches to the conference centre and have 200 sales to off-the-street customers. 
This is still within Jack's capacity constraint of 350 sandwiches. This earns him a contribution of 100 times $1 plus 200 times $3 is $700. Moving down to the next row, here we've agreed to sell 100 sandwiches to the conference centre and we have demand for 300 sales to off the street customers. However, we have a capacity limit of 350 sandwiches per day, so we can only supply 250 to off the street customers. We must supply 100 to the conference centre as we've signed an agreement to do so. This therefore earns us a contribution of 100 times $1 plus 250 times $3 is $850. Following the same process for the other two columns, we populate the payoff table. We'll be coming back to this table again and again in this part of the syllabus. How Jack uses this table will depend on his attitude to risk. Let's start off by assuming he is risk neutral. This means he makes his choices based on the balance of probabilities. He'll choose the option which, on average, will earn him the highest return. In other words, he will make his choice based on expected values. We need to now bring in probabilities. If Jack signs up to supply 100 sandwiches with the conference centre, on average he can expect to earn 0.2 times 400 plus 0.5 times 700 plus 0.3 times 850 is $685. If Jack signs up to supply 150 sandwiches to the conference centre, on average he can expect to earn 0.2 times 450 plus 0.5 times 750 plus 0.3 times 750 is $690. If Jack signs up to supply 200 sandwiches to the conference centre, on average he can expect to earn 0.2 times 500 plus 0.5 times 650 plus 0.3 times 650 is $620. So, on average, Jack's contribution will be maximised if he signs up to supply 150 sandwiches to the conference centre. This conclusion needs careful thought though, because it assumes Jack is risk neutral, it assumes the trial is repeated, You'll note that $690 is not an actual outcome, but will be the average over repeated trials. It assumes Jack has accurately forecast the probabilities for this risky variable, being off the street demand. And it assumes that if we turn customers away without selling them a sandwich, they'll try again another day, and we haven't damaged goodwill. In other words, that the risky variable stays the same each time. In conclusion, when dealing with risk, we can undertake calculations based on the balance of probabilities if we are risk neutral. In our next video, we'll consider the need to build different attitudes to risk into our decisions. Welcome back. This is the second video considering the use of payoff tables and how they can help us to make decisions when faced with risk. In this video, we'll consider the impact risk attitudes have on our decisions, the value of additional information that's guaranteed to be correct, known as perfect information, and decision making with more than one risky variable. Let's remind ourselves about Jack, the sandwich shop owner. He was asked if he would like to sign a contract with a local conference centre for the regular daily supply of sandwiches which although they weren't as profitable as off-the-street sales, nevertheless helped use some spare capacity. We constructed a payoff table. The table shows the contribution that would arise depending on the decision Jack makes across the top and the risky variable down the left-hand side. We concluded that if Jack was risk neutral, he would make his decision using expected values on the balance of probabilities. We calculated this by multiplying the outcome by the probability of its occurrence, 
So for example, if Jack signs up to supply 100 sandwiches a day to the conference centre, the first column, he on average could expect a contribution of 0.2 times 400 plus 0.5 times 700 plus 0.3 times 850 is $685. We said that the expected contribution was maximised when Jack agreed to supply 150 sandwiches a day to the conference centre. This assumes he is risk neutral and is willing to base his decisions on the average outcome. Jack, however, may not be risk neutral. He could be risk averse or risk seeking. A risk averse decision maker is in essence a pessimist and assumes that poor outcomes will occur following their decision. They therefore make the decision that will make that poor outcome the best it can possibly be. This is known as the maximin approach, maximizing the minimum possible return. We can use the payoff table again to help us here. We can use this table in a different way to help us with a maximin decision. Look at the first column. If we sign up to supply 100 sandwiches to the conference centre, the worst possible outcome is when off the street demand is 100. If we repeat this exercise for the second and third columns, the bottom row is showing us the worst case scenario or worst possible outcome associated with each decision. The best of these occurs if Jack signs up for 200 sandwiches with the conference centre. So, if Jack is risk averse, he will choose to sign up to supply 200 sandwiches a day to the conference centre because if he does this and the worst happens, in other words off the street demand turns out to be low, his outcome will be the best it can be in those bad circumstances. If Jack is risk seeking, he is by nature more of an optimist. He assumes good outcomes will follow from his decisions and therefore will focus on the upside potential. He will choose the option that gives him the maximum possible return. He will ignore the downside possibility attached to the decision. If we look at the table, the biggest possible contribution occurs when we sign up to supply 100 sandwiches to the conference centre and off the street demand is 300. We would earn a contribution of $850 in this case. This decision criteria is known as MaxiMax. It maximises the maximum possible outcome. You'll note here Jack is being optimistic. If he selects this option, he is conveniently ignoring the fact that if off the street demand is low, he will only earn $400, the worst possible return. A slightly different approach to risk aversion is to focus on opportunity costs. A risk-averse individual may seek to choose the option that minimises the size of the error they made in hindsight. In other words, they don't want to be too disappointed when they look back that they could have made a better choice. This involves constructing a table of opportunity costs, which again uses the payoff table as a starting point. The opportunity cost table has the same structure and headings as the payoff table. The table is completed crossways, but read downwards. Consider the first row on the payoff table. If it turns out off the street demand was 100, then the best decision we could have made in hindsight would have been to accept an order of 200 from the conference centre. This would give the maximum possible return. The opportunity cost or regret would be zero. It was the best decision Jack could have made with hindsight. However, if it turns out off the street demand was 100 and Jack had agreed to supply 150 sandwiches to the conference centre, he would have secured a contribution of $450 rather than the $500 he would have gained if he'd agreed to supply 200 sandwiches. In other words, this is 500 less 450 or $50 lower than the optimum or $50 opportunity cost or regret from having chosen the wrong decision in hindsight. 
If it turns out off the street demand was 100 and Jack had accepted an order for 100 sandwiches, he would have secured a contribution of $400 rather than the 500 he would have gained if he'd agreed to supply 200. In other words, this is 500 less 400 is $100 lower than the optimum or $100 opportunity cost or regret from having chosen the wrong decision in hindsight. If we repeat this process for off the street demand of 200 and 300, in other words the other two rows in the table, we will have completed Jack's opportunity cost table. We use the table by reading down each column. For example, the first column. If Jack agrees to supply 100 sandwiches, his worst possible regret or opportunity cost is $100. In other words, at worst, he will be $100 off the best outcome he could have expected. So, Jack's maximum possible regret is minimized by choosing to supply either 100 or 150 sandwiches to the conference center, as each choice has a maximum regret or opportunity cost associated with it of $100. This approach is known as minimax regret and is a form of risk aversion. Imagine Jack is poised to make his decision, let's say based on expected values, the risk neutral choice. He's about to agree to supply the conference center with 150 sandwiches regularly with an expected value of $690. The phone rings. A disguised voice says, meet me in the car park in 10 minutes. Curious, Jack goes and meets a man in the shadows clutching an envelope. The man says, in this envelope is some perfect information. It will tell you exactly, with no doubt, what off the street demand will be. However, you'll have to pay me to obtain this information. Jack thinks he hasn't yet agreed to supply the conference center. So once he knows what's in the envelope, he can supply the optimum amount to maximize his contribution. However, Jack doesn't know at this moment exactly what is in the envelope. As far as he is concerned, there is a 0.2 chance that off the street demand will be 100, in which case he would then agree to supply 200 sandwiches to the conference center, earning him a contribution of $500. There is a 0.5 chance that off the street demand will be 200, in which case he would then agree to supply 150 sandwiches to the conference center, earning him a contribution of $750. There's a 0.3 chance that off the street demand will be 300, in which case he would then agree to supply 100 sandwiches to the conference center, earning him a contribution of $850. As Jack stands looking at the envelope, if he could obtain this information at no cost before committing to the conference center, the value of his decision would now be 0.2 times $500 plus 0.5 times $750 plus 0.3 times $850 is $730. This is the value of the decision with perfect information. The value with no such information was simply the expected value he had calculated before the mysterious phone call, which was $690. The value of the perfect information is therefore 730 less 690 is $40. Provided he can purchase the information for less than $40, he will be improving his overall outcome by doing so. Of course, in the real world, no information is perfect, but this helps us to understand how much worse off we are because of a lack of perfect information, which might in turn help us to understand how much information is worth that reduces, even if it doesn't completely eliminate uncertainty. More on this later when we look at decision trees. Sometimes we may face more than one risky variable. For example, suppose we're unsure as to what sales might be and fixed costs. We think sales might be with a probability of 0.5, 0.3 and 0.2 respectively. We also believe fixed costs could be $10,000, $11,000 or $12,000 with a probability of 0.3, 0.3 
and 0.4 respectively. Suppose we wanted to calculate as a risk neutral decision maker what expected profits are if contribution per unit is $4. Let's start by scheduling this out in a table. We're going to use this template three times. One table for profit, one table for probability, and a final table for profit multiplied by probability. Firstly, the one for profit. We populate the table with the profit that will result from every given level of sales demand and fixed cost. For example, in the top left hand corner, sales is 1000 units and fixed cost is $10,000. So profit is 10,000 units times $4 contribution minus $10,000 cost is $30,000. A similar approach for the other boxes gives us now the second table for probabilities. We start with the same template as before. Only this time we work out the joint probabilities. So for example in the top left hand corner the probability of sales being 10,000 units and fixed costs being $10,000 is 0 0.5 multiplied by 0.3 is 0.15. A similar approach for the other boxes gives us the following. You'll note that the total of the probabilities adds to 1. Finally, the profit multiplied by probability table. Again, we start with the same template as before. This time we overlay the first two tables. For example, the top left hand corner. Probability in this box is 0.15 and profit was $30,000. So probability multiplied by profit is 0.15 multiplied by $30,000 is $4,500. Then if we complete the other boxes we get the following. As before the expected value is the sum of probability times value. So if we add up all nine values in this table, we could also say that profit will range from $28,000 to $40,000. We could also say, for example, that there is a 0.35 chance of profit being less than $30,000. This occurs in these two boxes, which have associated joint probabilities of which totals to 0.15 plus 0.2 equals 0.35 or 35%. In other words, joint probability tables are useful things that tell us more than simply expected values. In this video, we've considered how to build risk attitude into decision making, how much perfect information is worth to us, and how to use joint probability distributions to help us with decisions. All these techniques assume we know probabilities and values. Often both are estimates at best. In this video we consider the use of decision trees to help us make staged decisions and to calculate the value of imperfect information such as market research. A decision tree is a visual representation of a set of interrelated decisions that shows the reader a path through from one decision to the next. Let us consider a simple example. Jack is considering opening another sandwich shop. He thinks from experience there will be a 40% chance that the new shop will succeed, in which case it will be worth $1.1 million. If he launches a new shop, but it's ultimately unsuccessful, it will lose him $700,000. He could, of course, decide to do nothing. He could firstly draw this out as a decision tree. Let's assume for these purposes Jack is risk neutral. Decision trees are drawn and read from left to right. A square node means a decision needs to be made. The decision maker can choose which route to go down from that node. In other words, Jack can decide whether to launch or not. 
the circular node is down to chance. Reading from left to right, we can see Jack initially has a choice of whether to launch or not. If he doesn't launch, his return is nil. If he does, then it's down to chance. This takes him to node B. There's a 40% chance of success and a 60% chance of failure. We calculate decision trees from right to left. So the first node that we would assess is node B. At a chance node, we calculate expected value. In other words, 40% times 1.1 million plus 60% times negative 700,000 is $20,000 positive. Rolling back to node A, Jack has a decision to make. He can choose which leg to go down, and he'll choose the leg with the highest value associated with it. If he launches, it will be worth the 20000 at no day on average. If he doesn't, he'll get nil. So based on expected values, he will launch. This is a very simple example and can be extended so that one decision leads on to the next, but the principle is the same. Draw the stages out from left to right and calculate from right to left. At a chance node, calculate an expected value. At a decision node, choose the route with the highest expected value. Often in questions, the option will be given to undertake further research before committing. Typically, this research is imperfect. In other words, it reduces uncertainty but doesn't eliminate it, such as market research. Jack, for example, might consider undertaking market research before committing to opening his new shop. Although market research is not guaranteed to be absolutely accurate, good market research will give you a strong indication. So, early on in the decision-making process, there may be a choice, so springing from a decision node, of whether to do market research or not. As always, the decision path with the highest value should be chosen. If the path with research is higher than without research, then this additional value can be attributed to the imperfect information generated by the research itself. It is the value of that information over and above the price paid for it. This approach can help us, for example, to determine the maximum we will be prepared to pay for that information. Decision trees are useful as they help us to structure our thoughts and give clarity to a staged process. However, in the main, we're assuming there are limited options at each point, otherwise the tree becomes unwieldy. We know the probabilities and possibilities and are happy making decisions based on expected values. This latter assumption presumes we are therefore risk neutral. In reality, these points restrict the usefulness of decision trees, and these points should be noted in your exam if called upon to criticise decision trees as a technique. In this video, we consider testing our decisions to see how safe they are with sensitivity analysis. This technique also allows us to focus on those variables in a decision which we need to ensure our estimates are as accurate as possible for. We'll also consider simulations and scenario planning as ways of helping to further inform the decision maker before they make a choice. First, let's consider sensitivity analysis. Imagine Jack, who owns a sandwich shop, is considering launching a new line of yogurts to sell as desserts. He's done his preliminary analysis as follows. Sales price, $2 a yogurt. Variable cost, $1.25 a yogurt. Volume, 1000 per week. And fixed costs, $500 per week. His forecast profit would be sales revenue of 1,000 times $2 is $2,000. Variable cost, 1,000 times $1.25 is $1,250, giving us a contribution of $750. Less fixed costs of $500, giving us a profit of $250. On the basis that it creates a positive profit, Jack is poised to say yes and launch his new line of yoghurt desserts. 
Jack is considering how robust his decision is. How sensitive is his decision to say yes to the various estimates in his original calculation? Firstly, sales price. How low would the sales price have to fall, assuming this affects nothing else in the process, before the profit is nil and Jack would decide not to launch? Sales revenue would have to fall by $250, everything else being equal, to wipe out the profit of $250 and reduce it to zero. This is a reduction of $250 divided by $2,000 is 12.5% or a reduction down from $2 to $2 less 12.5% is $1.75. Jack would say he is 12.5% sensitive to his estimate of sales price. A lower percentage would imply increased sensitivity. Next, variable cost. Variable cost would have to increase by $250 to eliminate the profit and change Jack's mind, which is an increase of $250 over $1,250 is 20%, or an increase from $1.25 per yogurt to $1.25 times 1.2 is $1.50 per yogurt. Jack is 20% sensitive to his original estimate of variable cost. Next, sales volume. A reduction in sales volume affects both sales revenue and variable cost. In other words, it affects contribution. Contribution, and so sales volume, would need to fall by $250 over $750 is 33% to eliminate profits. This would mean a reduction from the current 1,000 units to 667 units per week. Jack is 33% sensitive to sales volume. Finally, fixed cost. Fixed costs would need to increase by $250 from the current $500 to eliminate the profit entirely. This is an increase of $250 over $500 is 50%. Jack is 50% sensitive to his estimate of fixed costs. Hopefully by now the approach is feeling familiar. In general sensitivity is the amount we can stand to lose divided by the value affected by the variable we're looking at. For example fixed costs again. The amount we can stand to lose is $250. The value affected by the variable we're looking at is $500, the fixed costs themselves. $250 divided by $500 is 50%. The decision maker can then focus on those variables with a low percentage when refining their estimates and considering their final decision. Unfortunately, although sensitivity analysis adds an extra dimension to assist the decision maker, it is not without its drawbacks. Firstly, it's not an optimizing technique. In other words, it doesn't give you a yes, no answer in terms of should I continue? It simply says, if you're wrong by more than X percent, you've made a mistake. Secondly, it doesn't include any consideration for how likely you are to be wrong. For example, it looks like you should be concerned about a variable with say only 0.5% sensitivity, but if the number concerned is a solid number, for example, if you have a binding quotation from someone, so it simply isn't going to be wrong, there's no need to worry. It also only looks at one variable changing at a time. This is clearly unrealistic. In the real world, variables are interrelated and tend to change all at the same time. There's a technique that can help us here though, it's called simulation. With Jack's yogurt decision, he used what are known as point estimates for each of the variables. In other words, he gave each variable one number. Take sales volume, for example. Jack estimated sales volume as being a thousand. In reality, of course, it could be higher or it could be lower. If we had the experience or could do sufficient research, we might produce a more detailed probability distribution. Many variables are normally distributed. In this sense, the word normal is a technical term. 
Here is an example of a normal distribution that might better represent the potential volume of sales. It may have an expected average of a thousand units, but it could be higher or could be lower. Very much higher or very much lower is, however, less likely than just being a little bit higher or lower. How widely spread around the average the curve is, is described by the standard deviation, or sigma. For example, here is a distribution with a large standard deviation, and here's a distribution with a small standard deviation. The standard deviation is calculated using this formula, where EV stands for expected value or average. In our example, this is 1,000 yogurts. P is probability, and X is a possible outcome. Suppose, for example, some basic research showed the following. 1,000 units with a probability of 0.5, 800 units with a probability of 0.25, and 1,200 units with a probability of 0.25. The expected value is calculated as 0.5 times 1,000 plus 0.25 times 800 plus 0.25 times 1,200 is 1,000 units. The standard deviation can be calculated by building up a table as follows. The standard deviation would be the square root of 20,000, which is 141. Getting back to Jack, he could replace one or more of the point estimates with probability distributions, many of which may be normal distributions like we have considered. He, or rather a computer he is using, could then combine together the probability distributions to come up with a probability distribution of profit rather than the current point estimate of $250. It might look something like this. Jack can then see the range of profits he may achieve and the spread or how variable those profits may be. Although once again this is not an optimizing technique, and that it doesn't give him a yes-no answer, it nevertheless gives him a more realistic picture of what the future might hold. All this assumes, of course, he can get reasonable information on the underlying probability distributions in the first place. This may take lots of time and expense, and so in the real world is often reserved for decisions where very large sums of money are involved. Don't worry. In your exam, you won't be expected to prepare a simulation, only to talk about how they work, what they show, and the pros and cons of doing them. You may be required to calculate a standard deviation, but nothing more. Lastly, let's consider scenario planning, or what-if analysis. Often, organisations will consider a series of plausible future events to map out how they might affect the business and how the business could plan in advance to respond. For example, an airline might consider what happens if fuel prices increase by 30%. This does rely on there being sufficient skill and experience in the organisation to consider which variables to focus on, but it can be a useful tool to help organisations plan in advance. In conclusion, We've seen that sensitivity analysis, simulations and scenario planning are all useful tools to help the decision maker when facing risk and uncertainty, albeit no method is perfect. For your exam, make sure you can perform the necessary calculations, but also be prepared to interpret the results and discuss the advantages and disadvantages of the methods themselves. Budgets aid the performance of an organization by providing a benchmark against which to compare actual results. In other words, budgeting allows variance analysis to be performed. Based on this, corrective action can be taken to improve performance in the future. Budgets can exist at different levels within the organization's performance hierarchy. At a strategic level, 
A budget can show how the overall goals of that organisation can be achieved. It can form part of a company's long-term planning, which is of interest to that company's senior management. For example, a long-term plan may exist to increase market share or develop new products for new markets. To achieve such goals, divisional performance targets would be set. These are part of the organization's medium-term planning, which would be of assistance to its middle management. For example, staff training may have to be undertaken to help achieve sales targets for the new products. Divisional targets are then broken into individual departmental objectives. This will form part of the organization's short-term planning and will be of assistance to its junior management. For example, budgets will be set for the material production costs of the new product. The three levels of organisational budgeting are linked. If junior management succeed in achieving their short-term objectives, then there is increased likelihood of middle management hitting their medium-term targets, which in turn means an increased chance of an organisation achieving long-term or strategic success. Hence. The budgetary system supports all levels of management within an organisation and can be of assistance in the areas of planning, control, communication, motivation and performance assessment. Master Budget the master budget brings together the individual budget for the organization's business functions into a format consistent with the overall financial statements. So, there could be a master budget prepared for the profit or loss account, statement of financial position and statement of cash flow. A master budget can be seen to be useful in that it represents an overall budget for the organization for a particular period. However, no detail is provided, meaning that it is not very useful for management control. Functional Budget A budget can be prepared for each of the organization's business functions. So, a sales budget may be prepared, or a material, or labour, or overhead budget could be produced. These functional budgets can be useful in that they highlight the organization's structure and responsibilities. However, many costs could be incurred which do not relate specifically to any particular business function. Fixed Budget A fixed budget is the main budget prepared at the start of the year. It is produced for one level of activity only, based on anticipated levels of sales and production. Let's take a look at an example of a fixed budget. Company C has produced a fixed budget based on producing and selling 150 units. Given a standard selling price of $100, revenue of 15000 is budgeted. Material and labour has a standard cost of $40 and $20 per unit respectively, meaning budgeted material and labour costs of 6000 and 3000 Fixed costs of 1000 are also expected. Overall, Given a fixed production and sales level of 150 units, profit is budgeted to be $5,000. There are advantages to producing a fixed budget. It provides a useful benchmark for control purposes. It illustrates what the organisation can achieve given the resources available to it. However, a fixed budget is not useful in an environment that is rapidly changing. A change in expected production or sales levels will render the fixed budget outdated. Also, if actual levels of production were different to what was expected, then it would be difficult to use the fixed budget as part of the performance appraisal process. Flexible Budget A flexible budget is prepared at the start of the year for multiple levels of activity. For example, Company D has produced a flexible budget in that multiple budgets are produced at the start of the year at different levels of activity. 100 units, 150 units, 200 units and 300 units. Given a standard selling price of $100, 
standard material and labour costs of $40 and $20 and standard fixed cost of $1,000 then profits of $3,000, $5,000, $7,000 and $11,000 would be expected at each level of production or each level of sales. A flexible budget is useful in that it allows changes in the actual production and sales volumes and thus can be more easily incorporated into the performance appraisal process. When implementing a budgetary system, a decision must be made as to how involved employees should be in the budgetary process. A budget can have an imposed or a participative style. Top-down budgeting. This is an imposed budget. It is set by senior management and reflects their overall corporate objectives, which then work down through the different levels of the organisation, setting appropriate targets to ensure the higher objectives are achieved. There is no opportunity for more junior staff to become involved in the budgetary process. Advantages of top-down budgeting include It is quick. As there is no participation of middle or junior management in the budget process, then it should not take much time to prepare. Hence, less staff training will be required, meaning less costs will be incurred. Senior managers have a better overall view of the company and its resources. A top-down budget utilises management's awareness of this resource availability. By excluding lower level management from the budgetary process, budgetary slack or unused resource is avoided. For example, it avoids the risk of a junior employee deliberately overestimating the time necessary to perform a particular task. Also, it can be argued that by having the budgets imposed by someone outside the department, then a more objective or fresher perspective may be gained. The disadvantages associated with top-down budgeting might include Senior management may come up with unrealistic targets. This will serve to only demotivate the staff, reduce their productivity and ultimately increase staff turnover. Budget pressure can result in employees uniting against management. An absence of staff involvement in setting the budget can result in reduced motivation and reduced employee satisfaction. Bottom-up budgeting. This is a budgeting system in which all budget holders are given the opportunity to participate in setting their own budgets. It is the opposite of a top-down approach. Extensive employee involvement exists in that the budget starts with the personal and departmental objectives set by junior management and then works its way up through the different levels of the organisation, setting appropriate targets to ensure the lower objectives are achieved. Advantages of bottom-up budgeting By including employees in the preparation of the budget, then employee motivation should increase in terms of trying to achieve the budgetary goals. This in turn should increase the likelihood of budgetary success. Junior management will, by nature, compared to senior management, have a more detailed knowledge of their area of the business and hence produce more realistic budgets. Building a budget from the bottom up will encourage and improve communication between departments. Bottom up budgeting should free up senior management time to focus on other important matters. Disadvantages of bottom up budgeting Including junior management in the budget preparation can be time-consuming and expensive. Also, some training may be required before the budget can be prepared. There is a risk that budgetary slack may be included. Hence, an inaccurate budget is possible. The budgetary goals set by the junior management may not be consistent with the strategic objectives of the organisation. Hence, there is a risk of dysfunctional behaviour or company profits not being maximised. The advantages and disadvantages of a top-down budget 
are often the opposite of the advantages and disadvantages of a bottom-up budget. In trying to decide whether the budgetary process should be top-down or imposed, or bottom-up, participative, perhaps a bargained approach might be considered in which there is some employee involvement. An incremental budget uses the previous year's budget, or the actual results, as a starting point and adds or subtracts an incremental amount to cover inflation and other known changes. This would be commonly applied within stable organisations, where costs and revenues are not expected to change significantly from one period to the next. Hence, strong cost control should exist and discretionary expenditure should be limited. Incremental budgeting is commonly used within the public sector. Advantages of incremental budgeting might include they are easy to understand and take very little time to prepare. There is very little change from one period to the next, which facilitates organisational planning. Incremental budgeting allows departmental managers to operate on a consistent basis, where only the budgetary change would need to be justified. Also, the impact of any budgetary change can be seen very quickly. Disadvantages of incremental budgeting Any problems or inefficiencies or budgetary slack are carried forward from the prior year. No effort is made to eliminate these. Under incremental budgeting, employees are not incentivized to improve on last year's performance, perhaps reduce costs or suggest ideas for potential new products. In fact, Incremental budgeting encourages spending up to the budgeted amount in order to ensure that the budget is maintained for the following year. Incremental budgeting assumes working methods will continue unchanged. It is possible that the budget will become outdated and no longer relate to the nature of the work undertaken by that company. Zero-based budgeting requires that each cost element must be justified, as though the activities to which the budget relates or being undertaken for the first time. Unless each activity is approved, then there is a zero budget allowance. Zero based budgeting can be broken into three steps. Step one is to define a decision unit. Here, detailed descriptions of each item of activity or expenditure are put forward. This should be done in a manner that allows the decision unit to be compared to other decision units. These activities refer to all of the various items that need to be budgeted for. Step 2 is to evaluate and rank the activities. Each decision unit is then reviewed and ultimately ranked based on its benefits and importance to the organisation. Some activities will be obligated, for example spending on health and safety, or certain tax obligations, while others will be seen as more discretionary, for example training of staff research and development expenditure, Christmas party spending. Step 3 is to allocate the budget resource. The budget resource is allocated to the items in ranking order until the available resources are all used. Advantages of zero-based budgeting include it should ensure that resources are allocated efficiently to where they are most needed. Zero-based budgeting should detect inflated budgets and ensure that budgetary slack or waste is identified and eliminated. Zero-based budgeting forces managers to improve their knowledge and understanding of the costs within the organisation and thus drive managers to find out cost-effective ways to reduce those costs and improve operations. Zero-based budgeting can be seen to increase staff motivation by providing greater initiative and responsibility in decision making. Disadvantages of zero-based budgeting By its nature, zero-based budgeting is time-consuming and expensive. Staff training may be required to successfully implement the process. It can be difficult to define decision units. Not all activities or expenditure items can be comfortably labelled and defined. 
Zero-based budgeting is a rigid process and it may neglect the focus on long-term goals. The research and development department may find it more difficult to justify each item of expenditure, for example. Management can feel demotivated at having to continuously justify each activity or item of expenditure or due to the time spent implementing the zero-based budgeting process. The advantages and disadvantages of incremental budgeting are often the opposite to the advantages and disadvantages of zero-based budgeting. An organisation may be trying to decide which of the two budgetary systems to adopt. They could consider a bargained or compromised approach. Incremental budgeting could be used every year and then zero-based budgeting applied in year 4 or year 5 or perhaps when the organisation undergoes some significant change. Or an organisation may decide to apply zero-based budgeting to some departments but not all, depending on what management thinks is most appropriate for those departments. It may not be worthwhile to apply zero-based budgeting to light and heating expenses for example or to the entire budget of the health and safety department. Hence, the organisation could benefit from some of the advantages of zero-based budgeting without the annual cost and time implications. Eroding budget is a budget that is set at the beginning of a period and is then constantly updated and extended by adding another accounting period. Let's see an example of a rolling budget. Company A has prepared the following budget for the forthcoming year. The budgeted number of units of production in quarter 1, 2, 3 and 4 is 20,000, 22,000, 24,000 and 26,000 units respectively. The expected material cost for each of these units is $6. This means that budgeted material cost for Company A for the coming four quarters is 120,000 in quarter 1, 132,000 in quarter 2, 144,000 in quarter 3 and 156,000 in quarter 4. We are then told that actual material costs for quarter 1 were 110,000 or $5.50 per unit. These were lower than expected due to competition being more intense than expected among Company A's material suppliers. Consequently, the Budget Committee has decided that the budget for the next 12 months should be updated to reflect this lower material cost of $5.50 per unit. All assumptions regarding budgeted growth in units should remain as per the original budget. The requirement is to update the budget for the next 12 months. A rolling budget should be constantly updated and extended by adding another accounting period. Hence, a four-quarter budget should be maintained. A budget should be redrafted, therefore, for quarter two to quarter five, reflecting the fall in the budgeted material cost from $6 per unit to $5.50 per unit. The quarterly increase of 2,000 production units should be maintained and applied to quarter five. Hence, Expected units of production would be 28,000 in quarter 5. So, by applying the revised cost of material of $5.50 per unit to the number of production units for quarter 2, 3, 4 and 5, material costs in each quarter should total 121,000, 132,000, 143,000 and $154,000. Advantages of a rolling budget might include By constantly updating the budget, the company will always have a 12-month focus. A rolling budget reduces the amount of uncertainty within that budget. This will improve company planning and ultimately improve company performance. A rolling budget forces management to regularly reassess the budget and to produce budgets that are more accurate and more realistic. Disadvantages, however, might include by continuously having to update and amend the budget, staff may become demotivated, which could possibly lead to decreased productivity and increased staff turnover. 
By its nature, a rolling budget will consume more time, more administration, and ultimately more cost than an incremental budget. It is possible that by having to focus on continuously updating the budget to reflect the most recent changes, more pressing issues may be ignored. Activity-based budgeting. Activity-based budgeting is the use of costs as determined by activity-based costing as a basis for preparing budgets. Activity-based costing allows us to understand how costs arise and thus we can focus on reducing those costs. So, to reduce overhead or to reduce budget, we need to reduce the number of activities driving those overheads. Work would initially be done to identify what the true causes of costs are, the cost drivers, within the organization's activities. The required level of each activity is then identified and a budget is produced based on this. For example, a business may have identified the number of purchase orders as a cost driver and this activity may impact costs in the sales, admin and finance departments. Hence to reduce the budgeted overhead, the organization should focus on reducing the number of purchase orders. Let's take a look at an example of how an activity-based budget might be prepared. Company B has calculated the following absorption rates as a basis for preparing the budget. Ordering costs are incurred at the rate of $30 per order. Machine costs are absorbed at the rate of $3 per machine hour, while inspection overhead is an overhead absorption rate of $350 per inspection. These overhead absorption rates are calculated by separating historic overheads into cost pools linked to appropriate cost drivers. The following activity levels are anticipated for next year for Department 1 and Department 2. In Department 1, the number of orders processed is budgeted to be 4,000. Machine hours are forecast at 42,000, while the number of budgeted inspections in Department 1 is 12. In Department 2, budgeted activity levels are 3,000 orders to be processed, 36,000 machine hours to be worked, and 13 inspections to be carried out. The requirement is to produce the activity-based budget for each department, showing costs for each type of activity and in total. To prepare an activity-based budget, cost driver data, or the number of activities, and the related cost driver rate, will be used as a basis to budget the costs of the company. The more activities or cost driver incidents, then the more overhead that will be budgeted. So in department 1, the budgeted ordering cost is 120,000, being $30 per order multiplied by 4,000 expected orders. Similarly in department 2, ordering costs are expected to total 90,000 being the same cost driver rate of $30 per order multiplied by 3,000 budgeted orders. Budgeted machine costs in Department 1 total 126,000, being 42,000 machine hours at an absorption rate of $3 per machine hour. In Department 2, 36,000 machine hours are expected to be worked, meaning machine costs are budgeted as 108,000. Inspection overhead is budgeted at 4,200 in Department 1, being an overhead absorption rate of 350 per inspection, multiplied by 12 expected inspections. Similarly, in Department 2, given 13 expected inspections next year, inspection costs are budgeted at 4,550. In total then, using these activities as a basis to prepare the overhead budget, Department 1 and Department 2 have budgeted overheads of 250,200 and 202,550 respectively. Advantages of activity-based budgeting Activity-based budgeting recognises that activities drive costs. It recognises that the causes of costs need to be controlled in order to control the costs themselves. Hence, a more accurate budget can arise. 
by analysing activities under activity-based budgeting. Management can recognise that not all activities are value-adding. Some activities incur cost but do not add value. This focuses management's attention on reducing such activities and hence reducing such costs. Disadvantages of activity-based budgeting Activity-based budgeting is a more complex budgeting system. It may not be fully understood by many managers and therefore not fully accepted as a basis of budget preparation. Staff within an organisation may be resistant to activity-based budgeting. At a minimum, training might be required, which would represent a cost to the company. Difficulty can arise in identifying appropriate cost drivers. It is not always easy to identify a single cost driver that is specific to a particular overhead. Indeed, this can be an arbitrary process. Activity-based budgeting relies upon detailed accounting records in which cost pools and cost drivers are identifiable. Compiling such records can be a time-consuming and costly exercise. It can be argued that in the short term, many overhead costs are not controllable and do not vary directly with changes in the volume of activity for the cost driver. Hello. In this video, we'll be considering some of the issues surrounding traditional budgeting approaches to help us consider an alternative approach beyond budgeting, which considers the merits of actually not bothering to budget in the traditional sense at all. Organisations traditionally use budgets as a way of communicating goals and expectations to management. They form the basis of targets that can be used to assess whether or not an individual has performed well or badly and to encourage them to perform in such a way as to meet and beat those targets. Unfortunately, there are many issues associated with traditional budgeting. Let's consider some of these drawbacks to help us understand why beyond budgeting has its merits. Firstly, environments are generally unpredictable. Budgets are usually set at the start of the period. For them to be a useful target, the person who sets the budget has to have a reasonable appreciation for what the coming period is going to be like. However, in a modern environment where the scope of competition is often global, customers are global, and technology moves on at an ever-increasing pace, in many cases the environment for the next 12 months is not stable or predictable enough to derive targets that are likely to be challenging but achievable. In fact, the targets are likely to end up being set too high or too low. Either is demotivational. If a budget is set too tough, people give up. Or if the budget is set too easy, people relax. Thus, the very act of setting a target is likely to actually demotivate people in a changing environment. Secondly, budgets are time-consuming and costly to prepare. In a competitive world, careful consideration needs to be given to whether the benefits of setting budgets actually justify this cost. It also potentially focuses management on a narrow activity rather than allowing them the freedom to manage the business more generally. Thirdly, budgets promote cost control rather than cost reduction. Provided budgeted costs are met, this is viewed as good performance, irrespective of whether actual costs could have been lower. Fourthly, budgets may threaten quality. Often, budgets are expressed in financial terms. The incentive is therefore to reduce costs to beat budget. However, this may threaten quality if cheaper alternatives are used that are not considered to be as good by customers. Budgets may stifle innovation. New ideas and opportunities may present themselves during a performance period. If these are not part of the budget, then they may well be ignored by management, even though they might be good for the overall performance of the business. Finally, budgets can lead to dysfunctional behaviour. Managers, in their desperate efforts to hit budget targets, 
may make all kinds of decisions that are not actually in the best interest of the creation of long-term shareholder wealth. For example, they may focus excessively on the short term, myopia. They may cut back on training and research and development to reduce costs this year to hit a profit target. This is clearly not good for the long term development of the business. They may try to manipulate results to make them look better than they actually are. This may make senior management unaware of problems. They may make decisions to ensure their performance metrics look good. For example, they may lease an asset rather than buying it to reduce the amount of investment on the balance sheet. This may or may not have been the best decision financially. So, it's fairly safe to say that traditional budgeting has its issues. Hope and Fraser in 2003 came up with an alternative approach known as Beyond Budgeting which suggested that traditional budgets actually hinder rather than help organisational performance. Simply ceasing to produce traditional budgets may sound like we're creating a worrying lack of control in the organisation. So let's have a look and see how Beyond Budgeting may work. Let's consider the pass rate in this paper. A traditional approach to budgeting for this pass rate might be for senior management to set a budget or target of say 90% as a target for teaching staff. Incentivize this by offering to pay a bonus based on a pass rate higher than 90%. Part of the problem in setting a target like this is that at the time the budget is set no one knows what the quality of the students is likely to be and no one knows how difficult or easy the exam is likely to be. So at the time it's set, we have no way of knowing whether 90% as a target is too high, too low, or about right. So, let's change our approach here and adopt a beyond budgeting style. At the start of the period, management and tutors might have a discussion clarifying what good looks like. In other words, discussing what should be the dimensions of performance that need to be given due focus. One of those areas might be pass rates. Management and tutors may well agree that pass rates are an important dimension of performance for Learn Signal. We may even discuss an aspirational target. For example, let's suppose the pass rate was 87% in the prior sitting. This might give us a feel for what we would hope to beat in the future period. It's important to note though that no firm target is set out at this point. Then, as teaching progresses, we can gauge the quality of our students together. This may then raise or lower our expectations for pass rates. Management will appraise the tutor's performance on an ongoing basis in light of what the unfolding environment shows us. When the exam paper is published, Again, we can reflect on whether the paper was unusually difficult or easy. Then, at the end of the period, we can discuss whether the tutor's performance was good or poor in light of the environment as we now know it to be. Understanding this environment may well involve benchmarking our performance against other learning providers. In short, a beyond budgeting approach might run like this. 1. Jointly decide the dimensions of performance that need to be targeted. 2. Ensure the employee has tools and support they need to do their job. 3. Head office should minimise interference and red tape unless absolutely necessary. 4. Actual performance should be appraised in light of the unfolding environment and corrective action taken on an ongoing basis. This may well involve benchmarking. And five, long-term targets are not used to guide performance or appraise it. This approach has several benefits. It removes having firm targets, which as we have discussed can be demotivational. It also encourages a responsiveness to the environment as it actually unfolds, 
rather than trying to adapt behaviour to hit a relatively arbitrary target. Overall, it should encourage the best possible performance in the circumstances. However, there are several drawbacks with the beyond budgeting approach. There is a lack of objectivity perhaps, given that interpretation of performance is purely centred around opinion in relation to the environment. This may make performance assessment too dependent on particular individuals that are performing that assessment and their personal views. Other stakeholders may require forecast information to help them plan and make decisions. Often this information is based on budgets, however, in a beyond budgeting environment it is less likely to be readily available. Also, as with any change, there is likely to be resistance from people who prefer the status quo. Change requires resources, time and money, which may be in short supply. In summary, traditional budgeting has plenty of problems which can potentially be overcome by using a beyond budgeting approach. Hope and Fraser originally suggested the idea of beyond budgeting, but it's since then been adopted by the Beyond Budgeting Roundtable, which is an independent research organisation that promotes the concept. However, Beyond Budgeting is not without its problems, which should be considered before adopting it as a new approach to performance management. Feed forward control. A feed forward control is a proactive system of control where potential problems are identified before they arise. The forecast results are compared to the budget and, where deviations are identified, corrective action is taken to ensure the budget is achieved. On the other hand, a feedback system compares actual events that have happened with an original budget. And so this really is a reactive system of control. Traditional variance analysis is a good example where feedback control takes place. Let's take a look at an illustration which reflects the difference between a feedback control and a feedforward control. A material manager receives control reports about material costs. At the end of the first quarter, the manager might receive the following feedback control report for the organization's two main materials. For material one, the budgeted material cost for quarter one is 190,000 compared to actual material cost of 202,000, meaning an adverse variance to date of 12,000 for material one. Similarly, an adverse variance for material two of 17,000 also rises. This is based on budgeted quarter one cost of 208,000 compared to actual cost incurred of 225,000. The total material cost variance is 29,000 adverse. This report looks back at the three month period that has passed and prepares a variance based on what has happened compared to what had been expected to happen. This is a reactive system of control. Alternatively, the material manager might be presented with a feed forward control report. The budgeted costs for the year are compared to the revised forecast of material costs based on actual quarter one material costs to date. Let's assume that the budgeted material costs for the year are 1.62 million, split 775,000 for material one and 865,000 for material two. So, for material one, given an actual cost in quarter one of 202,000, it could be forecast that material one costs are now expected to total 808,000, being 202,000 multiplied by four quarters. Given the original annual budget for material one of 775,000, an adverse variance of 53,000 is now anticipated. Similarly, based on quarter one material cost to date, a revised annual forecast for material two costs could be 900,000, being 225,000 multiplied by four quarters. Given an original budget of 865,000, an adverse variance of 35,000 is expected for material two, meaning a total adverse variance of 88,000 
could be expected to arise. The use of a feed-forward control system means that corrective action can be taken to avoid this expected adverse variance of 88,000 arising this year. The material purchasing manager might consider purchasing material in bulk so as to avail of purchase discounts. Perhaps other suppliers of that material will be costed. Or maybe the manager could look at the possibility of using alternative material or improving the efficiency of material production processes. If some of these measures were implemented for the remainder of the year, then the budgeted material cost of 1.62 million could still be met. A standard for a product or service is a predetermined unit cost set under specified working conditions. A standard cost can have the following uses. Budget preparation. Standard costs and standard sales prices are necessary for the preparation of budgets. Motivation. A standard can represent a predetermined cost for a particular period for a particular cost centre. Hence, it can motivate those working within the cost centre to ensure that the standard is achieved. Control. By comparing a standard cost to an actual cost, differences are highlighted and can be investigated. Performance measurement. These differences between the standard or predetermined cost and the actual cost can form the basis for assessing the performance of cost centre managers. Infantry valuation. Standard costs can be used for the measurement of infantry to be included in the organisation's statement of financial position and statement of profit or loss. There are four main types of standard. Basic standards. The assumption here is that nothing has changed since the standard was first set. The standards remain unchanged over long periods of time. They are used for trend analysis to illustrate how material or labour costs, for example, have changed over time. However, as the standards remain unchanged, they usually become outdated, meaning they cannot be used to highlight efficiency levels or as a basis of performance assessment. In fact, basic standards can serve to demotivate employees, as an outdated standard can become either too easy or too difficult to achieve. Performance assessment would also be difficult given a demotivated employee. Current standards. Current standards are based on current working conditions. They assume current efficiency and cost levels will be maintained. They can be useful to apply when perhaps current working practices are not normal, and applying any other type of standard would only provide meaningless information. However, as staff are not encouraged or expected to improve on what they are currently doing, perhaps reduce costs or improve efficiencies, they may become demotivated. Productivity levels could suffer as a result, and fair assessment of performance would be difficult to achieve. Ideal standard. These standards are based on perfect working conditions. They assume an optimal level of efficiency and cost. Hence, an ideal standard might assume that machinery does not break down, employees do not become ill or perform below their best. In reality, an ideal standard might not be possible to achieve, which can have a negative impact on employee motivation and productivity. Also, fair performance appraisal would prove difficult given an ideal standard. Attainable standard. An attainable standard assumes there will be some improvements in current efficiency and cost levels. However, the standard also assumes normal waste, idle time and other inefficiencies will arise. Employees should feel that attainable standards are challenging yet realistic and achievable. Hence, employees should be motivated to meet the standard and assessment of their performance should be more accurate as a result. Flexed budget. A budgetary control compares actual results to budgeted results. The difference is referred to as a variance. If the results are better than budgeted, then a favourable variance arises. If the results are worse than expected, then an adverse variance arises. A flex budget is prepared at the end of the period. 
It is prepared by applying standard costs and standard revenues to the actual number of units produced and sold in that period. Hence, when comparing actual performance to budgeted performance, or to the flexed budget, as the comparison is made using the same level of activity, or the same number of units, then a meaningful variance analysis can be performed. Let's take a look at an example of how a flex budget might be prepared and its relevance in terms of the performance assessment process. F Company has prepared the following flexible budgets at the beginning of the financial period. Given 10,000 units of production, material costs are estimated to total 30,000. Labour costs will total 70,000 and overhead is budgeted at 20,000. Assuming F Company produces 12,000 units, then material and labour costs are budgeted to total 36,000 and 84,000 respectively, while overhead remains at 20,000. At a production level of 14,000 units, material costs are forecast to be 42,000. Labour is expected to amount to 98,000, while overhead is budgeted at 20,000. The requirement is if actual production for the period was 12,500 units and the production costs incurred totaled 170,000, what is the meaningful total variance for performance evaluation purposes? To calculate a variance, the actual production costs would be compared to the flexed production costs. The flexed production costs, or flex budget, is calculated by applying the standard cost for material, labour and overhead to the actual number of units produced. Given the total material cost at the three separate levels of production, it can be derived that material is a variable cost, in that it increases in line with output. Hence the material cost per unit is $3, meaning the flex material budget is 37500 being $3 per unit multiplied by actual production of 12,500 units. Similarly, labour is a variable cost, as the increase in total labour cost is in direct proportion to the increased number of units as per the three flexible budgets. The labour cost per unit is $7, meaning a flex labour budget of 87,500, being actual units produced of 12,500 multiplied by the standard labour cost of $7. Budgeted overhead remains at 20,000 for the three levels of production. Hence overhead is a fixed cost, meaning the same overhead amount of 20,000 can be applied to the flex budget. In total, given 12,500 units of actual output, flex production costs total 145,000. The variance is the difference between the actual cost incurred, 170,000, and the flex budget cost of 145,000. Given the higher actual cost compared to the flex budget, the difference of 25,000 can be referred to as an adverse variance. The variance should be analysed into its component parts, material, labour, overhead, and investigated as to why budgeted costs have been exceeded. The variances should then form the basis of performance assessment and future cost control. Variances are used as a basis to assess performance of the budget holder or person responsible for that budget. However, a positive or adverse variance does not necessarily mean that the budget holders performed well or performed badly. Responsibility accounting tells us that a budget holder or a manager should only be assessed based on what they can control. Hence we must be able to distinguish between controllable and uncontrollable factors. A controllable cost, for example, is a cost which is influenced by the budget holder. For example, a labour manager may be responsible for the cost specific to hiring and paying staff. An uncontrollable cost is a cost that cannot be changed by the budget holder. For example, an increase in the rental cost of the manufacturing plant, or a foreign exchange loss incurred as a result of changing economic conditions, would be seen by the labour manager to be an uncontrollable cost.
When budgeting, it is impossible to be certain as to exactly what a particular figure or value might be. It may, however, be possible to identify a number of possible outcomes, x, and their associated probabilities, p. An expected value is a weighted average of all possible outcomes. It calculates the average return that will be made if a decision is repeated over and again. The expected value is calculated by multiplying the value of each possible outcome, x, by the probability of that outcome arising, p. These results are then added together. So, the formula for the expected value is the summation of x by p. Let's consider an example. A company is considering launching a new product. The expected state of the local economy has been categorised as either strong, average or weak. Based on this, the company has identified three possible profit projections for the next year and the related probabilities. There is a 40% chance of a strong economy, a 35% chance of an average economy and a 25% chance of a weak economy. This would result in respective profits for the next year of 220,000, 120,000 and 40,000. The requirement is to use expected values to calculate the expected profit of the new product. Using the expected value approach, we apply the probabilities, which are given to us in the question, to the related profits, so as to calculate the expected value or expected profit of the company's new product. So, given a strong economy, the estimated profit of 220,000, x, is multiplied by the 40% probability P of that profit arising. This yields a result of 88,000 being x multiplied by p. In an average economy there's a 35% chance p of an estimated profit of 120,000 x. x multiplied by p equals 42,000. Also given a weak economy the estimated profit of 40,000 x has a 25% chance, p, of arising, meaning x multiplied by p equals 10,000. The expected value is the sum of x multiplied by p, meaning we add 88,000, 42,000 and 10,000 to generate an expected value of 140,000. Advantages of expected value might include Expected value takes uncertainty into consideration, as the probability of each possible outcome is considered and then used to calculate an expected value. The expected value calculation is relatively straightforward, and the actual expected value is a single number, meaning decision making is facilitated. There are also disadvantages associated with the expected value decision making technique. It assumes the decision will have to be made again and again. The expected value approach to decision making calculates the long term weighted average value. Expected values should not therefore be applied to one off decisions. The expected value may not equal any of the possible outcomes. In the above example, the expected value of 140,000 did not equal any of the possible outcomes of 220,000. 120,000 or 40,000. The probabilities applied to the expected value calculation can be subjective. Consideration should always be given to their origin or to the accuracy of their calculation. They should be calculated based on future expectations as opposed to past results. Expected value can be seen to ignore the risk as the range of possible profit outcomes is not considered. In the above scenario, for example, the possible profit could be as high as 220,000, yet as low as 40,000. High-low analysis is a method of analysing a semi-variable or mixed cost into its fixed and variable elements 
based on analysis of past information about costs incurred at various levels of activity. Once identified, the fixed and variable costs can then be used to forecast the total cost at a budgeted level of activity. High low analysis follows a four step approach. Step one is to select the highest and lowest activity levels and their associated total costs. Step two, using the difference between the highest and the lowest levels of activity and the costs at this level, determine the variable cost per unit. So, the variable cost per unit is equal to the cost at the high activity level minus the cost at the low activity level divided by the high level of activity units minus the low level of activity units. Step 3. By a process of substitution, find the fixed cost using either the high or low activity level. Total cost equals fixed cost plus variable cost. So, fixed cost is equal to total cost minus variable cost. Step 4 is to use the variable and fixed cost to forecast the total cost for a specific level of activity. Let's see an example of the high-low technique in action. Cost data for the latest six-month period is provided. In the month of January, 440 units were produced and costs incurred totaled 3,240. In February, 400 units of production generated total costs of 3,160. Similarly, in March, April, May and June, 480, 520, 500 and 460 units were produced, incurring respective costs of 3,320, 3,400, 3,360 and 3,280. The requirement is to use the high-low analysis to calculate the variable cost per unit and the total fixed cost and to forecast what the total cost will be when 600 units are produced. High-low analysis follows a four-step approach. Step 1 is to select the highest and the lowest activity levels and their associated total costs. The highest level of production occurs in the month of April when 520 units are produced. The total cost at this level are 3,400. The lowest activity level occurs in the month of February when 400 units are produced and the total costs incurred here are 3,160. Step 2 is to use the difference between the highest and the lowest levels of activity and the costs at this level to determine the variable cost per unit. The difference between the months of April and February in terms of units produced is 120, while the difference in the total costs incurred is 240. Using this difference, we can calculate the variable cost per unit as $2, being $240 divided by 120 units. Step 3 is to find the fixed cost using either the high or low activity level. Now that we have determined the variable cost per unit, we can calculate the fixed cost by a process of substitution. The total cost is equal to the fixed cost plus the variable cost. Hence, a fixed cost is equal to a total cost minus a variable cost. So, at the high level of activity, a total cost of 3,400 is equal to a fixed cost plus 520 units multiplied by $2 variable cost per unit. This means that a total cost of 3,400 is equal to a fixed cost plus 1,040 of variable costs. Ultimately, we can derive a fixed cost as being equal to the total cost of 3,400 minus the variable cost of 1,040, meaning a fixed cost of 2,360. 
Note that if the lowest activity level had been used to determine the fixed cost, then the same fixed cost of 2360 would have been calculated. We have now determined the variable cost of $2 and the fixed cost of 2360. We also know that total cost is equal to fixed cost plus variable cost. Hence, we are now in a position to calculate the expected total costs at a certain level of activity. Step 4 is to use the variable cost and the fixed cost to forecast the total cost for a specific level of activity. We are required to calculate the total costs assuming 600 units of production. Total cost is equal to fixed plus variable. So total cost is equal to 2360 plus two dollars for each of the 600 units of production. Total cost is equal to 3560. The advantages of the high-low technique might include it is a relatively simple technique which splits a total cost into its fixed and variable components. It is easy to understand and easy to apply. Disadvantages might include high-low analysis assumes that the activity level or the number of units of production is the only factor driving production costs. In reality, we know this is not the case. Only two pairs of past data are considered when predicting future costs. All other data is ignored. Also, there is an implicit assumption here that historical costs can reliably predict future costs. HILO assumes that a total cost can be split into its variable and fixed elements. This may not always be possible. In this session we are going to look at the effect of learning curves on production times and therefore how they impact on producing budgets and standard costs, which will ultimately impact on pricing decisions as well. When the workforce within a business start making a new product, the rate of production can be fairly slow to begin with, but as they make more of the items or more batches of the items and the task becomes more repetitive, they will become faster and therefore the average time taken to make each unit or batch will decrease and the labour cost per unit will drop. This decrease in time taken is called the learning curve effect and it can be demonstrated in graphical form as seen here where the vertical axis is the time taken to make each unit or batch and the horizontal axis is the volume of production. As the volume produced increases the time taken per unit or batch drops initially quite quickly and then slowing as the effect of the learning curve effect starts to diminish. Once the workforce are up to their optimum speed the labour cost per unit will plateau as they spend on average the same amount of time on each unit or batch as can be seen on the graph. When producing budgets we need to consider these changes in the labour costs to ensure the budgets are as accurate as possible given the information available to us. This learning curve effect won't work for all businesses or for all production scenarios. It works best when the following factors are in place. A motivated workforce who are keen to work at a fast pace and are keen to learn. And there needs to be a low turnover of workers as well, so that each of the workers have time to learn the process and then speed up. If the workers on the production line are continually changing, there is constant training needed and therefore the learning curve effect will be minimal. The production process itself must be a repetitive one. Clearly if the process keeps changing then the employees continually have more to learn and the learning curve effect is massively diminished. The production process needs to be labour intensive. If machines are being used for the majority of the process they will work at the same pace with large or small volumes and at both the start of the new production process and some time after the process has been in place. And the production process in question must be a new one to the business. If the same production process has been used for some time and we are merely tweaking the process, then clearly there will be little learning effect seen. 
The basic idea of the calculations we need to perform is to consider the percentage decrease in the cumulative amount of time it takes each time that the output doubles. So, for example, if we start off making 100 units in a batch, and that takes 500 hours, we want to know how long it would take to make 200 units, or two batches. Assuming that the learning curve effect is working, we would expect the 200 units to take less than 1,000 hours. That is two batches at 500 hours per batch. Let's assume it takes a total of 800 hours to make the 200 units. This tells us that the learning effect has resulted in it taking 200 fewer hours to make all 200 units. This is a drop of 20% compared to the 1,000 hours it would have taken based on the original 500 hours for the first batch of 100 units. We would therefore state that the learning curve effect is 80%, that being 100% minus the 20% decrease in time taken. Let's continue with this simple example to demonstrate how the learning curve effect would work as production volumes increase. So, if it takes 500 hours to make 100 units, and the learning curve effect is 80%, how long does it take to make 800 units? The easiest way to approach this is to put together a table where we will record the cumulative number of units in the left hand column, the cumulative average time taken to make those units in the middle column, and the cumulative total time taken to make all units in the right hand column. The starting point in this example is the initial batch of 100 units that took a total of 500 hours to make so 5 hours each. We then need to double up the quantity being made to 200 units. As already discussed, these took a total of 800 hours, but let's break this down following the approach we need to use for the learning curve calculations. We know that the learning curve effect is 80%, so the cumulative average time taken to make a single unit can be calculated as 5 hours multiplied by 80% giving 4 hours per unit, and hence the cumulative total time of 800 hours. If we double our quantity again, we can see this in action once more. So now we are making 400 units, and the cumulative average time will now be the 4 hours previously calculated for 200 units, multiplied by 80%, giving 3.2 hours per unit. So to make 400 units, the total cumulative time will be 400 multiplied by 3.2 hours, a total of 1,280 hours. Following this principle once more, we arrive at the 800 units required in the question. So now the cumulative average time taken to make a single unit will be 3.2 hours multiplied by 80%, 2.56 hours. And the cumulative total time will be 800 units multiplied by the 2.56 hours so 2048 hours. Whilst this process will continue to work indefinitely, it is a very long-winded process once you get beyond around three or four accumulations. So now we are going to look at a formula that can be used to speed this calculation process up. The formula we are going to use is y equals ax to the power of b, where y is the cumulative average time taken to make x units, x is the cumulative number of units made, a is the time taken to produce the first unit, or batch, and b is the learning factor, calculated as log lr divided by log 2. lr is the learning rate as a decimal, so if the learning rate is 80%, lr would be 0.8. The log button can be found on your scientific calculator. Please take some time now to ensure you know where the button is. If necessary, pause this video so that you have time to find the button. Let's use this formula to demonstrate how we can use the same data from the previous example and arrive at the same answer of 2048 hours for 800 units based on initial make time of 5 hours per unit and a learning rate of 0.8 or 80%. So, in our example, A is 5 hours, and X is 8 batches of 100 units. B needs to be calculated using the formula of log LR divided by log 2. 
Notice that we are not stating x as 800 units, but as the number of 100 unit batches that are being made. This distinction is extremely important if you are to arrive at the correct answer. We need to calculate B before we can put the formula together, so let's do that first. The formula will be log 0.8 divided by log 2, giving minus 0.32192809488. Try to store the full number in your calculator rather than rounding it up or down to a few decimal places. You will get a different answer with a rounded figure. Now that we have B, we can put the full formula together. Y equals 5 multiplied by 8 to the power of minus 0.321928098. This gives us 2.56 hours per unit, as calculated using the tabular method, and also the same cumulative total of 2,048 hours for the 800 units as previously calculated. The last area we need to look at is what happens once the learning curve effect has more or less disappeared and we have reached something called the steady state. This happens when machines become efficient and restrict improvements, machines reach the limit of safe running speeds, or the labour force have reached maximum working speeds. This can be seen when the calculations we performed earlier show little or no change in the cumulative average time taken to produce a single unit or batch as the quantities continue to increase. Once the steady state has been reached, the average time taken to produce a single unit or batch can then be used for all future budgeting, costing and pricing purposes. We can demonstrate this steady state scenario with a numerical example. In this example, the first batch of a new product took 100 hours to produce, with a learning rate of 75%. If the learning curve effect effectively stops at 21 batches, what time per batch should we use in budgets for the future batches? We can use the formula already covered to help with this. In this scenario, A is 100 hours and X is 21 batches. B will be log 0.75 divided by log 2, which is minus 0.4150374499. Putting the formula together therefore gives us 100 multiplied by 21 to the power of minus 0.4150374499. The answer will therefore be 28.26 hours per batch and a total time of 593 hours, calculated as 22.6 hours multiplied by 21 batches. To then work out the length of time taken to make batch 21, the first thing we need to do is work out how long it takes to make 20 batches, using the same basic formula as above, the only change being that x is now 20 rather than 21. So this time y will equal 100 multiplied by 20 to the power of minus 0.4150374499, giving a cumulative average time per batch of 28.84 hours and a total time of 577 hours. The difference between this and the 593 hours taken to make 21 batches is the time taken for the 21st batch, 16 hours. A massive drop from the initial 100 hours for the first batch. This 16 hour budgeted production time can be applied to any budgets from batch 21 onwards. To extend this further, we can also work out the total time taken to make, say, 45 batches. We know from our previous calculation that the total cumulative time to make 20 batches is 577 hours, and we also know that every batch from 21 onwards will be budgeted to take 16 hours. So if we add together the 577 hours and 25 batches at 16 hours per batch, we get a total time for 45 batches of 977 hours. In the last module, we introduced you to the topic of forecasting and looked at how to plot a scatter diagram and draw a line of best fit. In this module, we're going to look at linear functions in more detail and also at a technique 
known as linear regression analysis. Linear regression analysis is a method which is used to establish the equation of a straight line or a linear function. We have already said that it is possible to forecast future costs and revenues by establishing the linear function or the equation of a straight line. The equation of a straight line, as you already know, can be written as follows. y equals a plus bx. You will remember from the previous module that y is also known as the dependent variable. a is the point at which the straight line crosses the y-axis, b is the gradient of the straight line, and x is the independent variable. It is possible to express a semi-variable cost in terms of a linear function. If y equals a plus bx, then total semi-variable cost equals fixed cost plus the variable cost per unit multiplied by the number of units. Linear regression analysis is a statistical technique which is commonly used to establish the equation of a straight line. Therefore, if a set of data is plotted on a graph and a line of best fit is drawn through the points, then the equation of this straight line, y equals a plus bx, can be established using the following equations. a equals sigma y over n minus b sigma x over n and b equals n sigma xy minus sigma x multiplied by sigma y divided by n sigma x squared minus sigma x all squared. Note that the sign sigma is used to mean the sum of in order to make sense of these equations and to understand how linear regression analysis works, let's revisit our example regarding Muhammad's electricity charges at varying levels of electricity usage. As we have already seen, Muhammad makes ceramic vases in a small workshop which he owns. He has to pay for the electricity that he uses in his workshop. Electricity costs, as you know, usually behave as semi-variable costs because there is a standing charge which is fixed and a variable cost per unit of electricity used. During months 1 to 4, Muhammad used 120, 140, 90 and 110 units and was charged $14, $15, $12.50 and $13.50 respectively. These charges are shown in the table. We can use this information in order to establish the linear function that can enable us to forecast the total cost of electricity at varying levels of electricity usage. In order to do this, we must first establish the independent variable, which is the x the number of units of electricity used, and y, the dependent variable, which is the total electricity charge. This is because the total electricity charge is dependent on the number of units of electricity used. The next thing that we need to do is to calculate values for sigma y, sigma x, sigma xy, and sigma x squared. Sigma x is found by totaling the individual data for the usage of electricity each month, which is 120 plus 140 plus 90 plus 110, which equals 460. Similarly, sigma y is found by totaling the individual data for the total electricity charge each month which is 14 plus 15 plus 12.5 plus 
plus 13.5, which equals 55. Sigma x therefore equals 460, and sigma y therefore equals 55. We can expand our table of data as follows in order to calculate values for sigma xy and sigma x squared. Sigma xy is found by multiplying x by y, or the number of electricity units used by the total electricity charge. In month 1, the value of xy is 120 multiplied by 14, which equals 1680. In month 2, the value of xy is 140 multiplied by 15, which equals 2100. In month 3, the value of xy is 90 multiplied by 12.5, which equals 1125. And finally, in month 4, the value of xy is 110 multiplied by 13.5, which equals 1485. The value of sigma xy is therefore the sum of the individual values of x multiplied by y, which is 1680 plus 2100 plus 1125 plus 1485, which equals 6390. Similarly, sigma x squared is found by multiplying x by x, or the number of electricity units used squared. In month 1, the value of x squared is 120 multiplied by 120, which equals 14,400. In month 2, the value of x squared is 140 multiplied by 140, which equals 19,600. In month 3, the value of x squared is 90 multiplied by 90, which equals 8,100. And finally, in month 4, the value of x squared is 110 multiplied by 110, which equals 12,100. The value of sigma x squared is therefore the sum of the individual values for x squared for each month, which is 14,400 plus 19,600 plus 8,100 plus 12,100, which equals 54,200. Since there are four sets of data, n equals 4. We now have all of the values that we need in order to establish the linear function. First, let's look at the equation a equals sigma y divided by n minus b multiplied by sigma x divided by n. It is apparent that we cannot calculate a value for a until we have calculated a value for b, because we need to know the value of b in order to calculate a value for a. Let us therefore calculate a value for b using the equation b equals n sigma xy minus sigma x sigma y divided by n sigma x squared minus sigma x all squared. b therefore equals 4 multiplied by 6390 minus 460 multiplied by 55 divided by 4 multiplied by 54200 minus 460 squared which is 25560 minus 25300 divided by 216800 minus 
211,600, which equals 260 divided by 5,200, which equals 0 0.05. B is equal to the variable cost per unit, which is therefore 0 0.05 Note that the variable cost per unit is equivalent to the gradient of the straight line. Now that we have calculated the value of B to be 0 0.05, we are in a position to calculate a value for A using the equation A equals sigma y divided by n minus B multiplied by sigma x divided by n. A therefore equals 55 divided by 4 minus 0 0.05 multiplied by 460 divided by 4 which equals 13.75 minus 23 divided by 4 which equals 13.75 minus 5.75 which equals 8. A is equal to the fixed electricity charge, which is therefore $8. We can therefore conclude that the semi-variable total electricity charge is made up of a fixed cost of $8 plus a variable charge of $0.05 per unit of electricity used. The total semi-variable electricity charge therefore equals $8 plus $0.05 multiplied by the number of units of electricity used or Y equals $8 plus $0.05 multiplied by X where Y equals the total electricity charge and X equals the number of units of electricity used. Now that we have established the linear function for total electricity charges, we can use this equation in order to forecast the total electricity charge when a given number of units of electricity are used. For example, let us use this equation in order to forecast the total charge when 150 units of electricity are used or when x, the independent variable, is equal to 150. When x equals 150, then y equals $8 plus 0 0.05 multiplied by x. Therefore, y equals $8 plus 0 0.05 multiplied by 150, which equals $8 plus $7.50, which equals $15.5. The eagle-eyed amongst you might recognize this figure of $15.5 as being the same as the value that was calculated in the previous module when we extrapolated a scatter diagram of the same data in order to estimate the total electricity charge when 150 units of electricity were used. In this module, we have continued our study of forecasting and looked at linear functions in more detail, as we have studied a technique known as linear regression analysis. We have used linear regression analysis to establish the equation of a straight line or a linear function, and then use this result in order to forecast future costs. In the next module, we are going to continue our study of forecasting and look at the topic of correlation and show you how to calculate a correlation coefficient. Correlation is an indication of how related two variables are. And the correlation coefficient is a measure of how related two variables are. In the last module, we took a further look at linear functions when we studied a technique known as linear regression analysis. 
we use linear regression analysis in order to establish the linear function or equation of a straight line and then use this result in order to forecast future costs. In this module, we are going to continue our study of forecasting and look at the topic of correlation. In simple terms, correlation is an indication of how related two variables are. We can measure the degree of correlation between two variables by calculating a correlation coefficient. The calculation of a correlation coefficient involves the use of another complicated looking formula, similar to the ones that we introduced you to in the previous module. Hopefully, now that you have seen how to use the linear regression analysis formulae without too much difficulty, you will appreciate that if you plug the correct values into the equations, that they are nothing to be afraid of. We can draw a scatter diagram by plotting a series of points on a graph as we saw earlier with the electricity charges for Muhammad's workshop. Once we have drawn a scatter diagram, then we can draw a line of best fit by joining up the points with a straight line. Here is a scatter diagram that we drew for the electricity charges in Muhammad's workshop. In this scatter diagram, there is an upward sloping line, which means that as the value of one variable in this case the number of units of electricity increases, the value of the other variable or the total electricity charges in this situation increases as well. This graph shows that there is an exact linear relationship between the points that we have plotted and we therefore have perfect positive correlation. There are also some other types of scatter diagram which represent different degrees of correlation and are different to the graph showing perfect positive correlation that we have just seen. This scatter diagram shows a downward sloping line which means that as the value of one variable increases the value of the other variable decreases. This graph shows that there is an exact linear relationship between the points that we have plotted, but it is downward sloping and we therefore have perfect negative correlation. An example of perfect negative correlation might be sales of umbrellas and the number of days of sunshine in a month. It stands to reason that if the weather is sunny and dry, then there is likely to be a low demand for umbrellas. These two variables are likely to be perfectly negatively correlated, which means that as the value of one variable increases, the value of the other variable decreases. In situations where there isn't an exact relationship between the points plotted on a scatter diagram, and we can't join all of the points up to make a straight line, we can draw a line of best fit through the points that we have plotted by estimating the general direction of the data. The line shown here is an upward sloping line, which means that as the value of one variable increases, the value of the other variable tends to increase as well. This graph shows that there is a vague linear relationship between the points that we have plotted and we therefore have partial positive correlation. If we plot a series of points on a scatter diagram and the graph shows that there isn't an exact relationship between the points plotted and we can't join all of the points up to make a straight line, then we can draw a line of best fit by estimating the general direction of the data. The line shown here is a downward sloping line which means that as the value of one variable increases, the value of the other variable seems to decrease. This graph shows that there is a vague linear relationship between the points that we have plotted and we therefore have partial negative correlation. Finally, when we plot a series of data and we can't see any possible relationship between the points plotted, 
We can therefore conclude that there is no correlation. A scatter diagram showing variables which are not correlated is shown here. There is also a statistical technique that we can use in order to measure the degree of correlation between two variables. The correlation coefficient r measures the degree of correlation between variables and is calculated using the following formula. The correlation coefficient r equals n sigma xy minus sigma x sigma y divided by the square root of n sigma x squared minus sigma x all squared multiplied by n sigma y squared minus sigma y all squared. Let's now revisit our example relating to the electricity charges incurred at Muhammad's workshop in order to demonstrate how to calculate the correlation coefficient r and to interpret how closely related the total electricity charges to the number of units of electricity used. In the previous module we established values for sigma x, sigma y, sigma xy and sigma x squared. These results are shown here and we can use them to calculate the correlation coefficient r. However, in order to calculate the correlation coefficient r, we also need to know the value of sigma y squared. We can therefore extend our table of data as follows in order to determine the value of sigma y squared. y squared is found by multiplying y by y, or the total electricity charge squared. In month 1, the value of y squared is 14 multiplied by 14, which equals 196. In month 2, the value of y squared is 15 multiplied by 15, which equals 225. In month 3, the value of y squared is 12.5 multiplied by 12.5 which equals 156.25 and finally in month 4 the value of y squared is 13.5 multiplied by 13.5 which equals 182.25 the value of sigma y squared is therefore the sum of the individual values of y squared for each month, which is 196 plus 225 plus 156.25 plus 182.25, which equals 759.5. Since there are four sets of data, n equals 4. We now have all of the values that we need in order to calculate the correlation coefficient. Sigma x equals 460. Sigma y equals 55. Sigma xy equals 6390. Sigma x squared equals 54200 and sigma y squared equals 759.5. The degree of correlation, or the correlation coefficient r, is calculated using the formula shown. Therefore, r equals 4 multiplied by 6390 minus 460 multiplied by 55 divided by the square root of 4 multiplied by 54,200 minus 460 squared multiplied by 4 multiplied by 759.5 minus 55 squared which is 25,560 minus 25,300 divided by the square root of 216,800 
minus 211,600 multiplied by 3,038 minus 3,025, which equals 260 divided by the square root of 5,200 multiplied by 13, which equals 260 divided by the square root of 67,600, which equals 260 divided by 260, which equals 1. So what does a correlation coefficient of 1 mean? Well, if we have another look at the scatter diagram for Muhammad's electricity charges that we plotted earlier, we can see that it shows that there is perfect positive correlation between the two variables, the number of units of electricity used, and the total electricity charges. A correlation coefficient of 1 therefore shows that there is perfect positive correlation and that the variables are strongly related to each other. Let's have another look at the scatter diagrams showing different degrees of correlation that we showed you earlier and the values of the correlation coefficients that are associated with them. This scatter diagram shows perfect negative correlation. When data is perfectly negatively correlated, it has a correlation coefficient equal to minus 1. This scatter diagram shows partial positive correlation. When two variables are partially positively correlated, then the value of the correlation coefficient is between 0 and plus 1. This scatter diagram shows partial negative correlation. When two variables have partial negative correlation, the value of the correlation coefficient is between 0 and minus 1. This scatter diagram shows a visual representation of two variables that are not correlated. When there is no correlation between two variables, it has a correlation coefficient that is equal to 0. In this module, we are going to extend what we have learned in earlier modules, scatter diagrams, lines of best fit, and linear regression analysis, as we continue our study of forecasting and look at time series analysis. In simple terms, a time series is a series of data which is recorded over a period of time. For example, the number of gold medals scored by a country at the Olympics over the past 20 Olympics. In a business situation, you are more likely to come across time series which are concerned with the sales revenue or expenditure of an organisation over a number of months, quarters or years. Let's have a look at an example. The Bakeaway Co is a chain of shops that sells cake baking equipment. Every year a fundraising bake sale is held when individuals and organisations sell cakes in aid of charity. The period when the national bake sale occurs usually sees an increase in demand for cake baking equipment. The following data relate to the Bakeaway Co and show the sales revenue figures for quarters 1 to 12. The table shows that there is a peak in sales revenue once every four quarters, in quarters 2, 6 and 10. This is because the national bake sale occurs once a year and there are four quarters in a year. Let's revisit the Bakeaway Co's sales revenue figures which are shown in the following table. We can plot this data on a time series graph as follows. To start drawing the time series graph, we plot the first point at 1, 2, 20, which represents quarter 1 and sales revenue of $220,000. The next point to plot is 2, 3, 10. We continue plotting the data that is shown in the table in order to create the following time series graph. 
Notice that there are peaks in the graph at points A, B and C, which represent the increase in sales revenue from cake baking equipment prior to the bake sales, which take place every four quarters or once a year. We can also draw a line of best fit, or a trend line, which is represented by the green line on our graph, and which shows the general trend of the Bakeaway Co's sales revenue. In this situation, there is a general increase in sales revenue, which is shown by the upward sloping trend line on the time series graph. Let's take a closer look at the time series graph that we have just plotted. The line of best fit, as we have already said, represents the general trend of the data and is known as the trend line on the time series graph. We can see the occurrence of peaks at A, B and C when sales are maximised. These peaks represent maximum sales revenue prior to the bake sales which happen once a year. These occur at regular intervals and are known as seasonal variations on the time series graph. The trend and seasonal variations are two of the main elements of a time series. In addition to the trend and seasonal variations, there are two other elements of a time series, cyclical variations and random variations. Cyclical variations are irregular variations which occur in the medium to long term. For example, you may have heard of the boom-bust cycle which commonly occurs in the economic environment at regular intervals. Random variations, on the other hand, are not as predictable as seasonal and cyclical variations. Such variations might occur when a successful advertising campaign is launched and brings about an increase in sales. We can summarise, therefore, that the four main components of a time series are the trend, seasonal variations, cyclical variations and random variations. Since the trend and any seasonal variations are the elements of a time series that can be predicted, it is these elements that are therefore of use to us in forecasting future costs and revenues. We have already seen how we can estimate the trend of data by drawing the line of best fit and extending it to make forecasts of future data. Another method that is commonly used in forecasting future costs and revenues is the use of linear regression analysis in order to establish the equation of the line of best fit. Let's look at another example. We can establish that the linear function of a trend line for ABC Co's total cost for quarter 1 to 36 is y equals 500,000 plus 11 multiplied by the quarter number, where y equals total cost and x equals the quarter number. We can therefore forecast the total cost trend for quarter 8 to be y equals 500,000 plus 11 multiplied by 8. y therefore equals 500,000 plus 88,000 which equals 588,000 or $588,000. There is also another method that is sometimes used to predict future costs and revenues and this is known as the moving averages method. A moving average is established by calculating a series of averages in order to estimate the trend of a series of data. We have already used the sales revenue data for the Bakeaway Co for quarters 1 to 12 in order to draw a line of best fit which shows a visual representation of the trend of the sales data. In the next module we will use this data in order to establish the trend using moving averages for the Bakeaway Co's sales revenue over a period of time. In this session we are going to expand on our knowledge of variances and start breaking the material usage variance down further into material mix and material yield variances. We are going to calculate the variances and identify potential reasons for them as well as defining what the variances are.
Before we start looking at these new variances, let's briefly remind ourselves of the different material variances that can be calculated. The main variances that we would ordinarily see are the material price and material usage variances. The price variance, as the name suggests, tells us whether we have spent more or less than planned on the material we have bought and used within the production process, whilst the usage variance tells us whether we have used more or less than planned. We always compare actual costs and usage with the standard costs and usage to calculate these figures. As already highlighted, we are now going to take the material usage variance and break it down into a material mix and a material yield variance. In simple terms, the material mix variance will give us more information on the financial impact of the cost of using different proportions or mixes of materials and the yield variance measures the impact of the different materials on the output, or yield, from using those materials. There is clearly a balance to be achieved with these two variances, to ensure that the cost of the material being used is balanced with the efficiency of the materials being used. Let's now look at the material mix variance in more detail. The formula we are going to use to calculate this is the actual quantity used multiplied by the actual mix, minus the actual quantity used multiplied by the standard mix. The net of these is then multiplied by the standard cost. We can turn this into what we did use minus what we would have used according to the standard mix. Again, the net figure is multiplied by the standard cost. We need to perform this calculation for each material in the mix and then total them together to find the total material mix variance. So let's look at a quick example to see this in action. A product is made using two materials, A and B. The standard cost card for the product shows that the standard mix is 2 kilograms of A costing $5 per kilogram and 4 kilograms of B costing $8 per kilogram. The standard mix is therefore 2 A's to 4 B's. During the month of November 100 units of the product were made using 250 kilograms of A and 370 kilograms of B. If we put this information into a table, we can calculate the mix variances for A and B, and therefore the overall material mix variance for making the 100 units of product. In the case of A, we actually used 250 kilograms, and for B, we actually used 370 kilograms. In total, we therefore used 620 kilograms of material. Applying the standard mix of 2 to 4 to this 620 kilograms, we can work out what the quantity of A and B should have been based on the standard mix. The total material used still needs to total 620 kilograms. So using the 2 to 4 ratio, this gives us 206 kilograms for A and 414 kilograms for B. Comparing these figures to the actual usage, we can see that we have used 44 kilograms more of A and 44 kilograms less of B than the standard mix. Notice that these differences cancel each other out. This will always be the case given that we have applied the standard mix to the total actual usage. Where usage of one material goes up, the other must go down. Otherwise the total standard usage won't match the total actual usage. We now need to multiply these differences by the standard cost for A of $5 per kilogram and for B of $8 per kilogram. This gives us an adverse variance of $220 for material A, as we have used more than the standard mix quantity, and a favourable variance of $352 for material B, as we have used less than the standard mix quantity. The overall material mix variance is therefore $132 favourable. It is a favourable overall variance, as we have used less of the more expensive material and more of the cheaper material and therefore the overall cost is lower than what we would have expected if the mix of materials had followed the standard mix. Moving on to the material yield variance. As already covered, this tells us whether the output we have achieved with the materials that have been put into the process is more or less than the standard output. The formula we are going to use this time is the actual quantity per the standard mix minus the standard quantity multiplied by the standard mix. The net figure is then, as before, multiplied by the standard cost. 
or alternatively what we actually used according to the standard mix minus what we should have used per the standard mix multiplied by the standard cost. Notice that the first part of this calculation is the same figure as was used in the material mix variance. Let's use the same example as for the material mix variance to see this in action. As a quick reminder, here are the standard costs and actual usage as per the previous slide. We need to put together a similar table to the one we used for the material mix variance, but this time of course we will be comparing slightly different figures. In the first column we are going to re-input the data that we used in the material mix calculations. So the standard mix based on the total usage of 620 kilograms. This is the 206 kilograms of A and 414 kilograms of B calculated using the 2 to 4 standard mix. In the next column along we need to work out what we should have used to make the 100 units that we have made. Remember each unit is expected to use 2 kilograms of A and 4 kilograms of B. So we should have used 200 kilograms of A and 400 kilograms of B to make 100 units. This gives rise to a difference of 6 kilograms for A and 14 kilograms for B. In both cases we have used more than expected, so the variances will be adverse. Multiplying these material volumes by their standard cost gives us a $30 adverse variance for material A and a $112 adverse variance for material B and an overall yield variance of $142 adverse. This adverse yield variance may well have come about because we have used a different mix compared to the expected mix, resulting in us using more of the cheaper material. The lower cost of material A might suggest that the material is of a lower quality than material B and that there may have been more wastage and extra time spent on reworking products due to the lower quality materials. This will result in the output volumes being lower than expected based on the volume of material that has been input and therefore yield will decrease. Cost and quality are key considerations and need to be balanced when determining the mix of materials to use and these are highlighted through the mix and yield variances. The variances therefore provide management with useful information that will help them determine the best mix for the production process and for the business. As already mentioned, combining the material mix and material yield variances together gives us the material usage variance. So for completeness and to prove this point, let's now calculate the material usage variance using the numbers in our example. It should of course be $10 adverse as the mix variance is $132 favourable and the yield variance is $142 adverse, giving a net figure of $10 adverse. The usage variance is calculated as the actual usage compared to the standard usage for the actual output volume multiplied by the standard cost. Again we need to perform this calculation for each material involved and then add the two variances together. So as before, we will put a table together to help us. In the first column, we re-input the actual quantities used of A and B per the data from the scenario. So 250 kilograms of A and 370 kilograms of B. Remember this was also used in the material mix variance calculation. In the second column, we then need the standard usage for the output of 100 units as used in the material yield variance calculation. 200 kilograms of A and 400 kilograms of B. Comparing these figures gives us a difference of 50 kilograms for A and 30 kilograms for B. We have used more of A than anticipated and less of B, so multiplying these volumes by their standard cost gives us an adverse variance of $250 for A and a favourable variance of $240 for B. The total material usage variance is therefore $10 adverse matching that calculated by combining the mix and yield variances. This session looks at the sales mix and sales quantity variances. In the same way that the materials mix and material yield variances are used to help break down the materials usage variance further, we can use the sales mix and sales quantity variances to break down the sales volume variance and dig deeper into the reasons for an adverse or favourable variance. We will look at the calculations that need to be performed to find these variances 
and we will consider reasons for the variances being adverse or favourable, as well as demonstrating the relationship between a sales mix and sales quantity variances and the sales volume variance. The sales mix variance looks at the proportions of each product actually sold compared to the proportions we expected to sell when setting our budgets, and the sales quantity variance looks at the difference in the contribution or profit generated by a change in the sales volume of each product compared to budgeted sales of those products. The sales mix variance is calculated as the actual quantity of each product sold, minus the total quantity sold based on the standard mix multiplied by the standard contribution or profit per unit. This is basically the same formula as for the material mix variance, but instead of using standard cost per unit of material, we replace this with standard contribution or profit per unit. Alternatively, we could state this calculation as what we did sell compared to what we thought sales of each product would be using the standard mix, multiplied by the standard contribution or profit per unit. We use contribution or profit per unit rather than just the selling price per unit as we need to take into account the differences in the variable costs associated with each product as well. A product with a high selling price might sound like a better option if we want to increase our profit, but if the variable costs are very high as well, then it might be better to sell a lower priced product with low variable costs as this might generate more profit for us overall. By comparing contribution figures per unit, this issue is dealt with within the calculations. Let's demonstrate this with an example. Biscuit & Co Limited make and sell two biscuits, the cookie and the bar. Sales of the cookie are forecast to be 5,000 units, and sales of the bar are forecast to be 8,000 units. The standard mix is therefore five cookies to eight bars. The contribution generated by each is 50 cents per cookie, and 40 cents per bar. Actual sales were 4,900 cookies and 8,500 bars. The sales mix variance is found by comparing what we did sell with the same total volume of 13,400 units but at the standard mix of 5 cookies to 8 bars. This gives us a standard sales mix of 5,154 cookies and 8,246 bars. We have therefore sold 254 fewer cookies than under the standard mix, and 254 more bars than under the standard mix. As for the material mix, you will notice that the differences are equal and opposite, and this will always be the case with the sales mix and material mix variances. Applying the standard contribution to these differences gives us a variance of $127 for cookies, this is adverse as we have sold fewer than per the standard mix, and a variance of $101.60 for bars. This time this is favourable as we have sold more bars than per the standard mix. The overall sales mix variance is therefore $25.40 adverse. It is adverse because the figures tell us that we have sold fewer of the more profitable cookies and more of the less profitable bars than we would have done under the standard mix, and therefore we have made less profit overall. The sales quantity variance is calculated in a similar way to the material yield calculation. We take the actual quantity sold in the standard mix proportions, the same figures we have just used in the second column of the sales mix variance calculation, and compare this to the forecast sales, and then multiply the difference by the standard contribution or profit. Again, we use contribution or profit rather than selling price to take into account the differences in variable costs in each product. If we use the same example as before, we can see this in action. The total volume sold in the proportions of the standard mix is 5,154 cookies and 8,246 bars, whilst the forecast figures were 5,000 cookies and 8,000 bars. This gives rise to a difference of 154 cookies and 246 bars. In both cases we have sold more than forecast, so the variances will be favourable. The variances are calculated using the standard contribution of 50 cents for a cookie and 40 cents for a bar, giving $77 favourable for cookies and $98.40 favourable for bars, and therefore an overall favourable variance of $175.40.
the overall variance is favourable because we have sold more of both products. Both products generate a positive contribution and therefore profits will be higher than forecast. So now we just need to prove that the total of the sales mix and sales quantity variances equals the sales volume variance. We know that the sales mix variance in our example is $25.40 adverse and the sales quantity variance is $175.40 favourable. So the sales volume variance should be $150 favourable. If we calculate the sales volume variance using our normal approach, we will arrive at the same figure. Remember that the sales volume variance is calculated as what we did sell compared to what we thought we would sell, multiplied by the appropriate standard contribution per unit. In this case, we did sell 4,900 cookies and 8,500 bars, whilst we thought we would sell 5,000 cookies and 8,000 bars. So we have sold 100 fewer cookies than forecast and 500 more bars than forecast. If we apply the standard contribution figures to these volumes, this gives us an adverse variance of $50 for cookies and a favourable variance of $200 for bars and a total volume variance of $150 favourable, just as before. In this session we are going to look at how variances can be split based on how we originally produced our plan or budget, and how things have changed based on how we have operated our business. These variances are called the planning and operational variances, and they can be used to break down the sales, materia or labour variances further to find out more about why our actual costs and revenues differ from those originally budgeted. Before we consider the variances themselves, we will look at how to calculate a revised budget and think about the factors resulting in us revising the budget. We will then move on to look at the calculations needed for the planning and operational variances and cover why these variances may have arisen. The first area to look at then is the revised budget. A budget should be revised when there are factors outside of the business's control that impact on the original budgeted figures. So this might be that there has been an issue with a supplier and therefore purchases haven't been received when expected or in the volumes expected in the original budget. Or it might be as a result of an unexpected increase in material prices, or workers going on strike, or the government setting a new unexpected minimum wage or a new competitor coming to market, meaning that we had to reduce our selling price. By revising the budget for these factors, we can then focus on what we could control within the business and how well we performed against these controllable costs and revenues. When revising the budget for direct costs, we do so by flexing the budgeted costs for the actual volume of units produced. So if the volume has risen, material and labour costs will have naturally been expected to rise. We will also flex the budget for any changes outside of management control, as mentioned above. The difference between these flexed figures and the original budgeted figures are therefore classed as planning variances. Any difference from the flexed budget to actual costs is deemed to be controlled by management and is therefore an operational variance. Where sales volumes have increased or decreased from the original budget, we only flex the budget for changes in the size of the market as a whole as this was out of our control. The planning variance is therefore calculated based on the size of the market, whilst the operational variance is based on our market share of that smaller or larger market base. So now that we know the difference between a planning and an operational variance, let's see how this works with some numbers. We will consider the material and labour variances to demonstrate this. Budgeted output of a product was set at 25,000 units, with a material cost of $2 per kilogram and a standard usage of 1 kilogram per unit. Labour costs were budgeted at $7 per hour, with each unit having a standard labour time of half an hour per unit, giving a standard labour cost per unit of $3.50. This gives a budgeted material cost of $50,000. 25,000 units at $2 per unit, and a budgeted labour cost of $87,500, 25,000 units at $3.50 per unit. Actual output was 26,000 units, with a total material cost of $51,000. 
material usage was 24,000 kilograms. The total labor cost was $94,000 based on paying the workers for 14,000 hours. We can see from this that whilst we budgeted to make 25,000 units, we actually made 26,000 units, and we would therefore expect our material and labour costs to be higher than budgeted, as we have made more units. If we flex the budget to reflect the increased volume, this gives a revised materials cost of $52,000, that is 26,000 units multiplied by $2 per unit, and a revised labour cost of $91,000, being the 26,000 units multiplied by $3.50. Comparing these flexed figures to the original budget, we can see that the material planning variance is $52,000 minus $50,000, so $2,000, and the labour planning variance is $91,000 minus $87,500, so $3,500. If we then compare the flexed budget to the actual costs, we can find the operational variances. So this will be $1,000 favourable for materials, the $52,000 flexed cost minus the actual cost of $51,000, and $3,000 adverse for labour, the $91,000 flexed cost compared to the actual cost of $94,000. These calculations find us the total material and labour planning and operational variances, so we now need to look at breaking this down further to find the planning and operational usage and price material variances, and efficiency and rate labour variances. Rather than covering both materials and labour, and given the principles are the same for both, we will just look at materials to demonstrate the usage variance being split into planning and operational variances and the price variance also being split. For both calculations we need some additional information, the revised standard cost and the revised standard usage. These are 1.1 kg per unit and $1.80 per kilogram. The budget would only be flexed for these changes in the standard cost if it is felt that this was out of our control and the changes were not known when the original budget was set. Looking at the price variance first of all, we can work out the total price variance to be what we thought we would spend on the actual volume purchased, compared to what we did spend. In our example, the expected cost will be $2 per kilogram, multiplied by the 24,000 kilograms that were purchased, so $48,000. Comparing this to the $51,000 that we actually spent gives us an adverse variance of $3,000. We now want to break this down into the planning and operational variances. The planning variance is the difference between the original standard cost of $2 per kilogram and the revised standard cost of $1.80 per kilogram. If we apply this difference of 20 cents to the total volume purchased of 24,000 kilograms, this gives us a price planning variance of $4,800 favourable, as the price per kilogram was lower than the original budget. To find the price operational variance, we need to compare the revised standard cost of $1.80 per kilogram with what we actually paid. $1.80 multiplied by the volume purchased of 24,000 kilograms gives us an expected cost of $43,200, but we actually paid $51,000. So now we see that the operational variance is $7,800 adverse. Offsetting this with the $4,800 favourable planning variance gives us the total price variance previously calculated as $3,000 adverse. What is important to note here is that the planning variance is favourable, but the operational variance is adverse, and it is this overspend of $7,800 on materials that needs to be investigated, as it would appear that management are not controlling the cost of their material purchases. We can apply similar logic for the materials usage variance. Again, if we calculate this in total, we can then demonstrate how we can break this down into the planning and operational variances. The materials usage variance looks at what we would expect to use based on the actual production volumes compared to what we did use. So in this case, the expected usage would be one kilogram per unit. Given that we produced 26,000 units, the usage would therefore be expected to be 26,000 kilograms. 
we actually use just 24,000 kilograms. We then need to apply the original standard cost of $2 to this difference of 2,000 kilograms to give us a usage variance of $4,000 favourable. Remember we have already dealt with cost changes so we do not want to incorporate them into our usage calculations which is why we use the original standard cost here. The variance is favourable as we have used less than originally expected. To calculate the usage planning variance we need to consider the change in the standard usage from 1 kg per unit to 1.1 kg per unit. As we made 26,000 units we would therefore have originally expected to use 26,000 kg, but under the revised standard usage we now expect to use 28,600 kg, an increase of 2,600 kg. Multiplying this by the original standard cost of $2 per kilogram gives us an adverse planning variance of $5,200. Comparing this revised expected usage of 28,600 kilograms against the actual usage of 24,000 kilograms shows that we have used 4,600 kilograms less than the revised standard usage. Again, multiplying this by the $2 standard cost per kilogram gives us a favourable operational variance of $9,200. Taking the favourable operational variance of $9,200 and deducting the adverse planning variance of $5,200 gives us a total usage variance of $4,000 favourable, matching the figure calculated earlier. As before, the important thing to note here is that management have ensured that the materials purchased have been used efficiently as we have used less than expected against the revised standard usage. The operational variance has identified this. It is of course possible that as we paid more for the materials than expected, as demonstrated by the price variances, that we have bought higher quality materials and as a result there has been less wastage and hence the more efficient use of the materials. We will now move on and look at the sales planning and operational variances. As mentioned earlier, the planning variance focuses on changes in the size of the market, whilst the operational variance looks at how we have fared within the market. These variances, when combined, will equal the sales volume variance. As with the material and labour variances we have just looked at, it is easier to see this in action with figures. So let's say that the budgeted sales volume was 10,000 units of froglets and that the budgeted contribution was $8.50 per froglet. The market for froglets and similar products increased by 10% in the year, and actual sales of froglets were 11,500 units. Given that the market has increased in size by 10%, we would expect sales of froglets to also increase by 10%. This would mean that we would expect to sell 11,000 units rather than the original budget of 10,000 units. This difference of 1,000 units then needs to be multiplied by the standard contribution of $8.50 per unit to find the planning or market size variance. This will be $8,500 favourable. An increase in the market size indicates that we have the ability to sell more than the original budget, meaning that we can generate more contribution and hence the increase is seen as favourable. We then need to compare this uplifted revised budgeted sales figure of 11,000 units to the actual sales volume of 11,500 units to find the operational or market share variance. We have sold 500 more units than the revised budget, so again we have a favourable variance. Multiplying these 500 units by the standard contribution of $8.50 gives us a favourable variance of $4,250. Calculating the overall sales volume variance, we need to compare actual and budgeted sales volumes and apply the standard contribution to the difference. So in our example, this will be 11,500 units of actual sales minus 10,000 units of budgeted sales multiplied by $8.50, giving us $12,750, the same figure as the market size and market share variance calculations added together. Notice that we are using contribution in these calculations and not selling price. If we sell more units than planned, then not only will our sales revenue increase, but our direct costs will also increase, so we need to take this into account in our variance calculations 
by using contribution rather than selling price. In this session we are going to discuss the use of variance analysis to analyse and evaluate the performance of a business and to focus on future improvement of a business. We will also cover factors that influence the behaviours of employees and managers and discuss how variances and standard costs might impact on their behaviour, motivation and actions. And we will also look at the issues of standard costing in a just-in-time and total quality management environment. We will not be covering the calculations associated with variance analysis on this video, so please see other videos on this topic area if you need to revise the calculations. As a brief reminder, variances are calculated by comparing budgeted figures with actual results, and they can highlight areas of concern and areas for improvement within the business. It is, however, crucial to consider variances alongside each other when using them for performance analysis, as an adverse variance in one area might have also resulted in a favourable variance elsewhere. So only considering the reasons behind the adverse or favourable variance does not look at the whole picture within the business. For example, we might have an adverse material price variance resulting from buying more expensive materials, but this might then have also resulted in less wastage of those materials, and therefore a favourable materials usage variance, and potentially a favourable labour efficiency variance too. Given this, it would be unfair to criticise the purchasing manager for the higher prices without also considering the impact the higher price might have had elsewhere within the business. Whilst it might initially seem as though material prices need to be reduced, if the favourable variances outweigh the adverse material price variance, then a better approach might be to change the standard cost for materials for all future budgeting purposes. From this you can see why variance analysis needs to be handled carefully if it is being used as a means of assessing management performance. If not handled appropriately by considering all factors surrounding a particular variance, then appraising management through variance analysis could result in some very demotivated members of staff, and the future performance of the business is likely to suffer. We can improve on the use of variances in management assessment by using the planning and operational variances that are covered in the more detail on the video on this topic area. By splitting variances down into these uncontrollable and controllable variances, management can be assessed based on those variances that they can control, which seems only fair and should result in the workforce being more motivated to ensure that actual results match or better the flexed budget. Ensuring that the standard cost being used within the initial budget is correct is also crucial to ensuring that 1. the initial budgets are as accurate as possible, and 2 that management are not being assessed against unrealistic targets, costs and revenues. So if standard costs are to be used to then calculate variances on which management will be assessed or targeted, we need to ensure that the standards being set are not too high. If they are too high, management will find it difficult to achieve them, and they may be deterred from even trying to achieve them. This is not only demotivating for the managers and their staff, but could also result in the business underperforming. Not too low. If the standard is too low and is therefore easy to achieve, this is likely to mean that management will not strive to achieve the best possible results. They may work towards merely achieving the budget rather than exceeding the budget. This can also result in staff and management becoming demotivated once they realise that the budget will be met with ease. Standards should therefore be attainable but challenging, so that management and staff can see that they can achieve the standards provided they work hard and work to improve the performance of their department or area. The video on standard costing goes into more detail on this topic area and covers the different ways of setting standards and how these methods impact on motivation and behaviour. We are now going to move on and look at standard costing in the modern manufacturing environment where just-in-time and total quality management are often key elements. Where a just-in-time production process is in place, there will be limited stock of raw materials, work in progress and finished goods, as materials are only acquired when an order is placed, 
and the finished goods are then immediately shipped to the customer on completion to fulfil the order. This limited level of stock means that there is no buffer stock if things go wrong, and it also means that our costs are covered quickly through a direct sale to a customer. We may also be producing one product one week and a different product another week, depending upon customer requirements. There is a direct link between this just-in-time process and total quality management, as the quality of the raw materials and the reliability of the supply chain and the production process is paramount to ensuring that materials arrive in the condition required, in the time scales required, and are produced at an appropriate speed and quality to fulfil the order as quickly as possible, thereby converting material costs into revenue and profit as soon as possible. Total quality management focuses on the customer and their needs rather than relying on predetermined levels of quality, wastage and so on. There is a strong emphasis on the cost of producing high quality items and on the idea that all areas of the business need to get things right the first time. Employees are deemed to be personally responsible for a defect free production process within their particular area and any reasons for defects should be identified and prevented for future production. What this means is that it doesn't really work to use standard costing and variance analysis in these modern manufacturing environments. There are a number of problems that arise if we do try to combine standard costs and variance analysis with total quality management and just-in-time processes. Firstly, variance analysis only looks at a narrow range of costs and revenues and it does not pay any attention to quality or customer satisfaction, both of which have already been highlighted as key elements in both total quality management and just-in-time systems. Secondly, standard costs only apply when we are producing high quantities of the same product over and over again. They are not suitable if we are adapting products to customer needs or producing different products on the same production line. Thirdly, there is too much emphasis on labour costs rather than machine costs, and given that most modern manufacturing environments are highly automated, this also isn't appropriate. Furthermore, production overheads are the main cost associated with modern manufacturing, and these tend to be ignored in standard costing. And finally, standard costing cannot cope with the ever-changing costs, products, processes and business environments associated with continually striving to improve the quality and speed of production, the products themselves and our competitive edge. Standard costs set last week may well be outdated already. The Balanced Scorecard is a management technique for assessing and communicating the performance of the business. This approach to appraising business performance was introduced by Kaplan and Norton in 1992. The balanced scorecard focuses on both financial and non-financial performance indicators and provides a link between an organisation's strategy and its short-term operations and performance measurements. It does this across four perspectives. Financial perspective. The financial perspective considers how the organisation can create value for its shareholders. The organisation might focus on increasing revenues, reducing costs or utilising its assets more efficiently. Its performance here might be measured in terms of increased net profit margin or perhaps increased return on investment or increased earnings per share. Of course other financial measures are also possible here. Customer perspective. The customer perspective considers how the organisation appears to its customers. The aim for the organisation is to achieve total customer satisfaction. It's important to understand that a link exists between the customer perspective and the financial perspective, in that a happy customer today should mean increased revenue and profits in the future. The organisation's performance here might be assessed by a reduction in the number of customer complaints, or an increase in the number of customer visits, or perhaps the percentage increase of on-time deliveries. Again, other non-financial performance measures are possible here, 
in determining how the organization appears to its customers. Internal perspective. The organization must identify the internal business processes that are critical to the implementation of a strategy. In other words, the aim here is for efficiency of its operations, so as to achieve the customer and the financial objectives. Performance assessment from an internal perspective could be in terms of reducing staff turnover, or reducing the number of mistakes, or perhaps increasing the organization's IT capability. Innovation perspective. The aim for the organization here is constant learning and growth. The organization must continue to develop and provide capabilities that will achieve the internal, the customer and the financial objectives. For example, increasing staff training or enhancing research and development expenditure might result in less staff mistakes, internal perspective. Hence, increasing customer satisfaction, customer perspective, which in turn increases the organization's profit, financial perspective. It is very important to understand that the four perspectives are linked. The principle is that to achieve long-term financial success, the organization needs to meet or exceed customer expectations. To meet or exceed customer expectations, internal business processes must be very good and the organization will need to keep innovating, learning and improving. So again, for example, more regular staff training, innovation perspective, should improve the performance of that staff, internal perspective, which in turn should result in an increase in the level of customer satisfaction, customer perspective. Ultimately, a happier customer will result in long-term increases in profit of the business, financial perspective. Hence, by focusing on non-financial measures in the short term, staff training, reducing mistakes, keeping the customer happy, the financial measure of increased profits will be achieved in the long term. Thus, the balanced scorecard provides a valuable link between the short-term business operations and the long-term goal or strategy of that business. The balanced scorecard can be considered a dynamic and efficient tool used in delivering the organization's strategy. In this section, I will go over performance analysis in not-for-profit organizations and the public sector management. The goal of a for-profit organization is just that, to create a profit, wealth for its owners and investors, by providing a good or a service. However, the main goal of a not-for-profit organization and a public body is not to create financial wealth but to deliver essential services to its users. Their financial goals are to cover their costs. The goal of a for-profit business are normally quantifiable. For example, if they want to increase their profits by 20% next year, so if the current profits are $1 million, next year they should be $200,000 more. The objectives of not-for-profit organizations often involve non-quantifiable goals, which are not as easily measured. The impact of non-profit organization is hard to measure as their goals are non-quantifiable, as we've already discussed. Here are a few objectives that cover most non-profit organizations. So solving a problem or providing support for people in our society. Maximizing client satisfaction. Have job satisfaction among the volunteers and staff. Maximizing their revenues from public donations or government interventions such as grants. This organization would want to ensure that every opportunity to get public donations and government funds are exploited. So for example, ensuring all funding deadlines for grant applications are met. Maximizing the organization's surplus. For example, the literacy agency would want to ensure that public donations are used as efficiently as possible to provide as many high quality services as they can. 
These non-quantifiable objectives make it difficult to measure their impact and performance, or even justify funding them. Often it is unclear if a project has been successful, and how successful has it been? As I have already said, the main goal of a not-for-profit organization is to satisfy the needs of its users. They can have many stakeholders, resulting in many objectives. For example, a local government transport body may want to ensure that public roads are suitable, that public transport can be accessed by all, and that the roads are safe. The organisation has many objectives around its vision. With so many objectives, it can be difficult to assess their performance, and the objectives may conflict, especially if some of their activities may not be seen for many years to come, or perhaps not even till the next generation. To address this problem of having so many objectives, the, the organisation must prioritise their objectives and compromise between them. The performance of a not-for-profit organisation must be measured. If not, resources such as time and money, often public donations and funds, would be misallocated and decisions of allocating funds would be subjective rather than objective. So how do you go about this? It is very important that financial and non-financial performance indicators are looked at. A performance indicator is a sign that the company is on target for achieving its objectives. When looking at the cost of providing the organization's service, value for money should be examined. Under these three headings, they are economy, efficiency and effectiveness. Economy. Are the resources used the cheapest for what is needed? For example, for the classrooms used by a literacy charity, they need to be structurally sound, safe and clean. If nothing more is needed, don't pay for anything more. This is a financial performance indicator. The goal is to get the best possible price for the quality necessary. Efficiency and effectiveness look at the non-financial indicators as well. Efficiency is the maximum output being achieved for the resources invested. Is the literacy charity teaching as many people to read as its current funding allows? Effectiveness. Look and examine the results or the outputs of the project to ensure the objectives are being met. For example, how many people were thought to read over three months? Is this in line with targets? Value for money. As I said, not-for-profit organisations usually get their funds from public donations and they must ensure they are achieving the best possible result with their limited cash resources. Often these organisations will make getting value for money as an objective. This objective can be implemented throughout the organisation and make sure all the resources go as far as they possibly can. To assess value for money as an objective, a not-for-profit organisation can benchmark against other organisations or even similar projects and events if they cannot find a similar organisation. Use performance indicators to measure if value for money has been achieved. By undertaking an internal value for money audit, this will demonstrate to staff and volunteers how important this objective is. By keeping good records of all activities held so that there is clear evidence of value for money being achieved, they can be referred to by future staff and volunteers as serve as ideas and learning. The results of the activities can also be compared to the resources inputted. Non-financial performance indicators. As I said before, when assessing a not-for-profit, both financial and non-financial performance indicators should be used. Let's look at the non-financial performance indicators in an example now. 
Happy Reading is a literacy charity. It has the following objectives. To ensure every child learns how to read and has a positive learning experience. The organisation has set the following non-financial performance indicator to achieve this goal. Staff morale. This should be high. This performance indicator was chosen because happy, content staff are better teachers and provide children with a positive learning experience. Client satisfaction levels should also be high. This performance indicator was chosen because it shows that children are learning to read and are happy with the results. Child engagement through games in class. The higher, the better. So the higher the child engagement, the better, because it indicates that the child is confident enough to engage. Now the charity has set these non-financial performance indicators, what steps can be taken to improve on the current results? So how can staff morale be improved? Engaging with staff and volunteers to find out what their needs are and addressing them is one way. There are also many more such as team building days, etc. This is a particularly important indicator as many not-for-profits are run on volunteer labor, labor. If they don't feel appreciated, they will ultimately leave, resulting in the organization's services not being provided. Client satisfaction, similar for profit organizations, can be improved by finding out exactly what the client needs and delivering it. This will ensure client or claimant satisfaction. It is important to maintain an open dialogue with the beneficiaries of the service because their needs will change over time. As you can see, to improve the performance of happy reading, it is essential that the needs of the stakeholders are found and addressed. This means clear, consistent communication. How can an organisation improve on its performance? Targets must be set. The organisation must decide where it wants to be in the future. As I said before, the objectives of a not-for-profit are often qualitative, which are difficult to decide on and measure. This is because there is often no scale to measure the target. How can you assess how much of an improvement in the quality of life of somebody who has a chronic illness? Also, the beneficiary's own results with the services will be different from person to person. How are the benefits and costs measured against each other and traded off? For example, does the cost of providing certain services equal the benefit of improving someone's life? If $100 more expense was invested, would the quality of life received by the beneficiary be worth more than that. Timing. Benefits do not accrue overnight. Often the impact of a not-for-profit's work will be seen in the next 5-10 years, even the next generation. For example, environmental groups try to change our thought process over waste and recycling. The true impact of their work will not be seen for another 20 years, not next month. The impacts of external events. Not-for-profits are heavily impacted by events that occur outside of them. With this uncertainty, it can be difficult to set targets. For example, will new legislation be passed governing children and what will this impact be? When the targets have been set and the performance indicators decided upon, like any organisation, they must first take stock of what their performance is currently and compare it with past performance. They should analyse the organisation's past performance using the performance indicators that they've decided upon. Knowing the organisation's current position, it can then move forward and assess its future performance. Select not financial and non-financial indicators. Here's a few suggested ones. So revenue growth. How much have donations increased year on year? What is the current year's target? 
costs. What was the trend in the past? What are the future period's goals? Staff and volunteer turnover. What has this been in the past? What are its current goals? User satisfaction. The historical results can be seen by quantifying how many users returned and recommended to others to avail of their service. There must be a clearly communicated action plan to improve these performance indicators and to achieve these goals. Non-for-profit organisations need to adapt a longer term viewpoint than for-profit organisations. As I've already mentioned, many of the benefits of their work will not be visible for many years to come. It is very important that the long-term work of all expenditure is clearly communicated with the public so they understand why the benefit they expect is not visible immediately. Sharing the vision of the organisation means that those who fund them will share it too and reduce the pressure to produce the expected results in the short term. The performance indicators should also reflect this long-term view. By taking a short-term view on projects that are meant to deliver long-term benefits, it is more likely to fail and not achieve the organisation's goals. It will also put the organisers under pressure to manipulate results, which is unethical, leading to loss of public confidence and the organisation losing funding. Ultimately, the beneficiaries of the organisation's service will lose out, and they are the reason for the organisation to exist. This session covers performance management for both the private sector and the not-for-profit and public sector. Firstly, let's understand what performance measurement actually is. Performance measurement aims to establish how well a company or individual is doing in relation to a given plan, and it is a vital part of the planning and control process. At a high level, performance measures can be divided into two types financial performance indicators and non-financial performance indicators. Financial measures will typically relate to figures from the financial statements, e.g. revenue, profits, return on capital, cash flows, etc. The actual performance is usually measured against a financial plan, such as a budget, or performance could be measured by comparing the most recent set of data against a previous time period, or maybe even comparison against a similar business or an industry average. Non-financial measures can relate to whatever is important or critical for an organisation. This will vary from one organisation to another, but could include measures around the quality of the goods or service provided, customer feedback, achieving deadlines, or maybe capacity utilisation for a manufacturing company. Whilst financial indicators tend to be historic in nature, e.g. backwards looking for a time period that has already elapsed, non-financial indicators are often a good indicator of the future financial performance. Strong financial performance is not achievable in the long term unless non-financial performance is strong to sustain the business moving forward. Whether performance measures are financial or non-financial, there are several factors that organisations should consider. Any form of performance management will require some form of resource to collect and analyse the information. This could be staff time or maybe equipment. Either way, the costs and benefits of providing the resource should be carefully weighed up. All measures must be measured in relation to something. Overall, this will be the company's objectives and the plans that will cascade from those objectives. It is important for a business to identify the factors that are important or business critical to the success of achieving those objectives. In addition, the measures should be fair. 
If managers are targeted or incentivized for achieving certain targets, the measure should only include areas that the manager is responsible for and has direct control over. Ideally, a variety of measures should be used, and the balanced scorecard is a good example, as it ensures that performance measures are formulated from a number of different company perspectives. In addition, a mixture of both long-term and short-term achievements should be measured. While short-term targets are very valuable to an organisation, too much emphasis can lead to a short-termism effect, where decisions are taken for the here and now with little regard to the long-term future of a company. An example of this would be postponing expenditure on machinery to achieve a current budget with little consideration to the longer-term impact of not having reliable machinery in the future. Whilst a long-term measure may link a manager's bonus to the company share price. Once suitable performance measures have been identified, they should be monitored on a regular basis to ensure that they are relevant and they are providing meaningful information. Performance measures can be both quantitative and qualitative. Quantitative measures are expressed in numbers and by measurements. This will include all the financial performance measures and measures that are numerical, e.g. number of units or number of hours or maybe cost per unit. Qualitative measures are not numerical. These measures may relate to quality of product or service, maybe customer loyalty or possibly employee morale. By the very nature of these types of measures, they are subjective and judgmental. For example, one customer may rate a service as high, whereas another customer may consider the very same service as just adequate. That said, qualitative measures can still be very valuable to a business. Now we will return to the financial performance measures and look at some specific examples for the private sector. For ease, these measures can be grouped into three categories, profitability, liquidity and gearing. The first category we will look at is profitability. There are obvious checks for a company regarding profitability. For example, is the company profitable and if so, by how much is the profit greater or smaller than last year? In addition to that, there are other ratios that an organisation can calculate. The first one we will look at is called the gross profit margin. The calculation for this is the gross profit divided by the revenue. The ratio is usually expressed as a percentage and from the company's perspective, the higher the better. To improve this measure, a company will need to either increase its revenue or decrease the cost of sales. The measure can be used for comparisons against previous periods within the same company, comparisons against similar size companies within the same industry, or maybe against an industry average. The gross profit margin is rarely used in comparing companies in different industries, as dependent on the nature of the business, they could have very different cost structures. The next ratio is called the net profit margin. For the purpose of the ACCA F5 exam, the net profit margin is calculated by either profit before interest and tax divided by revenue or operating profit divided by revenue, dependent on what you are given in the question. As with the gross profit margin, the ratio is usually expressed as a percentage and again from the company's perspective, the higher the better. This ratio considers all the costs to the company, including administrative and distribution costs. Again, it is only meaningful when compared to previous periods within the same company or performance of similar sized companies within the same industry. The next ratio is called the return on capital employed. It isn't possible to accurately assess profit growth within a business without relating profit to the amount of funds that have been invested in the business to help generate those profits. The investment is termed as capital. The return on capital employed, often abbreviated to ROCI, is therefore an important profitability ratio as it links these two elements together. The calculation for ROCI is profit before interest and tax 
divided by the capital employed. The capital employed is the shareholder funds plus any non-current liabilities. The capital employed calculation is the equivalent of the total assets less the current liabilities. Rocky is expressed as a percentage and from the company's perspective, the higher the better. In terms of comparisons, well they can be made from one year to the next within the same company, maybe against the Rocky being earned by other companies of a similar size, or comparison can be made with the current market borrowing rates. By comparing to current borrowing rates, a company can decide whether its Rocky suggests the company is making a sufficient return to make any future borrowings worthwhile. The next ratio we will look at is called asset turnover. Asset turnover is a measure of how well a business is using its assets to generate sales and is calculated by revenue divided by capital employed. This measure is normally just expressed as a number. For example, if two companies had equal values of capital employed, but one company had double the sales revenue of the other company, this company is said to have a higher turnover. This is due to the fact that it is able to generate double the revenue from the same value of assets. Together, net profit margin and asset turnover explain the Rocky calculation. The relationship between the three ratios can be seen as follows. Net profit margin multiplied by asset turnover will equal Rocky. The last measure in the profitability category is earnings per share, or quite often abbreviated to EPS. EPS is a measure that relates profitability to the shareholder. It is calculated as profit after tax and preference dividends, divided by the weighted average number of ordinary shares in issue for the period. Essentially, it looks at what is potentially available for the ordinary shareholder after deducting all liabilities and converts that to a profit value per share. The EPS is a widely used measure of a company's performance as a company must be able to generate sufficient earnings in order to firstly pay a dividend to the shareholder and then reinvest any surplus back into the business to support ongoing future growth. From an investor point of view, the EPS measure is also important. An investor will be looking for growth in an EPS from one year to the next. The next category of ratio to look at are concerned with liquidity and cash flow. A company may be financially profitable, but will struggle if it does not have sufficient liquidity, i.e. cash to pay its debts when they fall due. Before looking at the key ratio calculations, it is important to understand what is a liquid asset. Liquid assets will include cash, trade receivables, deposits with the bank and any short term investments which can be readily converted into cash, e.g. shares. Inventory is generally deemed not to be liquid, although it would depend on the speed of the inventory turnover. With a wholesale and retail business, e.g. supermarket, inventory may well have a fast turnover and cash may be realised very quickly. But with a manufacturing company, say with a lengthy production cycle, the working capital cycle, i.e. the time that will elapse from paying for the raw materials to receiving the cash back into the company from a customer, can be considerable. The first ratio calculation to look at is the current ratio and is the standard test of liquidity. This is calculated as current assets divided by current liabilities and is expressed as a ratio. The thought with this ratio is that there should be enough cash or promise of cash to come in order for a company to pay its current liabilities. As such, a figure greater than one would be expected However, this ratio will vary quite significantly between different types of businesses. The next ratio to look at is the quick ratio, also known as the acid test. This ratio is calculated as current assets less inventory divided by current liabilities. As already mentioned, in most cases inventory is not deemed to be a liquid asset due to the speed of conversion to cash. Ideally, this ratio should still be greater than 1 for companies with a slow inventory turnover. 
For companies that have a rapid inventory turnover, a quick ratio may be less than one without suggesting that the company is having any cash flow difficulties. It is also important to note that a company may have a current and quick ratio that is too large. This would suggest overinvestment in inventory and may be large volumes of trade receivables and cash, hence tying up more capital in the business than is actually required. This would suggest poor capital management. Up next is the receivables payment period. This is calculated as the trade receivables divided by the credit revenue. The measure is usually expressed in days, so the equation needs to be multiplied by 365. This measure allows a company to calculate the average length of time it takes for customers to pay them. Close monitoring of this is essential for companies to avoid a high receivables figure and hence running into cash flow difficulties. The next measure is the payables payment period. This is calculated as the trade payables divided by either credit purchases or the cost of sales, dependent on what is provided in the question. Again, this measure is expressed in days, so the equation needs multiplying by 365. This measure allows a company to calculate the average length of time it takes to pay its suppliers. From a cash flow perspective, companies will normally take full advantage of any credit period offered. However, it is important for companies not to abuse the agreed terms as this could lead to loss of goodwill and ultimately restriction on supply. The next measure is the inventory days or inventory turnover period. Inventory days is calculated by inventory divided by the cost of sales and again multiplied by 365. This measure indicates the average period that a company holds its inventory. An increasing inventory days calculation suggests slow moving inventory which can then lead to build up or excessive holdings. In addition to potential cash flow problems, too much inventory can also lead to loss through obsolescence or damage and there may be associated related costs such as warehousing and insurance. On the other side of the coin, it is important that companies hold sufficient inventory to avoid loss of sales through stockouts. This measure can also be expressed as the inventory turnover period, where the previous calculation is just reversed. Before moving on to the third category of ratios, it is important to realise that caution is needed when calculating liquidity ratios, as the statement of financial position may not be representative of the norm at the financial year end, e.g. if a company made a large one-off credit sale just before the financial year end, the trade receivables will be abnormally high, or maybe a company has a large inventory delivery just before the financial year end, resulting in abnormally high inventory holdings. Where there is sufficient detail in a question, average figures from the statement of financial position should be used, e.g. add the opening balance to the closing balance and divide by 2. The third category of ratios are concerned with gearing. All assets of a business must be financed through one means or another. As a company starts to expand, additional finance will usually be needed to acquire additional assets. There are different ways that a company can be financed and this is known as the capital structure of a business. At a high level there are two options open to a business for long term finance. They can raise capital from shareholders, known as equity, or they can borrow funds, known as debt. The gearing ratio looks at the relationship between the shareholder funds, i.e. equity, and the debt. Typically, there are two accepted calculations of this ratio, either debt divided by debt and equity or debt divided by equity. The measure is expressed as a percentage and generally any ratio greater than 50% would denote that a company is highly geared. So what exactly does this ratio mean and why is it so important? Shareholders will be expecting a return for their investment, and this is called a dividend. However, should a company have low profits or be loss-making, any dividend paid to ordinary shareholders is purely at the discretion of the directors of the company. 
In addition, the company has no obligation to purchase any ordinary shares back from the shareholders. In contrast, if a company has borrowings, it will still have an obligation to pay interest and at some point redeem the borrowings. If a company has sustained losses, ultimately it will reach a point where it is unable to meet its interest commitments. As such, the higher percentage of capital financed through debt, the higher the financial risk associated with the company. It is important for companies to keep their debt under control, otherwise banks or other lenders will likely refuse further borrowings at some point in the future. Gearing measures the percentage of long-term finance that is debt. The greater the percentage, the more highly geared a company is and the greater the financial risk associated with it. So far we have looked at specific financial performance indicators. Now let's take a look at some typical non-financial performance indicators. Non-financial performance indicators are generally a useful guide to future financial performance. Unlike financial indicators, they will vary significantly between different types of businesses dependent on what is important or business critical to the organisation. Usually within an exam question, there will be some judgment needed as to identifying the most suitable non-financial performance indicators dependent on the nature of the business. As a general guide, non-financial performance measures could include quality of goods or service. This could be formulated by the number of rejects within the production process or maybe the number of customer returns or warranty claims. Delivery. This could be calculated by the average time between taking and delivering an order. Reliability. Well, this could be expressed as the percentage of equipment failures or maybe downtime. Innovation. This could be calculated as the number of new products launched over a given time period or maybe the value invested in development of new products. Customer satisfaction measures may include the number of repeat orders, number of new accounts opened or maybe the percentage of on-time deliveries or maybe the number of customer complaints as a percentage of total sales volume. Employee morale could be measured by surveys. As non-financial performance indicators can measure and compare just about anything, it is important that companies do not suffer with information overload. The measures need to be meaningful and they need to be tailored to the business. As mentioned earlier, it is important for companies to have a mix of both financial and non-financial performance indicators. This will stop too much concentration on too few variables whilst ignoring other important variables that maybe cannot be expressed in monetary terms. Once all suitable performance measures have been identified, it is important to monitor them, analyse the performance and identify reasons for unexpected performance. To identify possible reasons, you may need to apply some judgement to the facts given in an exam question. For example, an increase in product quality issue could be down to using cheaper materials or maybe using inexperienced staff. Customer dissatisfaction with an online service could be due to a poor website design or too much downtime. Or an increase in machine unreliability could be due to reduced or inferior maintenance. Any possible improvements in performance should be linked to the possible reasons for the poor performance e.g. hire more experienced staff or provide additional training, redesign of a website using a specialist company if necessary, or maybe increase the scheduled maintenance of the machinery. The last part of this session will focus on not-for-profit organisations and the public sector. Not-for-profit organisations and the public sector are likely to have significantly different goals in comparison to a private sector business, as profit is not their primary goal, and generally they do not have to be successful against the competition. If the organisation has no sales, measures such as gross profit margin or ROCI could not be calculated or are meaningless to the organisation. Nonetheless, these types of organisations will have objectives 
although they can be more difficult to define and in addition it can be difficult to say which objective should override another. For example, a charity may well have financial measures concerning charitable income donation and reducing overheads, but it will also have measures concerned with providing a service for local people, maybe the elderly, or perhaps protecting the environment. A hospital will have financial measures concerning costs and budget achievement, but will also have measures concerning, say, reducing waiting times for patients and providing good quality health care for all. To complicate matters further, it can be very difficult to judge whether non-quantifiable objectives for these organisations have been met. For example, has the standard of health care in a hospital improved or not? Or has a charity improved the situation for the local elderly community? Typically, statistics around size of budgets, number of employees or volunteers, or maybe number of customers serviced and facilities provided are useful to evaluate these objectives. Normally, performance will be judged in terms of inputs and outputs, which ties in with the value for money criteria of economy, efficiency and effectiveness. So let's look at each one of those in turn. Firstly, economy. Economy will focus on the inputs for an organisation and obtaining them at the lowest acceptable cost possible for the level of service to be provided. Economy does not necessarily mean straightforward cost cutting as resource needs to be of a suitable quality. Cost cutting that leads to service standard falling below an acceptable quality level would be false economy. For example, for a hospital, this would be the cost of the doctors and the nursing staff, the medical equipment and the facilities needed. If the cost cutting is too severe, the hospital will be unable to provide the required level of health care. The next one is efficiency. Efficiency is all about getting the greatest output possible from the level of inputs, i.e. no waste. So again, for a hospital, that would mean ensuring that doctors and nurses are fully utilised, theatres and expensive equipment are fully operational and running to the maximum, and drugs are not wasted. Lastly, effectiveness. Effectiveness is concerned with achieving the end result or objective, e.g. getting the job done. For a hospital, this would be measured as providing the appropriate level of health care for the patient to cure the ailment. There is always a trade-off between economy and effectiveness. Organisations will usually have the ability to resource their inputs at a lower cost. However, if the cost cutting is too severe, then the organisation will struggle to achieve its end objectives. Public sector organisations are now under considerable pressure more than ever to operate economically, efficiently and to be effective and are normally required to draw up some form of action plan to demonstrate how they will achieve value for money. Typically management may be subjected to value for money audits to ensure services are being delivered in the most economical, efficient and effective way. The audits can be conducted by an internal audit department or may be carried out by an outside specialist organisation. This session will focus on external considerations and behavioural aspects. Performance management needs to allow for external considerations. This will possibly include stakeholders, market conditions and maybe making allowance for reactions of competitors. So let's look at each one of those in turn. Firstly, stakeholders. Well, what is a stakeholder? A stakeholder is any individual or a group of individuals, or maybe a business, that has a legitimate interest in the activities of an organisation. Typically, this will include customers and suppliers, employees, shareholders, banks, and maybe the general community at large. We can categorise our stakeholders further into internal, connected and external stakeholders. So let's have a look at each one of those in turn. An internal stakeholder will include employees and management, i.e. anybody internal to the business. 
Connected stakeholders will include any individual or organisation that is connected in some way to the organisation. So customers and suppliers would fall within this group, as would shareholders and lenders. External stakeholders are not directly connected to the business in any way, but do have a legitimate interest. This would include government, local authorities, maybe professional bodies, the community at large and maybe pressure groups. So let's now consider what each group of stakeholder may be potentially interested in. Starting with internal stakeholders, these are obviously strongly connected to an organisation. They will be interested in the organisation's continued growth and profitability. And in addition, they will probably have personal interests such as salary, bonus or promotion aspects. With regard to connected stakeholders, increasing shareholder value can assume to be a core part in the strategic management of a business. Shareholders will be looking for a reward in terms of a dividend payment and potentially long-term share value growth. Also, many shareholders may want to invest in ethically sound organisations. In addition, lenders will be interested in adherence to agreements, i.e. can the organisation meet its interest payments on time, and customers and suppliers will be interested in goods as promised and timely payments for goods respectively. External stakeholders in particular induce both social and ethical obligations. For example, government will be interested in job creation or employee training. Pressure groups could be focused on pollution or rights of the community. With regard to performance management, the stakeholder approach would be that company objectives should be shaped and influenced by those that have strong influence and sufficient involvement or interest in the organisation. Now let's consider how market conditions may affect performance management. There are various aspects here that could be considered. For a start, is the economy in a boom or bust phase? And if so, how does this affect demand for goods and services? Are interest rates moving up or down? And how does this affect consumer confidence and also the cost of borrowing for an organisation? A high interest rate will erode profitability. If inflation is high, this could well depress consumer spending. And in addition, it could lead to employees demanding higher salaries to compensate for their loss of spending power, again eroding profitability. If a company trades overseas, it could well be impacted by movement in exchange rates, both favourably and unfavourably. Finally, government policies can have a significant impact on an organisation. Changes in taxation or VAT rates can leave the consumer with more or less money in their pockets. And corporation tax will affect the profits available for potential dividend payments and available funds to reinvest into the business. Finally, the last consideration to be mindful of is the competitor. Performance management must consider the competitor's prices and cost structures and any possible competitor reaction. You will have seen different pricing strategies in an earlier session. These can be adopted for different products or services and will change throughout the life cycle of the product or service. All management accounting data and information must be readily available so that an organisation can react quickly and effectively to a competitor. With regard to behavioural aspects of performance management, it is generally deemed to be unacceptable to assess managers on areas that are outside of their control or influence. If managers are held accountable for areas that they cannot influence, it can become very demoralising for them and will encourage dysfunctional behaviour. Many organisations adopt some form of reward scheme that is linked to performance measurement. The overriding idea of such a scheme is that it should be motivational for the employee. The employee will be rewarded for good performance and their efforts will have a positive impact towards the organisation achieving its goals. 
There are, however, certain problems that can arise with such schemes, dependent on how the scheme has been devised and how the manager is being measured. For example, there could be tendencies to pad a budget if a manager is being incentivised to meet that budget or in a bid to achieve targets or certain outputs, quality of product or service may be compromised. This will be an example of managers making decisions in their own best interests, which are contrary to the longer term success of the business. Certain schemes are designed to ensure that long term achievement is built in to stop short termism decisions being made. These long term measures may not motivate as the reward is too distant in the future and certain managers may not even consider that they will still be employed by the organisation at that point in the future. Finally, it is important to realise that people will react and perform differently if they know the standard of their performance is being measured and they will be rewarded for achieving a certain level of performance. This leads to a danger that only certain areas of their work will be concentrated on, the ones that are being measured. However, this may not be a problem if every important area of the employee's role has a measure attached to it. This session focuses on the building block model. Fitzgerald and Moon devised the building block model to attempt to overcome some of the problems associated with performance measurement, specifically in the service area. The model suggests that a performance management system can be analysed into three building blocks. These blocks are called the dimensions of performance, standards and rewards. So let's look at each in turn. The dimensions of performance are the aspects of the business that are to be measured. Fitzgerald and Moon suggested that there are six key aspects to performance measurement, although in reality this will vary from one company to the next, dependent on what is important to them. The six suggested aspects are as follows. So firstly, financial performance. This will incorporate all the usual financial performance indicators such as profit growth, gross and net profit margin. Next is competitiveness. This will typically include measures such as growth in sales or maybe the success rate of converting an enquiry into a sale. Following on is service quality. This would include the number of complaints or customer satisfaction scores. Following on from that is flexibility. This could include measures such as speed in response to a customer or maybe the ability of multitask trained employees to work on different areas of the service delivery. Next up is resource utilisation. This would include measures around say capacity utilisation and efficiency measures. And lastly is innovation. Typical measures here would be the number of new services offered over a given time period. Fitzgerald and Moon suggested that the first two aspects, i.e. financial performance and competitiveness, are historical measures, i.e. they are a result of past actions, whereas the remaining four aspects are all aspects that will determine the future success of the business. The standards block concerns setting the standards of performance. This cannot be done until the dimensions of performance have been selected and agreed. Fitzgerald and Moon identified three aspects to setting the standards of performance. Firstly, ownership. Individuals need to feel that they own the standards and targets for which they are made responsible for. Next, realistic. Those standards need to be realistic and achievable. And thirdly, equitable. The standards and targets should be fair and equitable for all concerned. Lastly, the rewards building block. This refers to the structure of the reward system and details how individuals will be rewarded for successful achievement of the performance targets. Again, Fitzgerald and Moon identified three aspects for the reward system. Firstly, clarity. The system of both setting the targets and the reward system should be clear and transparent to all. Next, achievement. 
the achievement of the performance target should be suitably rewarded. And thirdly, responsibility. Employees of the business should only be made responsible for aspects of performance that they are in a position to control or influence. The Fitzgerald and Moon building blocks model is so called as the standards and rewards block will underpin and support the dimensions of performance block. In this presentation we are going to focus on two measures which are used to assess the performance of a company division. Return on investment and residual income. In a decentralized organization divisional structures can exist. Here a division can also be referred to as an investment centre where the division manager has responsibility over revenue, costs and capital expenditure or investment. It is common for a division to set financial targets and for its performance to be assessed accordingly. It's important to note that the following characteristics are desirable when looking to successfully appraise a division's performance. These characteristics underpin much of our discussion around divisional performance assessment. Goal congruence. Ideally divisional managers should make decisions that are in the best interests of not only that division but also the company or the group as a whole. Autonomy. In a decentralized organization the divisional manager should be able to act and make decisions independently of the company head office. Hence the divisional manager has full control and can assume full responsibility. Performance assessment. Goal congruence and divisional autonomy should mean the evaluation of the division's performance is possible and fair. A conflict between goal congruence and autonomy can often arise. If managers are allowed too much autonomy, then while seeking to maximize the profits for their division, they may make decisions that are not in the best interests of the company or the group as a whole. However, if their autonomy or independence is withdrawn, then this is likely to have a negative impact on their motivation, thus making it difficult to accurately assess performance. These matters must be considered when evaluating the performance of a division. Divisional performance can be assessed using the return on investment and residual income methods. Let's take a look at each in turn. Assessment of divisional performance can be based on the return on its investment. This is calculated as the net profit of that investment divided by the investment cost. Traditionally this has been a widely used measure in divisional performance assessment. However variations of the return on investment formula do exist. So sometimes it is necessary to follow any direction given in the scenario presented. Let's take a look at an example involving two company divisions. B Company has two franchises, X and Y, in different parts of town and wants to monitor the performance of the two managers who have full control over the investments. The cost of capital of the two franchises is 10%. Currently the return on investment of each franchise is 15%. Each franchise manager is currently considering the following separate investments. The budgeted capital requirement for franchise X is 500,000, which is expected to yield a profit of 70,000. Franchise Y requires a capital investment of 750,000, from which a profit of 95,000 will be generated. The requirement is to calculate the return on investment of each of the proposed franchise investments and to comment upon the results. For division or franchise X, the return on investment is 14%, being the profit of 70,000 expressed as a percentage of the capital investment of 500,000. Similarly for franchise Y, a return on investment of 12.67% would be generated, being profit of 95,000 divided by the necessary investment of 750,000. We also need to be able to comment upon and make sense of these results. It's important to note that each franchise manager has autonomy. In other words, each franchise operates and makes decisions independently of company head office. Each divisional manager will make decisions that are in the best interests of that division. In this case, return on investment is being used to assess the potential investment. As return on investment of both divisions or franchises currently stands at 15%, 
the manager would only be willing to accept an investment opportunity which will add to, or at the very least maintain, this return on investment. Thus, as the expected return on investment of 14% and 12.67% for franchise X and Y respectively are both below the current return on investment of 15%, both franchise managers would reject the investment opportunity. If either investment were accepted, then the overall return on investment of that franchise would be reduced, which would not be in the interests of that franchise or division manager. Given that the cost of capital for both divisions is 10%, it can be argued that both investments should be accepted, as it would benefit the company as a whole. Hence, the decisions of Division X and Division Y are not in the best interest of the company, meaning there is a lack of goal congruence between the divisions and the company. Or, the behaviour of the divisions can be described as dysfunctional. Furthermore, if divisions are making decisions that are not advantageous to the overall performance of the company, then it is difficult to fairly assess the performance of that division. As per the above example, it can be argued that using return on investment will encourage divisional managers to make decisions that are in the best interests of that division, but not necessarily in the best interests of the company as a whole. This is referred to as dysfunctional behaviour or non-goal congruent behaviour. For this reason, other methods of divisional performance assessment, such as residual income, have evolved. The residual income is calculated as the profit minus the imputed interest charge. The imputed interest charge represents the minimum acceptable return to the investors, calculated as the investment cost multiplied by the company's cost of capital. Generally, if the residual income is positive, the investment is acceptable to the division. Let's examine residual income in the case of the two franchises X and Y, which are considering the same two investment opportunities. In this case we are required to calculate the residual income of each of the proposed franchise investments and to comment upon the results. So for franchise X the budgeted profit is 70,000. The imputed interest charge of 50,000 is calculated as the company's cost of capital of 10% multiplied by the necessary investment of 500,000. The residual income for franchise X investment is 20,000 positive. For franchise Y residual income is also 20,000 positive. This is calculated based on the profit of 95,000 less the imputed interest charge of 75,000. The imputed interest charge here is also indicative of the minimum return required by investors of 10% on Y's investment of 750,000. Using residual income as a basis for making a decision would result in the investments in franchise X and franchise Y being accepted, given that the residual income for both investments is positive. Accepting these investments would also be in the best interest of the company, meaning divisional and company goal congruence would be achieved. As the divisions are acting in the best interest of the company, then it would also be easier to fairly assess divisional performance. These differences between return on investment and residual income should be appreciated. Ultimately, however, both return on investment and residual income use similar information in their calculations. As is evident in the above examples, residual income could be viewed as the superior method of investment appraisal, as given that the calculation is linked to the cost of capital, goal congruence should be achieved. Goal congruence avoids dysfunctional behaviour, which maximises company profits and facilitates divisional performance assessment. Return on investment, on the other hand, can result in dysfunctional behaviour, meaning company profits are not maximised, thus hampering fair evaluation of that division's performance. Return on investment, however, is a relative measure, in that it is expressed as a percentage. This facilitates interdivisional comparisons. Also, a percentage return is often easier for people to understand. Residual income is expressed as an absolute measure, or is expressed in monetary terms, which arguably makes it more difficult to compare divisional performance. Also, estimation of a cost of capital is required for the residual income calculation, whereas no cost of capital is required when calculating return on investment. 
Other than the calculations above, other factors need to be considered when evaluating or comparing divisional performance. How experienced is the divisional manager? Perhaps they are new to the role. How buoyant or otherwise is the market for each division's goods and services? This will impact the financial results of that division. What is the age profile of the assets within each division? Return on investment and residual income calculations will improve as assets get older, since the investment figure will reduce by the amount of depreciation each year. This may discourage managers from investing in newer, more efficient equipment, simply because in the short term it reduces the division's return on investment or residual income. Hello. In this video we'll consider the objectives behind setting transfer prices and also look at how we might calculate them in practice. The transfer price is the price at which an internal sale occurs. In other words, if one division of a group sells to another division of the same group, the transfer price is the price they set for this sale. Financial accountants may at first view appear to be supremely indifferent as to what this number is. After all, the revenue in one division equals the costs in the other division, and the two simply cancel out on consolidation for financial reporting purposes. However, this is an overly dismissive view. As management accountants, we're concerned to make sure the transfer price that's chosen motivates the right kind of behaviour in the seller and the buyer. There are four main objectives that should be considered with a transfer price. Firstly, goal congruence. The decisions that divisional managers make as a result of the transfer price set should be consistent with group objectives. Secondly, autonomy. Divisional managers should be allowed to make their own decisions as to whether or not to buy internally or externally and also ideally to set the transfer price. The more autonomy they have, the more responsibility they can be given as to the results of their division. This should be motivational for the divisional manager. Thirdly, performance assessment. The divisional financial reports should present a fair reflection of the true performance of that division. For example, we wouldn't want a truly efficient and effective division to be returning a loss purely as a result of an unusual transfer pricing policy. And finally, tax. To a limited degree, tax implications should be considered with transfer pricing that involves divisions located in different countries. It's worth pointing out, however, that tax legislation is tightening up in this area and opportunities for tax planning are reducing globally. These four objectives can be remembered with the word gap tax. Let's initially consider transfer pricing from an economic theoretical viewpoint. Suppose we have two divisions, Division A and Division B. Division A manufactures a component which can be sold to the outside world for $10. Division B also uses this component in their own production process. In Division B's local market, they can acquire a similar component that's perfectly adequate for $9. Let's have a look at the costs in each division. So in Division A, they have their own variable manufacturing costs of $5 plus $2 fixed cost per unit, giving them a total full cost of $7. In Division B, assuming they buy in from the outside at the moment, they have their own manufacturing variable costs of 3, the cost of the component they buy in from the outside of 9, and their own fixed costs per unit of 2, giving them a total cost of $14 per unit. Suppose initially Division A has some spare capacity in its factory. This is important as it means transferring internally to Division B won't cause Division A to have to give up some external sales of the component. In these circumstances, firstly, let's consider what's best for the group as a whole. Should the group produce this component and transfer it internally, 
or should the group buy it in from the outside at a cost of $9? Well, the cost of making extra components for internal transfer is only $5 compared to the external price of $9. In these circumstances, it's best for the group if the internal transfer occurs. Secondly, let's consider what transfer price will cause this to happen. Division A will be happy so long as they receive more than $5 per component. This is the variable cost of manufacture. Note the fixed cost is irrelevant as by definition it will not vary with output. The buying division, Division B, will be happy provided it pays less than $9. This is the price it pays for buying the component in from the outside world. So, a transfer price in the range 5 to $9 would appear to encourage goal congruent behaviour. Say $7 halfway between the two. At $7, the seller will want to sell and the buyer will want to buy and this is best for the group as a whole. Let's now consider how this decision might change if Division A is operating at full capacity. The significance of this is that Division A will have to sacrifice some external sales to be able to make internal transfers. Let's again first consider what's best for the group. The cost of an internal transfer here would be the variable cost of manufacture of $5 per component plus the lost contribution from the external sale they had to give up. This lost contribution would be $10 revenue less $5 variable cost is another $5. So the total cost to the group is $5 variable cost of manufacture plus $5 lost contribution is $10 per component internally transferred. This is more than the $9 it costs to buy the component in from the outside. In these circumstances, it's better for Division A to make all the components it can and sell them to the outside world and for Division B to buy all their components locally. There is therefore no optimal transfer price as the transfer should not occur. In fact, any number you care to pick will mean either the seller doesn't want to sell or the buyer doesn't want to buy. The seller would only be happy if they receive more than $10 to compensate them for the cost incurred in the internal transfer and the buyer will only accept the internal transfer if it costs less than the $9 it costs them to buy it in from the outside. There is no price that is simultaneously more than $10 and less than $9. This reflects the point that there is no optimal transfer price in this case as the transfer should not happen. In summary, the transfer price should be derived by considering the full cost to the group of an internal transfer. If the intermediate market is perfect, in other words, there's infinite capacity and only one market price, then the only logical place for the transfer price to be is at that market price. If the universal market price for a component was $10, there's no reason why the seller should accept any less than $10 and no reason why the buyer should pay any more than $10. This approach to transfer pricing is known as market-based or opportunity cost-based transfer pricing. Lots of businesses use a cost plus approach. That is to say, they base their transfer price on accounting style cost plus a markup. Firstly, Let's consider whether the cost figure should be variable cost or full cost. Full cost plus a markup might be very expensive for the buying division and they may choose to purchase from the outside. This may not be in the best interest of the group as a whole because the fixed cost element of manufacture would happen anyway and therefore the true cost of manufacture may well better be expressed by excluding fixed cost. An alternative might be to use variable cost plus a markup. However, care will need to be taken to make sure that the selling division is making a sufficient return to encourage the internal transfer if that is what is indeed optimal for the group as a whole. Secondly, let's consider whether the cost base should be actual cost or standard cost when setting transfer prices. In general, standard cost should be used. 
If we were to use the actual costs of the selling division, this would discourage cost control in that selling division because they know they can recover their costs through the transfer price. This encourages inefficiency. Using standard costs should overcome this because if the selling division overruns on cost, the excess cost stays in the selling division if the only revenue they get is based on standard. It's worth noting that sometimes an internal transfer is actually less expensive than an external sale. There can be some genuine cost savings, such as distribution, packaging, ordering costs. It's only fair that the savings should be shared between the buyer and the seller through the transfer price that's chosen. Finally, there are some non-financial considerations to bear in mind with transfer pricing. For example, Although it might be cheaper to purchase from the outside than to transfer internally, a company may still want to ensure the internal transfer happens. For example, a prestigious car brand would not want cheap bought-in components from another manufacturer when they have superior quality components within their own brand manufactured internally. It may protect the brand overall if components are made internally and this may need to be enforced centrally. In summary, transfer pricing is an important decision to get right in order to ensure goal congruent behaviour in a decentralised group where divisional managers are at liberty to buy and sell from and to wherever they choose. Logically, the first thing the group should do is ask what's best for the group overall, internal transfer or external purchase. Then the transfer price should be set to ensure decisions are made that are in the best interests of the group.